Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Cyto Data Symposium. We're delighted to be hosting you here today. My name is Caitlin Casimo. I'm going to be your mo morning moderator. Um, as a reminder, you should keep your masks on at all times in the auditorium. The mask optional areas are out in the atrium where you'll be having snacks and lunch. Um, so it is now my pleasure to hand it off for the introduction to the symposium, which is being hosted here in Seattle by the Allen Institute for Cell Science. And it's my pleasure to introduce Ru. Oh, I can take my mask off for talking. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Ru Gunabordana, who is the executive director of the Allen Institute for Cell Science. She's going to tell you more about uh, the Institute's work and get us started for the day. Thank you, Caitlin. Hi, everyone. Can, you, can everyone hear me? It's working? Yeah. All right. Welcome. Good morning. Welcome to Seattle for some of you. I heard we have people from Israel, Switzerland. Uh, thank you for traveling really far to be here. And thank you for those of you who just walked down the steps. Uh, all of you are very welcome. I'm so excited to say that we are partnering with Cytodata to host this event. Cytodata is an organization that brings together people who are working on the challenges of imaging and image analysis, things that are very dear to our heart in cell science. Um, so thank you for giving us the opportunity, and on behalf of the cell science team, I want to say thank you and welcome. But I am going to take a couple of seconds, because we do have guests here who are not from the Allen Institute, to give a couple of um, comments about who we are and what we do. So the Allen Institute for Cell Science, we are a nonprofit research institute funded by the late Paul G. Allen. We are about 600 plus people. Uh, we uh, are from various different institutes within the Big Allen Institute, so we are right in the middle there, the Allen Institute for Cell Science. But I also know we are celebrating 20 years uh, since the inception of the Allen Institute soon, so we've been around for a while. Not all of us, but at least brain science. Um, so, but we are united on three themes. That is big science, team science, and open science. So we are addressing big, fundamental, difficult problems in biology, whether that be in brain science or immunology or cell science. And we work together as a team, a highly multidisciplinary te team working together to make this happen. And as you all know, we, we love to share what we do with the community. This was also one of the reasons this institute was formed. Uh, this is not just the data, but the tools, the approaches, and how we work. Um, and that's what's exciting about putting these things together. We want to empower you guys, the research community, to use what we do for your own research. Um, so in that light, the Cell Science Institute for Cell Science is no different. We're asking a very big question in biology. How do cells work? Um, and our way of addressing that is to look at cell organization and how cell states change as the cell transitions from one state to another. And I'm excited for you to hear uh, my colleague Susan's talk later today. She'll get into much more detail about how we are doing that. But we do use stem cells. Um, and live 3D imaging. We do a lot of quantitative cell science. Um, and of course, we work together as this big team. This picture is very out of date. I apologize to all the new people. Uh, we are about 65 people working together on this mission through programs and projects to answer these fundamental questions around morphogenesis and cell states. So with that, I want to change gears for a second and take a moment to recognize and thank all the people who put this uh, event together, starting with our symposium committee. Those of you who have been working for months to put this together, thank you. Uh, and we appreciate that. And also our events team, who are putting all these events, uh, all, all four days together, so that you, ha you guys have a great experience. Uh, so with that, I am going to hand it over to Juan, who will talk about uh, Cytodata. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy. There's a great lineup of speakers and a poster session, so we can all interact. And lastly, this is our first event in three years that we're doing in person that this is it's this big, so we are very, very excited about that, to have these in-person interactions. So enjoy, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Juan, who has a few introductory remarks as well. Good morning, everybody. It's so exciting to see this event happening uh, in person this year. Um, and uh, this is the 
seventh uh, Cytodata Symposium and Hackathon. Uh, first of all, on behalf of the Cytodata Society, I want to say thank, uh, thank you to the Allen Institute and the organizing committee for putting this event together and bringing us back in person here in Seattle. Uh, the Cytodata Society is a, a community of people working on image-based profiling, and we are uh, scientists both from academia and industry who, who are sharing the passion for image-based profiling. Um, we are um, early career scientists uh, leading uh, the way to you know, maintain this uh, community connected and uh, the community you know, vibrant around the topics of image analysis. Uh, the people that you see here are the uh, members of the board and uh, they change and rotate every year. I want to emphasize that the Cytodata board is uh, composed of early career scientists. So if you are a student or a postdoc, we invite you to join us uh, because we are going to be you know, leading the way uh, and um, handing it over to the next generation. So uh, the main event that we organize every year is the Cytodata Symposium and Hackathon. This has been happening uh, since 2016 uh, in Boston for the first time. And uh, it was originally uh, an event for hacking, like bringing uh, computer scientists and biologists, uh, analyzing uh, information extracted from images. Uh, and ever since, it has happened every year. It was organized in London in 2017, and then uh, in Boston again, 2018, in Germany in 2019, and then in 2020 and 2021, we were fortunate enough to have um, recursion and beat bio organizing it virtually uh, because of the pandemic. So now we are very excited to have Cytodata happening again in person here in Seattle. Thank you so much again for the, uh, or to the organizing committee of, of the Allen Institute uh, that has, uh, you know, uh, brought us here. And it's my pleasure to announce that Cytodata 2023 is going to happen in the Netherlands next year, uh, organized by Cytosmart, which is a microscopy and image analysis company. So our uh, European uh, uh, colleagues are going to be organizing this. Cytodata happens, uh, uh, sorry, Cytodata alternates every year between America and Europe. Uh, and we will be making a call again uh, at the end of this year to uh, organizations interested in organizing 2024. Um, uh, so if you are interested, uh, stay tuned. I think that's all I wanted to say. So thank you so much for coming here. Enjoy Cytodata 2022. And thank you so much to the Allen Institute for bringing us here. All right. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get started with our first session. But before that, uh, I'm Caitlin Casimo. I'll be your moderator for the morning. As I mentioned, I lead the training, education, and outreach program here at the Allen Institute. And I was on the organizing committee for this year's event. I am completely missing my light. So let me stand over here. Um, so before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsors uh, for this event. Um, sponsors is what helps make events like this shine. And we're proud to have engaged with organizations that have an impact in our scientific and local community. Throughout this program, we're going to be highlighting some of our sponsors who have hosted workshops, who will be hosting our two-day hackathon starting tomorrow, as well as some of our travel grants, which help support students to be able to access important scientific opportunities like these that develop their careers. Uh, a few notes for the rest of this event. We have lots of staff who are going to be helping. So if you need any assistance at any time, please find somebody who has the green stripe that says committee or the gray stripe that says staff at the bottom of their name tag. Um, and we will be happy to help you. Our breaks today are going to be at 1030. Lunch will be at 1130. And then we'll have a very brief break this afternoon while we get set up for our panel discussion at just past 2 o'clock. So, Plan your coffee needs around that. And then we're going to end our day with our poster session, which will be back out in our atrium space. Um, so please be prepared uh, for that. And that's going to be where breakfast and, and lunch have been as well. If you have a poster, you can set that up during the breaks or during lunch. Um, and without further ado, it's time for some science. So it's ready for our first speaker. 
Um, Asaf Zaritsky, so Asaf, come on up. Uh, Dr. Zaritsky is a senior lecturer in the Department of Software and Systems Information Engineering at Ben Gurion University of the Negev in Israel. His research is in computational cell dynamics at the interface of data science and cell biology, with a specific focus on multicellular information processing and interpretable AI in cell imaging. His presentation is called Visual Interpretability of Deep Learning Models in Cell Imaging. All right, take it away. Thank you. OK, thank you, everybody. Super excited uh, being here today. And uh, I'm first, but I, looking at the program, it seems pretty obvious that we're going to see many, many uh, presentation series are going to talk about the amazing ability of uh, deep learning to extract information from images. And this is really great and it, it has really changed the way that we quantify uh, uh, biological images. Uh, but a big problem in deep learning is it's really hard to interpret what, what the model have learned. And the ability to understand what the model has learned is super important because if we know if we know what is learned, we can come up with specific biological hypotheses and then we can continue. So I want to start with the beginning. Uh, being the first, I thought that I can be uh, very, very broad. And for many years, we're staring under the microscope. We are looking at phenotypes and describing them. And uh, in the last uh, several uh, tens of years, uh, we know that it's not enough. And in order to prove that what we find is real, we really need to, to put numbers on what we see. Uh, but this is not enough, and unlike other fields, as a computer scientist, I can say that in most fields, image-based fields, uh, computer vision, the state of the art is the human eye, right, the human mind. Uh, in cell imaging, the patterns are much more complex, or we cannot in interpret them visually, and I think that this is one of the only fields where the computer can do better than humans. So, a lot of times we can do flip here, the approach. And instead of looking and then quantifying, we can do quantifying and then looking. Of course, in order to do that properly, we need to know where to look for, uh, how, what, what to look for, how to look for. But eventually, uh, we get numbers and we can find, OK, there is a pattern here. But the last step, and I would argue that it's one of the most important steps, is going back to the biology. It's not enough to show that they are different, but we need, or that we can classify or predict, but we need to know why. We need to know to, and to, to, to go back to the biology and interpret it. OK, so uh, again, very basic. Everybody here knows that. But the supervised machine learning, the basic pipeline is uh, feature extraction, uh, training, and the models. And then you can discriminate between apples and oranges. And in this, OK, we have the features which we define based on what we think will discriminate between these two properties. Uh, and still, interpretability is not uh, trivial. And there is a lot of work on how to interpret uh, these type of models. But uh, we have the features, and, and then we can use them in order to interpret. This is not the same in a, in a deep neural network, where the input is convolved in complex ways. I mean, the power of these models come from the simultaneous optimization of a representation and toward a specific task. But the cost is that we cannot interpret. We get an output, and we have no idea what's going on inside here. So the question, uh, uh, I mean, we, so we want to, to reverse engineer the neural network and understand what biology stands behind that and come up with specific hypotheses. Uh, so we, in my postdoc, I asked the question, what can we predict cancer cell functional state from live labeled free cell images? Uh, I was in uh, Gaudens de Nuzer lab at UT Southwestern Medical Center, and next door we had uh, the Morrison lab. We had this uh, model for, for many years that they uh, took melanoma stage three, so these are already uh, metastasized melanoma, from the lymphoma, they xenograft them into mice, and then they correlated the outcome of the mouse to the outcome of the patient, and the outcome was a localized metastasis versus metastasis that spreads all over the, the mice. And they could correlate that, and this is a very uh, useful system to try to understand uh, uh, metastatic efficiency. And the problem is that they couldn't find, I mean, they used bioinformatics still, they used the cell biological and invasion assays, uh, looked at shape and motility, but nothing came up as distinguishing between those patients and these mice that were, that were high metastatic versus low metastatic. 
So we were hopeful that uh, using the rich information, you'll see it later, uh, what rich information are in uh, label-free images. In label-free images, we can find some patterns that will allow us to discriminate between them. So what you see are single melanoma cells, uh, patient-derived melanoma cells on, on top of a collagen uh, stab. And uh, we image them, and you can see that there is not much maybe going on. I mean, the cells, most of them are blebbing, the happy blebbing, they are still alive and happy. And they're not migrating much, the morphology is not very clear, the shape is not very changing a lot. And the question, can we use this uh, textual information and dynamics to actually uh, uh, discriminate between high and low metastatic efficiency? So we developed an image analysis pipeline that uh, detected and uh, tracked single cells. And this is the atomic building blocks for the rest of uh, what I'm going to present in, for this project. Uh, what we did here, we created a representation with auto encoder. It's, it's a little bit a simplification, but this is what, uh, but, but it's enough for, for here. And uh, we take an input image and we encode it uh, uh, by optimizing the discrepancy between the reconstructed image and the input image. Uh, one of the reasons for using that, we could use a lot of unlabeled data, so we didn't only were limited to our PDXs data, but we can use uh, melanoma cell lines and melanocytes and clone, uh, all, all the data that we had, we could, uh, all the cell types that we had, we could, we could get here because the purpose was to get a good representation of the cell appearance. Then what we did, we took the representation from the encoder, we used a, a simple classifier, LDA classifier, and at the single cell level, we could discriminate between high metastatic efficiency and low metastatic uh, efficient uh, cells. Uh, because this is a single cell uh, classifier, uh, we have many cells per patient, we were able to discriminate perfectly based on the, the small data sets that we had. Uh, I'm going to show you one uh, validation. So we were wondering, I mean, PDXs, patient-derived melanoma cells are very, very different visually from, uh, from uh, melanoma cell lines. But we still thought that maybe our model captured something that is, that, that is predictive on metastatic efficiency, so can we check it on cell lines? So these are six melanoma uh, cell lines that are all considered highly metastatic efficiency. These are the models, each model is uh, one patient out, so we have uh, seven models. And uh, you can see that A375 was predicted as highly metastasizer and MV3 as low metastasizers. And when we validate that in the mice, we got, uh, it was validated. So we're happy, it seems to be good. But of course the question is, okay, so we can discriminate, but what, what, what the model found? I mean, what did the model find that, that the other measurement could not find? And the first way to look at it, I, uh, I, I, I stared at this type of panels of taking cells and ranking them according to what the classifier thought, right? And I couldn't see anything. And the reason for that is there is a lot of variability in this data that is not attributed to the function, to what, what, what we're capturing, what the model is capturing. So also doing all kinds of dimensionality reduction, it doesn't, because it's not the main axis of the variability, what the model have captured. So the way to handle that, we wanted to, to reduce the variability, we wanted to take a single cell and then ideally to take the subtle phenotypes that we cannot see and amplify it artificially. And the way that we did it, we took our encoding, and now we went back to the decoder, and we shifted the encoding so the classifier would think that uh, it's a higher or lower cell, and then we could use the decoder to reconstruct images sequences, the shifting cells from a high state to a low state, or from a low state to a high state. And and it worked, so we were able to, to create this kind of uh, morphing uh, of cells. And I, I, I want to go to, uh, to other stories, so I don't, I don't want to go into the validations or the eventual conclusion. That just says that we found uh, two uh, attributes. One, uh, enhanced protrusive activity, which is in the literature is linked to survival. And the second is increased light scattering, which we don't know what it is. It might be some change in the organelle uh, composition of the cell. But it gives us now a readout that we can actually screen for. We can, we can, we can make specific hypotheses based on, on, this, on, on knowing that uh, something has changed in the light scattering and, and now start and, and figuring out what's going on. Uh, and more generally, uh, this is an example of uh, interpretable machine learning by taking subtle features within the imaging that, and, and amplifying them uh, computationally. Okay, so this was my last postdoc project, and these are the people who participated here, who were the main contributors with me. So Andrew joined me with the computational side, Andres did all the experiments, including the mice experiments, and Eric built up the system, and Gaudis was my mentor, and this was published last year, so you can, uh, you can read the paper. Okay, so this is the summary, 
And now I'm going to tell you why it's, uh, why it's not really working, right, for a, general, for a general scenario. There are many limitations. Practically, we were lucky, okay, that it worked on this scenario. I mean, what we found is real, but it wouldn't work for a general scenario. Why? Uh, so here, when we do autoencoding, we might lose information that is critical for the classifier. We have nothing here that is a classifier. This is only, it's, it's not suitable to, I mean, usually you have a model and you want to interpret it. So a model that takes an image and get an output and interpret it, but we don't have that. We need the autoencoding to go to the next step. And the third, it, the way that we did this interpretability, we took latent variables within the representation and we changed them and they were correlated to the outcome. But this is not necessarily that simple and there might be an entanglement between multiple features to multiple image features and then it makes the visual interpretability much, much harder. So that in the lab is, a, is a, took this channel, challenge and he's trying to create a general framework that gets, if you give him data and a trained model, he will try to give some interpretability to that. And the way that uh, he does that, uh, he takes the basic model, okay, adversarial uh, uh, component uh, we, we had already, so this is not new. But what we also, what, what Oded added is, the, uh, 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 is optimizing the, the, the discrepancy between the input image and the reconstructed image in the eyes of the supervised model will be minimized. And this way enforcing that we don't lose information that is important for the classifier, for the input supervised model. And the third part, which is the coolest, I think, is trying to force the representation to each feature represents something specific within the, the, within the image, within the image feature. And the way that, that he does it, he takes a representation, he changes uh, one of the features here, and then he wants to see that he trains another model that tries to predict from the change in the reconstructed image whether you can predict which feature would change. And all of this is optimized at once and making sure that, that, this, that each of these features are mapped to a specific and different and, and ones that we can, we can uh, interpret a, a reconstructed image. Okay, uh, in order to test this idea, we move to a completely different domain of in vitro fertilization. And, uh, and then there is more work that I'm go not going to present here today, but, the, but I, I mean, the reason for that is uh, there is a lot of data that is collected and it's super complex and I think that the biologists are, are, are going only for the obvious, so it's not well studied and I think that there is, going, there is, there is a lot of things to discover here. Uh, so uh, Itai built the infrastructure and you can read one paper about uh, another cool project. And what Odette did uh, so far is being able to take embryos that were, uh, uh, that were scored according to what embryologists think and finding that the, three, the first three uh, features that, you, that were most correlated with the uh, classifier score were uh, the ones that the classifier annotated. So this is kind of a proof of principle and now we're going into implementation prediction which is harder and it's less is known and we're trying to find something new. Okay, so that's it. Uh, about these projects. Now we're going to tackle interpretability from a different perspective, but uh, we're at the Ellen Institute, so I'm going to show you data from the Ellen Institute. So we all understand that uh, we can learn a lot from the organization of a cell. And uh, these two papers came out in uh, the end of 2018 that blew my mind. They showed that uh, in principle we can take information from bright field images and, uh, and, 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 and map them into different organelles. And the way that they did it, uh, I mean, you cannot do it right, you don't have uh, in one living cell all of these organelles, so what you could do, you could have a fluorescent, uh, you can have one cell in one matched fluorescent target, and then you can train a model to map the bright field image to the prediction, minimize the discrepancy to the uh, fluorescent target. So they do it with a, okay. So, uh, and now you can uh, take your bright field image and you can use all these models and you can have all of these uh, prediction output and this is, a, this is a dream, right? So this is a cool image from uh, the paper from the Allen Institute and the real data is a time lapse of what you see here, which is hard to see anything. But when you use these models, you can see very beautifully that the cell is dividing. So uh, this is amazing if it would really work on real data. I mean, it's more like a proof of principle. And one of the things that we're trying to do is actually making it a practical tool that we can use. 
So the question, how can we make in silico labeling a practical tool? Where, when, and how in silico labeling works? And when does, doesn't it work? So Leon who is here and he's presenting a poster. So you should go in, uh, and see his poster and talk to him more. I, I, unfortunately, I have to, I'll have to go in the afternoon. So, so uh, but uh, this is a completely new work. He's trying to understand how in silico labeling works. More generally, actually, he's trying to, to create the infrastructure for visual interpretation of image to image transformation models. So the Leon's idea is as follows. You get a bright field image and an in silico prediction, and you're optimizing a noise mask that will, uh, that will add noise to an image, but, will, but the, in, but the free, frozen in silico labeling uh, 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 model is still going to be able to predict the in silico, the in silico input. And this will highlight the regions that are absolutely critical to make, this, uh, to make the in silico labeling work. So this is how it looks. You have usually the bright field to the in silico labeling. This is the nuclear granular component. And this is the bright field image plus the noise mask. And the in silico labeling works uh, as well. So let me walk you through that. This is the ground truth. This is the in silico labeling. This is the in silico labeling of the after adding noise. Uh, this is the bright field image. Everything starts from here, of course. This is what the mask interpreter gives us. So you can see here in the color map, you see the essentiality score. So one means that we cannot lose this information, and zero means that, uh, yeah, go ahead and, and, and noise it up. And when we uh, look at the mask interpreter and we can, uh, we can uh, threshold it, then we can get the, what the information is critical to get a, a person correlation that is very close to the in silico labeling without the noise. So let me go through a few organelles. This is the nucleus uh, granular component. So you can see that it's not enough to get the, the organelle itself. You need the region around it. The second is uh, that I want to show is the nuclear envelope. This was really surprising because if you look at the, so this is the bright field, this is the ground truth. And if you look at the images, you can see it pretty nicely here in the image. I mean, I can see the nuclear envelope. So I was thinking that this is the information that the model will need, but, the, the, but, but it's not. I mean, you, in order to get the nuclear envelope properly, you need to get all the nucleus and you need to get regions also outside. And the last example that I'm going to show is the plasma membrane, which is actually does a, a, negative, a, 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 a negative prediction. So it predicts, ev so it uses everything that is not the organelle that is of, of interest. Okay, uh, it works better than uh, the, the, the standard uh, uh, image, um, image interpretability method. So here you see GradCam and uh, saliency map. And you can see that it's much more obvious and we can quantify that and show that uh, you can yeah, quantify that by, by noising the image based on, the, on, on these the images, on the, these explanations and showing that the, uh, the mask interpreter can, can noise much more and still get a better result. Oops. Okay, so now what is it good for? Okay, we understand what information in the bright field images are mapped into, uh, into, into the fluorescent, but is it any useful for anything? So we think that the next step, that we might, it might be yes, right? Of course, this is the goal. And here is an example. So here you see a, a ground truth image, the in silico labeling. You can see here the mistakes. And here you can see the explanation. So you see the explanation is, is not consistent with the other explanations of the other cells in this field of view. And then when you go to the nuclear channel, which is available in this data, you can see why. So in principle, if we can automate the ability to identify this, right, to identify where the explanation doesn't follow the patterns of the, uh, of the explanation patterns of this organelle, we might be able to say, okay, we can trust this cell and we cannot trust this cell in terms of the silico labeling and make it a practical tool. But for that, uh, we'll need to wait. Uh, so Leon in his poster, Maybe not in the poster, but he has some results that show that uh, it's possible, and this is a future work. Uh, yeah, so we hope that mask interpreter would be an enabler toward practical use of in silico labeling. And with my last minute, I'm going to do a self-promotion. So if you're planning to come to American Society of Cell Biology annual meeting, please uh, try to come to the first day, so Saturday, December 3. Megan, who is here, and me are organizing a session on uh, uh, quantitative methods for learning cell biology from microscopy data sets. So please plan on uh, coming. 
And uh, I'm teaching a course that is called uh, Data Science in Cell Imaging. Uh, all the course material are publicly available, uh, even a uh, recording from, from the COVID times. Uh, I would, if someone wants to take this and teach it, I'm very happy. I mean, this would be a success for me. Uh, if someone wants to just look at it uh, to hear the lectures, uh, fine. And if you have a paper that you think I should uh, highlight in, the, in my course and I didn't highlight, then uh, you could shoot me an email, <laughs> of course. And with that, uh, I'll finish. All right, we're going to have time for a few questions. But before we get started with those, um, can we ask everybody who is already in a seat to please move towards the middle if you look to your left, look to your right. If you see an open seat, please fill that so that our folks who are sitting on the vents in the back can have a real chair. And I saw a question over here while that shifting is happening. Yeah. Okay. Hey, hi, Asaf. Question. Uh, first of all, great talk and great projects. Um, no, I said great talk and great projects. I have a question about the mask interpreter. Um, we, the reason we did not use the in, in uh, uh, sorry, in silico labeling that existed from the Allen Institute is because it has this tiling artifact. I, I'm sorry, I, I cannot. C can you? Something is. Can you can you make the mic a little louder on the Q and A mic? Okay. Hope not. No. Yeah. The reason why we didn't use the in-silico labeling um, that was developed by the Allen Institute is because it has this tiling artifact when you're using it because they send the 256 by 256 um, image to the unit. Did you find a way to serve this artifact in your in mask interpreter? Is my question. Uh, so you are asking whether the tiling artifacts in in-silico labeling, we can see them in the... In Did the you serve that? Yeah. In, in the... In no. the explanation? No, yeah, did you serve that in your version of the mask interpreter when you transfer from the bright field to the fluorescent label? Oh, actually, where is Leon? Ah, here, Leon can answer that better than me. <laughs> <laughs> um, working? Yeah, okay. So the artifacts, uh, probably the Allen Institute solved them. They used like a Gaussian uh, averaging. So, this is what you meant? Um, no, but exactly. They have these like tiling of different patches. Mm -hmm. So, the other one, the border between the patches is totally missing. Yeah, so they, they do prediction with overlaps and then they smooth it with Gaussian, Gaussian averaging. So, we did the same. In and you can learn more at your poster this afternoon, number 33. I see a question over here. Um, hi, this is super cool. I had a question about the um, the mask interpreter as well, um, sparked by the example that you had about the plasma membrane sort of ignoring the actual target and looking at everything else. And I'm wondering how you, like, I guess how much you trust it and how much you are able to avoid local minima in the sense that like, you know, if you had a binary image you're trying to predict and understand like what the model is using, you could either like say there's like a white circle in a black field, you could either mask out, you could either noise up all the black and like then your look your model is like looking at the white or you could do the exact opposite and um see like the same information essentially um and i guess i'm wondering like you know if you're pushing noise through this and optimizing like a variance per pixel or whatever how much you're able to like really trust the output as like yes this is what the model's doing or like this is sort of a way that we can think about it or like how confident you are in this kind of thing so I think one of the cool things about the mask interpreter is that you can, you can play with your mask, right? So you can, now you can, I, I didn't show these slides, but you can take a, an explanation and it has a spatial context and now you can start and spatially, in specific location, you can start removing noise or, 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 incre or including noise and see how the result change. And this gets you some confidence about the results. Also, we are moving into the, the, uh, the perturbation uh, data, and we can see that the interpretability. So we are trying to validate it in different ways, but yeah, I, I wouldn't trust it uh, without any validation. Cool, and then just really quick, those, the, the data you were showing was uh, 3D, uh, it, but you were just showing 2D slices of it. Or, so that's my question, is it, were they slices or were they projections through the data? 
these are slices. Uh, we are now, one of the things that we are, we, we got the homework from the LN Institute to look at is to look at the, at the, at the, at the you know, in different slices how it works because we don't expect it to work the same way. Cool. Thank over. you. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Anybody? All right. Well, thank you. Yes. Our next speaker is Dr. Yuri Manor. He is an assistant research professor and the director of the Weight Advanced Biophytonics Core at the Salk Institute. The Manor Lab connects anatomy to function by developing artificial intelligence based computational approaches, deep learning, that integrate data from microscopes to increase image resolution, sensitivity, and collection speed. They also develop genetic and molecular tools that facilitate monitoring and manipulation of cellular structures implicated in diseases such as neurodegenerative diseases and hearing loss. His presentation is titled Deep Learning Based Tools for Tracking Organelle Mo Mobility in Live Neurons. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for coming and especially to the organizers for having me. Uh, it's an insane honor to be amongst these other speakers such as a soft, which just blew my mind. So forgive me if I'm a little uh, stuttery because I'm still trying to digest everything he just talked about, which is amazing. Um, Am I clicking through slides here? There we go. All right, so um, I'm going to talk a bit first about the biology that motivated the tools that we're building now. And uh, for the record, um, they required that we upload slides ahead of time, which is something I'm completely not used to. I've never done that before. Usually I, make, I refine my slides on the plane. So um, there's a couple things I want to talk about that I'll try to interject between slides, and you'll just have to use your imaginations. So. Uh, without further ado, I first want to address the amazing human talent behind any and all of the work that I'm showing. I am a system research professor and a core director, which means I uh, manage two teams. But they work really closely together. They're all amazing people, and I'm very lucky to work with them. So um, one of the big things we're interested in is mitochondrial dynamics. You all know that mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell, that they generate ATP for the cell. If you're a bit more sophisticated, you may know that mitochondria also regulate signaling and cell death, and they're really important for a whole bunch of uh, biological functions. Uh, fewer people know that mitochondria are actually extremely dynamic, and they're constantly moving throughout the cell, fusing and dividing, changing their shape. And all of these dynamics are critical for normal cellular health and function. Uh, which is why the NIH really cares about it. If you disrupt fission and fusion or movement or uh, turnover, you can get a whole host of diseases. And you'll notice that a lot of these diseases are neurodegenerative disorders. So we have a vested interest in understanding how these dynamics are regulated. And we were focused on fission earlier on in my research career. And one of the things we figured out is that uh, fission occurs at ER mitochondria contact sites. And using some tools that we developed that you can read about here, we figured out that there's actually actin at ER mitochondria contact sites that were, these pools of actin were previously invisible. But using organelle targeted actin probes, probes sorry, we can see them now. So um, we wanted to delve a bit deeper into this mitochondrial fission event. And we hypothesized that this protein called INF2 must be really important for uh, this process. And we confirmed that. And then we next asked whether INF2 as an ER anchored actin regulatory protein might also be important for other organelle dynamics, not just mitochondrial fission events. And lo and behold, when we use our ACER probe, that's a actin probe that's targeted to the endoplasmic reticulum, we were able to see actin accumulating at the fission sites of endosomes, peroxisomes, lysosomes, and even Golgi, suggesting that there is a conserved molecular mechanism where interorganelle contacts are regulating organelle dynamics via actin pools, specifically accumulating at those ER organelle contacts. And again, the only known actin regulatory protein that's targeted to the ER is INF2. So here you can see what INF2 looks like when you overexpress it in the cell. It's all over the ER. And you can see how it accumulates at, for example, uh, mitochondria contacts. Now, knowing that uh, 
ER-associated actin accumulates at all organelle fission sites. Knowing that INF2 is the only actin regulatory protein on the ER, we hypothesized that INF2 might be regulating all of the organelle dynamics. So lo and behold, there's a lot to look at in this slide. I'm just going to summarize that if you knock out INF2, endosome fission, lysosome fission, and mitochondrial fission all go down, the organelles become bigger. And we can rescue that phenotype by reintroducing INF2 on the ER and re, uh, reproduce normal fission dynamics. But if we reintroduce INF2 lacking actin polymerization activity, we no longer rescue that phenotype. Cool. So INF2 is regulating all of the organelle fission. Now INF2, here's where we get to know its generation, is actually implicated in a disease called Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease. Has anyone here heard of Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease? Pretty good. I've had audiences where maybe like one finger goes up. Um, it's actually the most commonly inherited neurological disorder. And it's a very interesting disorder. It's what we call a length-dependent neuropathy, which means that the longest axons in the body degenerate the fastest. And what's interesting is that many, many, many mutations that cause Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease affect organelle mobility and transport. And this kind of raises an interesting hypothesis that perhaps if you perturb mobility, the longest cells in the body, for example, the feet, uh, the axon that goes all the way from your spinal cord to your feet, they're going to suffer the most from organelle defects. Just like if you have a car that do doesn't drive so well, you can probably get to the pharmacy or the grocery store, but if you want to drive from San Diego to New York, which would be crazy either way, uh, good luck. So that's our working hypothesis. Now, what does INF2 have to do with this? Well, it turns out all the mutations in INF2 that cause Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease affect this auto-inhibitory domain, which means that mutant INF2 is polymerizing actin unregulated. It's just making actin all over the place. And I already told you that INF2 on the ER is contacting and regulating all of the organelle dynamics. So we hypothesize that what's going on is INF2 is polymerizing actin all over the place, which is causing excess actin to accumulate on all of the organelles, and that's perturbing their mobility. So to test this hypothesis, we got a hold of some patient-derived skin fibroblasts from a couple different INF2 patients. And our long-term goal, and I'll show you the data, is to make neurons out of those skin fibroblasts. But first, we just looked at the skin fibroblast. And what you can see is that these are tracks from different uh, mitochondria. And you can see in our age match control, the mitochondria move up and down the cell quite happily. But in the patient-derived skin fibroblasts, they do not. But if we depolymerize actin with latrunculin B, we can restore that mobility, showing that mitochondrial mobility is perturbed in an actin-dependent fashion. And this was reproduced for a different patient cell line with a different mutation in INF2. Same thing for lysosomes. So again, we're coming back on this idea of a conserved mechanism where ER-associated actin is regulating all of the organelles, not just mitochondria, which has been previously published. So I think this is kind of profound. Because let's take a moment to remember that these patients don't have a skin disease. Their skin is normal. In fact, it's a pretty specific phenomenon where the longest axons degenerate first, usually the feet and then the hands. In extreme cases, the next longest axons are ear and eye. Okay? But as far as we can tell, nothing wrong with the skin fibroblast, but you can see the cellular phenotype in these patient cells. And I think that's a pretty important insight for a lot of things, biology and biomedicine. But of course, we really wanted to study uh, neurons, because this is a neurological disorder. So we converted the fibroblast directly to neurons and then looked at things like mitochondria dynamics, which is a little bit harder to track because of their morphology. But we also looked at lysosomes. And here you can see in an age match control, lysosomes happily zip up and down the axon. But in the patient-derived uh, neurons, they're relatively fixed in place. And if we treat with latrunculin B, we can actually restore that mobility, showing that that immobilization is actin-dependent in these patient-derived neurons. Now, I've shown you a lot of live imaging data. Uh, Asaf showed you some live imaging data. You'll see more later on. What everyone loves to sweep under the rug 
is that as you image your system, you're perturbing it. Phototoxicity is a really big deal. And our cells did not magically evolve to have really high-powered lasers shining on them while you're imaging them. It's kind of like a biological Heisenberg effect. I hate that analogy, but uh, it's an observer effect. So what that means, especially if you're studying mitochondrial dynamics like me, is you're inducing changes to mitochondria. The mitochondria are one of the first things to respond to phototoxicity. So we're perturbing the very effect we're trying to measure. And we're no longer studying biology. We're studying culinary science. Um, so how do you get around that? One way is to lower the laser dose. You can do that by using lower laser power, by decreasing the exposure time, by decreasing the resolution if you're using a point scanning system. So that's what you see here. On the left, you can see we're inducing fragmentation of mitochondria, and we're inducing bleaching. But we can see the details. Here, we're imaging at much lower resolution, lower laser dose where we're not getting bleaching, but you can't make any sense out of this image anymore. And same thing with speed. If you want to capture movement, like organelle movement, up and down axons, like I just showed you, if you want to image at max resolution, you're going to get this kind of uh, hopscotch effect where uh, organelles are appearing and disappearing from frame to frame. And it's really hard to be confident about which organelle is which. On the other hand, you can image at lower resolution at higher speed, and you can capture all of the interesting nuances in their movement, like acceleration and deceleration. But the problem is when they pass by each other in these tightly confined spaces, we can no longer resolve them, creating yet another tracking problem. So this is all to say that anytime you sit down in a microscope or any measurement device, you're constantly dealing with this uh, eternal triangle of compromise. And when people come to my imaging core and they say, here, I want to do this experiment, and I ask them, well, what's more important, speed or resolution? The answer is always yes, right? <laughs> so this is the bane of our existence. So I was really inspired uh, a few years ago when I saw an uh, article in a photography blog of all places showing that you can restore low resolution photos to high resolution using deep learning. So we decided to see if we could do the same thing for our microscopy data. I'm going to go quickly and just say that the long story short is the answer is yes. Uh, we tested this by getting a ton of beautiful gold standard data from our collaborator, Kristen Harris, who had 160 gigabytes of high resolution, high quality EM data. And then we developed a highly sophisticated computational device called the Crapifier, <laughs> which down samples the high res data to simulate low resolution data. And then we trained a deep learning model to learn how to go from the low back up to the high. And then we tested the model output on real world image pairs. Because what good is a model that works on synthetic data but not real world data? So we tested it. And I'll, show you, um, I'll tell you that you know, it, it works. And the reason we did this crapification approach is because it's really expensive and it's really hard to acquire a lot of training data. And this is my clarion call to everyone in the audience and on YouTube or wherever. If you have beautiful gold standard data, let's work together to make some sort of repository where we can collect and use those data to train better and better models. Because everyone has beautiful data on their hard drives that could be useful for these kinds of approaches. And I'll, I'm willing to wager that there's already enough data out there to build and train models for whatever your application is by now, especially here at the Allen Institute. So. Um, yeah, we were able to reduce our cost from what could have been seventeen to twenty thousand dollars to literally sixteen dollars by using a computer to crapify our pre-existing high-res data to train our model. And here's some example results. On the left is a low-res raw image that we collected off our scanning microscope, and in the middle is the mo is the output of our deep learning model. And on the right is our so-called ground truth data that we acquired of the exact same sample at high-res. So now you can see clearly vesicles that were invisible in the raw data. And in some ways, this data looks even better than the so-called ground tube because we've removed a lot of the shot noise. Now, there's a lot of criticisms and concerns about what are we hallucinating, what's real, what's not. So this is my, uh, I, I say this every time. It, it's just so boring, but it's so true. You have to validate the output of your model. You have to validate it for the biological uh, measurements that you're, not, you're making. Pixel-based metrics, such as SM and PSNR, that everyone loves to use in their computer vision papers, are not sufficient. 
If you're measuring vesicles, validate it with vesicle measurements. If you're measuring plasma membrane, validate it with plasma membrane. Boring, but it needs to be said. Um, it turns out it also works on live cell imaging. And this is where the crapifier really comes in handy. Because if you want to acquire image pairs at low and high resolution or with two different settings on a microscope of a live sample that's moving, good luck. Because by the time you finish acquiring one image, it's not the same sample that you image the second image. So being able to have a lot of high resolution imaging data, uh, high quality imaging data, and then crapify it, and then train a model works really well. So here you can see an example of a raw image on the left, output on the right, looks beautiful. Problem is, that when we actually do the time lapse, you can see there's a lot of flickering artifacts because it's doing as well as it can, but there's still going to be some errors as the noise changes from frame to frame. But what we realize is that the way you get rid of flickering, the way, the way you get rid of noise is in traditional settings, you would average multiple frames of your time lapse. And that gets rid of the noise, gets rid of flickering. But what we realize is that with our uh, architecture, we could actually create a so-called smart blur, where instead of averaging multiple frames, we would just train a model to take multiple time points as the input and then predict the best center time point output. And the result of that was we got rid of the flickering and we actually have higher resolution, whereas if you would average frames, you would have a blurry lower resolution image. So we were really pleased with these results, which then allow us to capture, for example, mitochondrial fission events that would be almost impossible to see in the raw data. Although I'll point out that once you've seen it, if you go back to the raw data, you can see where it came from. It's always good to do a sanity check. And again, we validated this with many measurements of fission events and semi-synthetic data with blinded observers, as you have to do. Um, and the same thing goes for tracking organelle dynamics. We can now image at much higher speed and lower resolution but uh, upscale it with our AI. So now we can, for example, capture fission events, as you see here, or resolve mitochondria as they pass by each other in the axon. But image restoration is great. I like it because it's a little bit more generalizable than analysis. But what we really want to do is analyze our images. We actually want information out of them. So one thing we're exploring now is using uh, machine learning to actually track and identify and track individual organelles so that we can extract all of that juicy information. The current state of the art in most of this type of imaging is chymographs. Do you all know what chymographs are? Yeah, so it's cool, but it's still laborious because you still have to have a human manually trace these. And you're compressing your data. You're throwing away a lot of information, interesting information, about the biophysics of these organelles. So we really prefer to be able to track uh, individual organelles over time to capture all of their movement characteristics. And this is using Elastic, a uh, random forest-based uh, segmentation. It works pretty well, but it's not perfect. So we wanted to improve upon that. So uh, you'll see uh, there's already a preprint out for something called Local Shape Descriptors, or LSDs, um, that came out from Jan Funke's lab with Arlo Sheridan, who's now in my lab. Um, and it's a lovely new method for segmenting. It's uh, better at identifying boundaries between objects by forcing your model to calculate all of these different shape characteristics in the objects in your image as an auxiliary learning task, which then improves the efficiency and accuracy of the output of your final unit. So this was developed for connectomics, where we're trying to measure the boundaries between neurons and really dense EM data sets. But what we realized, and, and it works beautifully, so we can now segment individual neurons in large EM data sets. But what we realized is that we could use this for our organelle tracking as well. And what the really silly, simple insight is that 2D plus time is 3D. So we've already got our infrastructure. And what we realize is that if you track organelles over time, you have extra context that allows you to identify boundaries, for example, between organelles that in your raw data would be impossible to segment. So this is working really well for segmenting organelles in time lapses. And using that, we're already able to now analyze our Charcot-Marie tooth patient cells um, with high accuracy and get the phenotypes that we could visually see it that I showed you before. I'll just point out if you use Imeris software, it really fails. 
So we're doing better than a so-called state-of-the-art commercial software, and, um, but with much higher throughput than, for example, human expert segmentation, which takes many, many hours to track every single organelle. Um, so that brings us back to the sarcomeric tooth. And then just briefly, I'll talk about what I think are the next steps. So we are still suffering from these occlusion problems where when you have objects moving on top of one another, whether it's animals in behavior tracking or organelles in microscopy, where it's really hard to correctly assign the identity to objects as they cross over one another. And one of the things that um, we're realizing could be used to our advantage is context. So if you just look at this image, you might say this is a tiger. But if you have the context, you might realize, actually, that's a dog. <laughs> and in our time lapse data, we have a lot of context that historically old based methods were throwing away that context and using things like Hungarian matching or you know, frame to frame pairing to try to properly identify objects. Whereas now, we believe that uh, global tracking transformers, which how many of you have heard of this? Global track, oh, one finger. So this is the inverse of my typical biology crowd where, uh, OK. So um, yeah, so we're using global tracking transformers, which use a sliding window and self-attention and context to be able to better infer which object is which and track them over time. So we can take our lysosome uh, detections and run them through this uh, network and be able to build an association matrix, which is a fancy type of loss uh, function or readout for being able to properly associate different objects with each other over all the frames of a video, as opposed to just neighboring frames. So um, this is where I had an extra slide I wanted to show you, where we actually have a time lapse of lysosomes crossing over one another. And it actually does an amazing job of properly assigning the correct object to the correct object as they cross over each other. It's still not perfect, still has work to do, but it's working better than anything else we've used so far. Um, and then finally, I get most excited talking about what we're doing next. So I'm just going to give you a little sneak preview of what maybe five years from now I can present uh, the final product, which is we are collecting correlative data where we do time lapses of these organelle movements. We'll use our transformers to track all of those organelles and extract mobility information. And then we are going to perform 3D electron microscopy and annotate all of the different organelles in our EM data with the movement that we captured in our video data. And then we can use those annotations to train a model to predict whether an organelle in an EM image is moving or not. And then we can use techniques like Asaf's interpretability to figure out what were the cues. How did it know that it was moving or not? And we can start to learn new biology from that kind of data. So we're really excited about that. I have to thank my collaborators. Uh, my own lab is 25% free time. Uh, the rest is running the course. So it just would not have been possible without the amazing collaborators that I have um, for deep learning and for the organelle dynamics. And I have to thank my funders, including Chan Zuckerberg, which I believe is sponsoring this as well. So thank you very much to CZI. And uh, would love comments just as much as questions. Thank you. All right, we have time for one question. So why don't we go in the center right here? Hey, unsurprisingly gorgeous talk. Um, what kind of throughput can you get doing correlated tracking in FIBSUM? That sounds amazing, but incredibly difficult to do. You say what kind of like throughput? Like throughput, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is, this is why I need funding, to be able to hire a team. <laughs> um, I didn't mention we're going to be doing uh, quantitative phase imaging, which will at least allow us to skip the labeling step so that we can just put cells on there and track organelles. 
Uh, so that'll increase the throughput. FibSem is becoming bigger and bigger with Cryo EM, which means that there are now softwares and methods where you can actually mill and image multiple cells on a cover slip using gridded cover slips, maybe some AI assisted uh, identification and alignment. It's going to be, a, that's why I said five years, right? This is not going to be done next year. But this is what we're really committed to getting working. And maybe five years with throughput and time, I think we'll have enough data to be able to do this. And also, thank you, uh, Clarion Call. If anyone has that kind of data, or you know someone who has that kind of data, please put them in touch, because this shouldn't be done by just one lab. This should be like a mass group effort to get that kind of data. Thanks. A great plug for open science, what we stand for. Yes. Institute. Yes. <laughs> well, we're at time, so uh, we're going to be coming up on our first break soon. So if you have more questions, you can find him at the break. But next, we have uh, Pedro Fale Ferreira, who is a doctoral student supervised by Nico Birnwinkel and Jack Kuypers at the Computational Bio Biology Group at the Department of Biosystems Science and Engineering at ETH Zurich in Basel, Switzerland. Pedro develops high-dimensional generative models and learning algorithms to extract information from large-scale single-cell sequencing data and to reconstruct the evolution of tumors. Pedro, take it away. Thanks a lot. So, I, as, I said, as you said, I am a PhD student at ETH Zurich in Basel, supervised by Nico Berenwinkel and Jack Kuypers. And this is going to be a very different talk. I'm going to be talking about single-cell sequencing data that we use to reconstruct uh, the evolution of tumors. So I hope this uh, will provide some uh, uh, food for thought and uh, some discussion that we can have throughout the rest of the week. And I'll be here for the hackathon. So I'm very much looking forward to that. So this talk is about these three projects that we've been working on for my uh, PhD. We're going to be looking at tumor evolution uh, from three different angles. We're going to start by trying to reconstruct the history of mutations that cancer cells undergo through. Then we will try to map cell function onto those mutations to understand how it actually um, helps the tumor to grow. And finally, we will look at profiling the tumor microenvironment. So a brief primer on tumor evolution. Um, so cancer is an evolutionary process in which cells accumulate mutations that may lead to their uncontrolled proliferation. So I have here a, a figure that I generated using a, an agent-based model that you can actually also use. And what you see here is we start off, uh, so I have a tumor slice here throughout time. And what you see here is we start off with a clump of cells with the same uh, genotype. They acquired some driver mutation that leads them to some uh, fitness advantage over the other cells, which leads to growth. So I'm coloring uh, cells here by, or groups of cells by their genotype, so by their clone. A clone is a group of cells with the same genotype. So throughout time, these cells uh, divide, the tumor grows, and then you reach a point where you have a big clump of cells with, uh, um, with these mutations. And you can have a large um, a number of cells with the same mutation, and then you have smaller groups of cells uh, with different mutations. So you go to the doctor, the doctor finds this big clump of cells with, uh, with this blue genotype, and they decide, well, let's kill the blue genotype, let's uh, uh, do some therapy to, to kill off those cells. And you do um, get some results uh, by doing that, but the fact that you are not addressing the other subclones in the tumor will eventually lead to relapse. So you'll eventually, so you kill off the blue cells here, but the other um, subclones will have an opportunity to grow because the other one is not there uh, already. And so this leads to relapse and can even lead to metastasis. And now I've talked about the cancer cells just from the cancer cells pr perspective, but in the tumor you have more than just cancer cells. You have cells which try to kill off the tumor. You have immune cells that, um, that try to, um, to detect these, uh, these malignant clones and, and kill them off. And so if I zoom in here on the tumor, you'll see a big collection of, uh, of different types of cells. You, ha you have the cancer cells, you have the immune cells, you have um, you know, the microenvironment. So it is very important that we can also not only describe the evolutionary process of the cancer cells, but also related to the tumor microenvironment that surrounds them. So the first thing that I want to mention is how do we reconstruct mutation history? So we are focusing here on um, aneuploidy. So cancer cells, one type of event that they uh, undergo through, a genomic event, is the loss or gain amplification of, um, 
of whole chromosome R, for example. So here you see a karyotype of a normal cell. You have two copies of each chromosome. And here in a tumor cell, in a cancer cell, you have, for example, you see that in this karyotype, you have no copies of chromosome two, um, and you have only one copy of chromosome five, for example, or another copy of, uh, of uh, chromosome three. So this um, phenotype is associated with more malignancy and more um, um, aggressive uh, phenotypes that are, hard, that are harder to treat. So we set out to try to profile this uh, aneuploidy from single cell DNA sequencing data. So here we have again our tumor progression, and at some time point we collect a single cell suspension from the biopsy of this tumor. We do single cell DNA sequencing, whole pass, whole genome sequencing uh, for multiple uh, single cells, for thousands of single cells. And what we want to do is to call the copy number states of each clone, of each group of cells with the same genotype uh, across the whole genome and reconstruct the history of the copy number alterations that uh, this tumor has undergone. So we have developed a method called Cycone that takes this big matrix of cells by bins over the genome. Um, and what we do is we segment the, uh, the genome into regions that have undergone copy number alterations. And simultaneously, we, we reconstruct the tree where in this tree, each node corresponds to a set of events, amplification of chromosome two, a loss of chromosome three, and this is propagated throughout the tree. And so we have developed this method, which allows us to, to, to do this uh, um, very well using an MCMC algorithm. But of course, this does not tell us what the cells are actually doing. You know, you can have amplifications that leads to overexpression uh, of genes, but you can also have changes, uh, copy number changes that have no practical effect in the, in the phenotype. So the usual way that you go about assessing um, a cell function at high throughput uh, um, using sequencing data is by doing single cell RNA sequencing. And if you are not familiar with single cell RNA sequencing, which I highly doubt, the first thing that, well, the standard approach that, uh, that you do is you project your high dimensional data for each cell. You have a gene expression profile, you project it to two dimensions, and then you just start to see groups of cells which are more similar to each other than the others. And what this allows you to do is to type the cells. You have B cells and T cells in your uh, tumor microenvironment, but then you also have all the cancer cells and you can do unsupervised clustering to, to identify different uh, groups of cells there. However, this ignores completely the genomic information. You can have gene expression profiles which are just driven by uh, noise in the data. Single cell RNA sequencing data is very noisy. And so when you do this unsupervised clustering here, you ha are not guaranteed that this has any evolutionary meaning. On the other hand, if you do single cell DNA sequencing, you have no information on the cell function. And the problem is we cannot do at high throughput single cell DNA sequencing and RNA sequencing from the same cells. So we have to do it on the same uh, biopsy. For a subset of cells, we do single cell RNA sequencing. And for another set of cells, we do DNA sequencing. But we need to associate now these two modalities in order to, to match them. So one thing that you can do is you simply look at each cell in the single cell RNA sequencing and assign them to a clone that you have found uh, from your DNA sequencing data. Tools that do this include CloneAlign, which is used as the basic assumption that if you have um, an amplification of a, genomic, of a genomic region, then the genes on average um, on that genomic region will, will be overexpressed for that cell. So this is a very simple uh, heuristic that you can use and you assign, you basically summarize the, the RNA sequencing data using these, uh, these copy number clones. But this approach would ignore the fact that we know that there is a tree there is an evolutionary history. Cells are more similar to each other if they are in the same branch of the evolutionary tree. And so what we set out to do is to extend these methods which ignore completely this information. In fact, they ignore the evolutionary history and they also ignore the fact that within each subclone, you can have gene expression-based clusters. You can have cells with the same genotype but highly variant uh, in their gene expression profiles. So the question is, how do we use um, um, the evolutionary history and single cell DNA sequencing to better uh, do clustering on the uh, cancer cells that we have from single cell RNA sequencing? This is why we developed Skatrex. Skatrex is a statistical model that takes as input a known fixed clonal copy number tree from DNA sequencing data and single cell gene expression data. What it does is it augments the copy number tree with extra nodes corresponding to gene expression clusters. 
And these clusters exist in the tree. They can be driven by, uh, by mutations that would then be propagated down to the other subclones. And so what this allows us to do is to query our data and see if we see a, a gene expression change in a cell, is it due to its copy number uh, changes or is it due to, to trans effects or other regulatory effects or simply mutations that we have not detected using our copy number assay? So briefly, you know, mathematically, formally, we define Skatrex using these, three, these two um, uh, sections. The first section is the structure. And what we do there is we assume that uh, within each node in the given copy number tree, there is a tree that we do not observe. And that tree corresponds to the gene expression changes within that clone. And the other part of our, of our model is how is single cell RNA sequencing data gene expression generated from each cell given that it belongs to a node in this tree? So this, uh, uh, um, this first part, we define it using you know, briefly a tree structured stick breaking process, which is a way to define a mixture model basically in which the components are related in a tree and the weights are defined using the tree structure. And what we do, as I said, is we posit that there is an unknown um, tree within each one of these clones and nodes which connect the, the inner nodes to the rest of the tree. And that leads us to having this complete tree that has both copy number events in these colored nodes and transcriptional um, uh, cell state changes in the gray nodes. For inference, what we do is we try to maximize the the marginal likelihood, which is not uh, um, available for, to us, so we try to approximate it using the, the elbow for, from a variational inference, details in the paper, and we simply do this iterative scheme where we start off from this uh, simple copy number tree, we add nodes, we check if it better explains the data, we accept or reject based on the metropolis ratio. So briefly in simulations, what we show is that not only are we better able to assign cells to their right clones of origin, but also we are better able to respect the true clustering structure that exists within the data. Because if you just run unsupervised clustering on, on single cell RNA sequencing data, you ignore um, the evolutionary history, you may overfit to noise. On real data, so we apply this to a, single, to a patient derived xenograft of uh, breast cancer data. We are given a copy number three these are the copy number clones, so you see basically that A is very distinct from, from B and C, basically due to this loss of, um, of chromosome X. We ran Skatrex, and what it found was many, um, uh, you know, a couple of, <laughs> not many, um, a few nodes that are not driven by copy number changes, but are driven by gene expression changes. And we call these the cell state factors, so things that are uh, driving the gene expression which are not due to the copy number uh, changes. And the fact that we have a model that uh, indicates the contributions of both of these parts allows us to really be specific about what, uh, what, where the variation comes from. In particular, we looked at uh, these uh, MHC class 2 genes, HLAA and HLAC. These genes are responsible for uh, a neoantigen presentation which would allow the immune system to kill off these cancer cells. What we see here is that on, the, uh, on your, your left, is that this, these genes have the same copy number across the whole tree. All the clones have the same copy number state, but there is a subset of cells in clone A which has this, uh, um, um, this gene underexpressed. And this would explain why in subsequent passages of, of, of this uh, patient-derived xenograft, this is the clone that ends up growing because it ends up um, doing some immune escape. So that's on a... Uh, on, um, associating cell function with a tree. For the last thing that I want to say is about the, tum the tumor microenvironments. So we started off with only DNA sequencing data. We moved on to single cell and uh, RNA and DNA sequencing data. And now we're back to only RNA data. So here we are again, our tumor evolution. We get a biopsy. We get a bunch of, uh, of cells from tumor microenvironment, including cancer cells and immune cells. Now, this thing that I'm showing here, which is already pre-annotated, this is not an easy task at all. So calling, uh, identifying the, the cell types from single cell RNA sequencing data is a, a difficult task in itself, and identifying the genes that drive each one of these, uh, um, of these cell types in a de novo way is also very difficult because single cell RNA sequencing data is very 
noisy. So that's why we developed single cell def, which is for short for deep exponential family. So single, SC def just takes a single, single cell gene expression matrix, the raw counts, the read counts of, uh, of the data, and it produces this object, which is a def, which contains the gene signatures that are present in the population that we have in our data and hierarchical relationships between these data, which allows us to further constrain the gene signatures that, are, that we are able to learn, which avoids us from learning too much noise. So what are these, um, uh, these hierarchies in practice? So you can think of, for example, T cells. You can have many different subtypes of T cells. You can have naive T cells. You can have effector T cells. Uh, all of the different you know, specific cell states in which T cells can be. And you can have also monocytes. You can have different subtypes of monocytes, for example. And so the DEF would immediately automatically select the number of factors in the upper level and in the lower level and identify the gene signatures that drive each one of these uh, cell states. So we apply this to the, you know, to the standard PBMCs, uh, uh, 3,000 PBMCs that you see in the ScanPy or Surat uh, tutorials if you've, uh, if you've um, looked at them. So this is just you know, a fairly well annotated data set that we can use to just to check that SEDEF is doing something sensible. So here I am plotting again a UMAP where each cell is colored by the, the cell type that has been previously annotated using all these standard tools. And then I'm coloring the cells by the upper layer factors that best describe them and by the lower level factors that best describe them. So I'll start with the lower level factors. And the main thing that I want you to, to, to acknowledge is that these basically map very well back to the original cell types. And in the middle layer, you see that these uh, factors are aggregated onto a meaningful hierarchies. For example, the monocytes are all coupled together. And now, if you look at the DEF, you have not only these hierarchical relationships, but you have the gene signatures that drive each one of these, uh, um, of these cell types. So SCDEF basically is driven by the fact that it uses sparsity, it uses non-negativity, which leads to a very interpretable um, set of gene signatures, um, and the hierarchy, of course. So what I want you to, to first look at is an alternative method which does not use this, uh, these constraints, which basically, you know, th this is a, an SCVI-based uh, uh, based method, a neural network-based method that learns interpretable factors of gene expression as well. But these are interpretable in the sense that they are linear, linear but they are not non-negative and they are not sparse. And what this leads um, is that if we look at the factors and their association with the annotated cell types, you have no clear mapping. And so if you look at the, at the loadings, at the gene loadings at each factor, you would not um, be confident to say that these factors actually have the gene signatures of these cell types. Whereas if you look at SC DEF's factors, they clearly correlate, very, capture very well the, the different cell types, which means that the gene signatures would also capture very well the, the genes that drive these, uh, um, these cell types. So another thing that's good about SCDEF is that it uses this uh, hierarchical structure to further constrain the gene signatures and the cell states that it is able to learn, which allows us to tackle a very deep problem in single cell RNA sequencing data, which are, which is the fact, which are batch effects. So batch effects, uh, so let's just uh, describe the data. So we have here two sets of, um, of PBMCs. One, uh, one group of, of PBMCs has been stimulated with interferon. And now you, want to, you have these two data sets and you want to see what is different between this, uh, these two sets of, uh, of cells. If you just plug them into a UMAP jointly, everything separates. All the, all, all the, all the cells from all the different uh, subtypes separate. These are batch effects. Cells should be similar in, uh, to some extent, but they are all separated here. Now, SCDEF is able to find in the upper layer uh, to cluster together cell types here that make some sense. All these are the same um, cell types, and they are clustered together here, but except for monocytes. And monocytes are known to have a cell type specific response to interferon, which is basically an, an overexpression of CXCL10, which is captured in the factors that drive the upper layer of SCDEF. So finally, uh, we applied this to a cancer data set. Um, and what I want to show here is we have now um, many cell types. We want to type them, profile the tumor microenvironment. And SCDEF, you know, it can find the main structure that drives um, your data, 
But this does not mean that it finds the, tr the structure that you want to find in your data. And so if you look at the factors that, uh, that we are learning here, they do not relate very well with the cell types. So what I want to show here is that you can use SCDEF, its generative model, the fact that it is, it is interpretable, it is Bayesian. You can use a prior on the genes, on the cell types that you can find, on the, on the genes that drive those cell types, and this will guide the SCDEF to actually learn the, the, those cell types. I will skip this part. So to conclude, I have briefly talked to you about all these uh, three methods that we've been working on for uh, tumor evolution, Cycon to reconstruct mutation history, Skatrex to map cell function to mutation history, and SCDEF to um, identify hierarchical gene signatures uh, from single cell RNA sequencing data. Now, I do want to say something about um, spatial data, and this is, you know, I'm very excited to be here and to talk to you. Tumors are not, uh, you know, clumps of cells with no structure. They exist in space. And so it is fundamental if we want to understand tumor evolution at a deep level, how do these cells relate to each other in space and how does this constrain the evolution of tumors? And so this is something that we can talk about in the panel session even. I want to thank my, um, my group, which I love very much. I want to thank Nico and Jack for supervising me, the Tumor Profiler Consortium for funding, and thank you all for uh, listening to me. Thanks. All right, we have time for some questions. In the back. A microphone is coming your way. You're all good. We just want to hear your question. I don't have to yell. Is it on? OK, thank you for the really informative talk. I'm curious to know more about your SCDEF function. So how does, it, how does the output of that function compare to that the output that's typically acquired from like the find all mark markers function or some kind of differential expression analysis that's common to these pipelines? Yeah, so SCDEF, the thing that we, um, we identified two problems. So, um, you know, the usual pipeline for uh, uh, marker gene finding is you first cluster your cells and then you do differential expression between the clusters. Now, statistically, this is a very, uh, you know, um, how to say, tricky thing to do because but if, by the fact that you are predefining your clusters and then doing hypothesis testing, you will get um, artificially low p-values. And so the first thing that we wanted to do is to address this with a single model that would um, um, be sure to not um, find false discoveries. Um, the other thing is that by the fact that we account for the hierarchy in cell types, um, these gene signatures are much less con are much more constrained to um, to things which would be you know to these false dis discoveries. So, for example, when you do bi when you have batch effects, if you do differential expression between the, the all the cells in all the clusters in different batches, you would get really um, um, all genes would be differentially expressed between uh, cells of the same type but in different batches. So, we want a model that constrains the gene signatures that we can find so that these things do not happen. And finally, the, uh, what I want to say is that SCDEF is a Bayesian model. It averages out the number of factors that it is able to learn. You do not predefine the number of factors that, uh, uh, that you want to have. It finds the lower level a structure containing the gene signatures and the upper level uh, a structure um, containing the hierarchical relationships uh, between these uh, signatures. Thanks. Right here. Thank you. That was an interesting talk. No one's introducing themselves, but I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Tim. I'm an editor at the Journal of Cell Biology and super happy to be here. I have a question about your second vignette on um, the Skytrex. Skytrex, yeah. Skytrex. Um, Skytrex yeah. Uh, so my impression was that the trees of gene expression were always embedded within the trees of DNA uh, mutations. And okay. it just occurs to me that it's theoretically possible that you could have gene expression states, theoretically, I guess, that are identical across cells that are different in their yeah. DNA state. And so I just wanted to know how you um, confront that, if that's at all an issue. Yeah, that's a, a very good question. So you can have, for example, spatial um, interactions that lead to cells from different clones to have similar gene expression profiles. 
And so what we wanted is not to capture that. We wanted to capture heritable gene expression states. What that means is that we wanted to capture gene expression which is caused by things which are heritable, for example, mutations or epigenetic changes in the, uh, in the cell. And so we constrained the model using you know, um, extreme sparsity in the things that we can learn, and we put them in this, uh, in this tree structure in order to be, to be sure that the things that we learn do actually correspond to subclone-specific uh, variations. And we have a separate term that is global variation across the tree that cells can, uh, can also use, but that is separate, a separate term from the things that can be inherited. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to Pedro and all three of our first session speakers. But first, we have Dr. David Van Valen. He is an assistant professor in the Division of Biology and Bioengineering at Caltech. And his research group's long-term interest is to develop a quantitative understanding of how living systems process, store, and transfer information, and to unravel how this information processing is perturbed in human disease states. His presentation is titled, Everything as Code. Take it away. Uh all right, uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction and for the invitation to uh, come speak here. I remember speaking at Cytodata a few years ago, and I'm very glad to be back, although with more, more gray hair this time. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so the title of today's talk is Everything is Code, and hopefully uh, in a few slides you'll get a sense of what I, uh, what I mean by that. And so what I'd like to start is just uh, briefly talking about the uh, uh, talking about this intersection uh, between the life sciences and artificial intelligence, deep learning, machine learning. For the purpose of this talk, I'm going to use those terms interchangeably, although technically speaking, they aren't the same thing. And I think the reality, particularly when it comes to the imaging part of life sciences, we're actually living through two simultaneous uh, technology revolutions. Uh, we've had one revolution on the side of imaging, um, and so this includes advances in uh, reporters. Uh, as you know, Yuri's talk so elegantly showed, there are you know, a wide array of reporters that can illuminate different parts of cellular physiology um, in, in living cells. Uh, we've had advances in multiplexing, um, and so instead of looking at one thing or two things at a time uh, in um, in, uh, in living systems, you know, now we can look at quite literally, you know, dozens um, or thousands or thousands of things at the same time. And so this sort of alludes to this, uh, this uh, burgeoning field of spatial, uh, spatial genomics where, you know, quite literally in the same, uh, same sample, you can measure both the spatial location and the abundance of either uh, dozens up to approximately 40 different protein species at the same time or quite literally thousands of different transcripts. And then also on top of that, we've had, we've had advances uh, in resolution, so this alludes to the super resolution uh, methods, methods as well. Uh, the spatial genomics methods, I'd say, are, are particularly stand out because they give rise to a new type of data where you have both uh, X and Y giving you the spatial variation, but then also they give you a parts list dimension as well. Uh, at the same time, we've had advances uh, in these deep learning AI algorithms, which have really transformed our ability to extract uh, quantitative information uh, from, imaging, from imaging data. And so a collection of tasks that can now be done, I would argue, fairly routinely um, are shown here on the slide. Uh, they include uh, cell segmentation, finding cells and images, which is going to feature quite prominently in this talk, uh, but also a number of more imaginative applications as well, um, you know, dealing with single molecule data, um, inferring uh, uh, fluorescent structures from label-free data, and then also restoring, uh, restoring uh, noisy data. And this is really a very exciting, uh, exciting area. Um, there are too many advances uh, for me to do justice to this space on a single slide. Uh, but the way I sort of contextualize uh, you know, what's been happening is that we've had these advances on the measurement technologies that put more information into images. And now we've had these algorithms that are allowing us to take this information uh, back out. And with this world, uh, with this world of, like, of what these different methods can do, uh, I think it's a particularly exciting time uh, to, be, uh, to be a biologist because there's just going to be many questions that you know, we can answer now that even a year or two ago we wouldn't be able to, uh, we wouldn't be able to think of answering. Uh, so zooming into uh, sort of the uh, algorithm point of view, and I'd say like, uh, you know, uh, this is a space that my lab's been active in for the last four years. And, you know, really what we're trying to do uh, is to build AIs or AI systems 
that can take in raw biological imaging data and interpret it like a human might do. Um, and so this example uh, I like to describe as you know, sort of my lab's uh, Moby Dick, although that would you know, leave me being the, the, the Captain Ahab. Um, uh, but you know, what we see here is a, one of the classic uh, cell biology movies um, of an immune cell called a neutrophil um, chasing a bacterial cell and find, eventually it finds it, engulfs it, and eats it. And immediately after seeing this, right, our brains, uh, those, uh, those of us who spend some time um, in cell biology, which is, I feel like most of us, uh, our brains immediately recognize what's happening. Um, and what we would like to be able to do, uh, sorry, uh, we'd like to be able to do is have uh, AI models be able to look at these sorts of raw data and then produce the very same type of narratives uh, that, I, that I just told you um, about today. And you can actually go through a thought exercise of what would, what would be required uh, to do that. And so the very first notion that you, know, you might want an AI system uh, to be able to understand is just the notion of what's a, oh, what's a cell. And so we should understand you know, that uh, you know, this wiggling mass of pixels is a cell. This is a cell. These wiggling black dots are cells. It should understand this notion of like temporal consistency. Right? This is a movie with many different frames. And the detected cells uh, in each frame, uh, more often than not, uh, are referring to the same uh, the same entity, um, and so if it's if you're able to uh, do that, then you can also extract information like you know what cells look like, um, what the um, uh, where they are, um, have this, uh, and also have uh, these records over um, over time. Uh, that's not all though, uh, and so there's this semantic. Uh, this layer of semantic information or biological information uh, on top that you'd want uh, that you'd want the system to understand as well as well, and so this includes the notion of uh, of cell types, right? So you understand, you know, these are red blood cells. Uh, this is a neutrophil. Um, these wiggling black dots are bacterial cells. Uh, but uh, but it should also understand the relevant interactions between cells that are present in this movie, right? And it should understand that you know there isn't. Uh, any meaningful interaction between the red blood cells or any other type of cells. Uh, but for the immune cell and the bacterial cell, um, and specifically like this specific bacterial cell, you should understand that at the beginning of the movie, uh, there's this interaction called chemotaxis, um, and that at the end of this movie, there's this interaction called phagocytosis, and that in, when the phagocytosis event happens, there's this change of state on the bacterial cell from being, uh, from being alive to being, uh, to, being, to being dead. And so, uh, Roughly speaking, you know, uh, to you know, to borrow some language from the uh, from computer science, uh, really what we need um, to be able to build these systems are these algorithmic building blocks, which I like to call computational primitives, that will perform each of these key steps, but do so in a way where it's general. And so it's agnostic to you know, the, you know, where the data came from, what systems you're looking at, what microscope you're using to collect the data, um, you know, de uh, details about like image acquisition, um, frame rates, camera settings, um, and whatnot, and really can just you know, take in you know, these raw uh, sets of data, regardless of where they came from, and produce these sorts of, uh, these sorts of um, um, uh, spatial, temporal, uh, spatial temporal graphs. And that's really what we're, uh, what we're trying, to, uh, trying to build in my lab, are these general computational primitives, be it for identifying cells, tracking cells, finding single molecule spots, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, this gets into the, uh, sort of the uh, title of today's talk, Everything is uh, uh, as Code. And you know, part of what we've realized over the past four years is that if you really want to do this well and scale these efforts to build these general AI models, uh, the deep learning itself isn't enough. Uh, really, what you need um, are you know data, and this includes both the data, um, uh, the data that is comprehensive enough so that it, ca it captures most of what you want these models to perform on, uh, the labels which contain the, the the insights you want these models to be able to extract. Um, you also need the models uh, to be able to do that information extraction, and then you also need the computational infrastructure, both for model training um, and also and also and also deployment. And so. Uh, Rather than working on any one of these problems uh, individually, really what one should be doing is working on all three of them at the same time so you can harness the synergies that are present um, at the intersections of each of these different problems. And so rather than thinking about, hey, okay, I'm going to build a data set um, for, uh, for machine learning folks, or thinking about, okay, I'm going to make the best uh, model, or thinking about, uh, you know, I'm going to build software systems for deployment and visualization. Uh, uh, apologies, I think it's uh, something, well, some issue with the, with the talk where it's auto forwarding before. Uh, before I want, but uh, we'll deal with it. Uh, but instead of working on these problems uh, individually, really what you should be doing is working on them uh, all at the same time, harness the synergies, and uh, 
the reason why this is crafted as everything is code is because the challenges in each one of these spaces can be crafted as software engineering, um, engineering problems. Um, so with that uh, introduction, I'd just like to share some of the stories uh, that my lab has been working on for the past few years. Uh, very first one uh, gets into a problem that's you know, near and dear to my heart, uh, cell segmentation. Uh, this is a uh, problem through, uh, across var uh, various types of biological imaging experiments, including live cell imaging. Uh, uh, in, our, um, in our lab, uh, we're very keen to use uh, these live cell reporters to report on different uh, signaling pathways. Um, and to sort of report on uh, information processing uh, with single cell resolution. And you generate uh, you know, data that looks like this. Um, and to quantify these sorts of movies, what one has to do is identify cells in every frame, uh, link these detections together over time. And then once you have those temporal consistent records, you could then ask, OK, well, how, uh, how bright is each compartment? And then you can convert you know, these, raw, um, these raw movies like this uh, into these quantitative data um, like this, where each trace is sort of giving you uh, a record of a, cells, a cell signaling activity. Uh, identifying cells is also a major problem uh, for tissue imaging experiments, and this gets uh, more into the, uh, into the spatial genomics arena. Uh, there's a variety of different imaging platforms that are capable uh, of uh, measuring uh, the abundance of either you know, up to 40 different uh, protein species or quite literally thousands of different genes. Uh, they produce very, very rich data sets. So here's an example data set taken by, uh, from a paper by Liat Karen and Mike Angelo, published in Cell a couple, uh, sorry, uh, a couple uh, a couple years ago, and you know, really, the point isn't to harp on you know any individual marker um, or you know on the biologists being explored, but just to say that for each of these uh, these patient uh, um, uh, these patient samples, you can collect an n color image uh, where n is a number between you know a 40 and a thousand, uh, where each color corresponds to some biologically meaningful variable. Uh, so, for example, the CD45 highlights immune cells, EGFR and P53 reports on the states of cancer cells, um, and whatnot. Uh, gorgeous data, uh, hard to analyze, and one of the very first things you have to do is go into these uh, data sets and identify where the cells are. Um, and so, you know, to be concrete, you know, some, uh, some algorithm or human has to go in and say, okay, this collection of cells belong to cell number one, cell number two, cell number three, um, et cetera, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so if you're able to do this, then you can do things like ask, like, okay, well, how bright um, is each quote unquote color channel? Um, do clustering to identify cell types, cell states, um, identify spatial patterns, and you have outcomes information, you can uh, potentially link these uh, spatial patterns uh, to, uh, to outcomes. And so from the computational primitives perspective, you know, what's really needed in both of these places, uh, spaces are computational primitives that can just do the cell detection um, reliably, accurately, and, and robustly. Uh, for the live cell imaging data, uh, what this really, what this means is having uh, algorithms that can do uh, cell segmentation um, and tracking and automatically construct cell lineages. Uh, for the tissue imaging, uh, uh, really what this, what this means is having algorithms that can do uh, both nuclear and whole cell um, segmentation. Um, turns out for a variety of use cases, uh, you need both sets of information uh, to maximize the amount of uh, data that you can get from these spatial, uh, spatial genomic assays. Uh, okay, and so uh, the very first part, um, as I said, you know, data compute, uh, sorry, data models and compute. Uh, very first part is generating the data sets to power these models. Uh, and so uh, one effort that we've been working on uh, for the past few years, which we're you know still uh, quite excited about, is just putting together uh, an image net for cellular imaging, uh, where the the uh, designed use case is to build uh, these general computational primitives uh, for the tissue imaging data. Uh, what we've done is we just compiled a large amount um, of tissue imaging data, where we have both a nuclear state and a cytoplasmic stain, uh, making sure that we're encompassing uh, all the different tissue types that folks are commonly imaging and all the different uh, spatial, uh, spatial genomic platforms that are being used. Uh, for the live cell imaging data, um, uh, what we've done is, is sort of compile um, and also collect a uh, collection of live cell imaging movies um, so, uh, sort of across uh, you know, commonly used uh, cell lines. And you know, these data sets are, are, are quite large, but with them, with them collected, um, the next major challenge is actually generating the labels. And so uh, there's actually so much data that humans could never uh, do it um, by themselves. Uh, and there's also an issue of, of just uh, complexity within each data set. Um, showing an example, uh, example data here just to give you a visual sense of what this looks like. Uh, for the tissue imaging data, I think the real challenge is cell morphology. Uh, morphology differs drastically uh, both across and within tissues. In addition to this, you have differences in things like you know, uh, signal to noise and autofluorescence characteristics uh, from the different imaging platforms. Uh, and, then, uh, sorry, and then you also have uh, issues uh, just you know, artifacts of doing uh, two-dimensional imaging. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, your your uh, imaging plane will miss uh, cell nuclei, and you have a collection of uh, you know collection of cells that will have uh, membrane stains but no cell nuclei. Uh, for the live cell imaging data, you know, the real challenge here is just time. 
uh, and producing labels that are temporally consistent, uh, but then also capture uh, the dynamic events like cell division, like cell death, that invariably happen um, in, um, in these movies. And I just show like this collection of movies just to state, just to show that you know when you're imaging uh, samples like immortalized cell lines, the textbook story about cell division, one cell turns into two, is just, uh, well, that is the majority of what you see. Um, that's not all that you see. And you want to be flexible enough with your labeling uh, framework so that these edge cases uh, you're, you're, able to, you're able to label so that you can also generate the models that can, uh, uh, that can uh, produce them, uh, well, that can you know, be able to uh, you know, perform accurately on these, for these form of data. Uh, and so part of what we realize is that you know, this task is too hard for the AIs, uh, uh, for just unsupervised or self-supervised AI. It's too hard for the humans to do alone. Uh, why not have the humans um, and the AIs work together? Um, and so then the real challenge is building software systems uh, to enable this human AI collaboration. Um, and out of this effort, uh, we've uh, ended up creating a software tool uh, called Deep Cell Label, uh, which is uh, browser native software uh, designed for distributed labeling of large biological image collections. And you know, really what we've, uh, what we've uh, spent a lot of time thinking about uh, are you know the hard uh, the the hard things uh, about biological images where the details matter and that the the uh, the ability to annotate them uh, would make a big difference uh, for uh, for the. Uh, for the live cell imaging data, an example is being shown here. Uh, this includes you know, being able to uh, annotate things like cell divisions um, and do so in a way with the user interface that's, uh, that's intuitive for, uh, for how a labeler uh, might, uh, might, uh, might operate. Um, and I would just uh, would like to highlight this one point. You know, I, I use this term label. Um, and really, uh, what I mean by this is a human insight um, that's captured in a machine-readable uh, machine format. Um, that's, uh, that's really what, uh, what we mean by, uh, by labeling. And just like we have a, a, a version of this for the live cell imaging data, uh, we have a similar version for, uh, for the spatial genomic data as well, where there the challenge is you know, having labelers uh, look at potentially a, a large number of different, uh, different quote unquote colors. Okay, uh, with the software, then there's a question of like, okay, well, how can you, uh, how should one label? And uh, we, have a, we had a paper that we published in Nature Biotechnology uh, about um, uh, earlier, uh, late last year, early, early this year, uh, describing a, a, a scalable approach to labeling large, uh, large image collections. Um, and the way this works is, you know, by putting a human uh, in the loop. Uh, three different phases. Uh, first phase, experts create a preliminary data set, preliminary model. Uh, this model works, uh, you know, uh, okay, but it makes a fair number of errors just because it hasn't seen enough, enough examples. Uh, this model gets passed off to the second phase where crowdsource workers uh, then create new, uh, label new data uh, by correcting model errors rather than uh, labeling images uh, from scratch. And by having uh, them label in this way, uh, you end up substantially reducing the marginal cost of annotation as your labeling project proceeds. Because you end up retraining the model, the model gets more accurate, and you end up having to spend less time, um, uh, less time having crowdsource workers uh, correct errors because there are just fewer errors to correct. And then uh, there's this, phase, this third phase where you've you know, labeled a large, large amount of data. Uh, uh, train a uh, quote unquote final model on it, and then you release that model uh, to the community. Um, although in practice, you know, really you're kind of always stuck in phase two because there's always new data that, that, um, that's coming in where you know, there, are, there are potential improved uh, performance gains uh, by, um, by, uh, by adding, uh, adding those labels uh, into your training data pile. Uh, and so we've Sorry, uh, there we go. Okay, uh, and so we've taken the software um, and this approach to labeling. Uh, we run it on our, our full set of tissue imaging data to create a data set called TissueNet. Uh, it contains approximately 1.2 million uh, paired uh, whole cell and nuclear labels uh, across six different uh, imaging, uh, imaging platforms and nine different tissue types, three different disease states. Uh, it took approximately two person years, uh, 4,000 person hours or two person years worth of work to label. Uh, but because we're doing this in a distributed way, uh, a very, uh, this uh, did not take two years worth of uh, time to do. And most of this, uh, most of this work was spread out uh, across this uh, distributed pool of crowdsourced labor uh, uh, workers. Uh, the experts, you know, were able to spend most of their time doing, um, doing, uh, doing quality control um, and managing managing the crowd. Uh, and so, as a result of this, uh, we have this large data set that we're able to train uh, these, uh, you know, very accurate deep learning models uh, that uh, that can do both nuclear and whole cell segmentation. Uh, across diverse sets of uh, tissue imaging data. Um, and so here's some example data from uh, 12, uh, taken from 12 different samples. Uh, and then here are the predictions um, of our deep learning method, which we've called MESMER, um, along with associated um, F1 scores with a measure of accuracy. And visually speaking, you can see that, these, uh, that, it, that it performs uh, quite well. Uh, in the paper, we sort of dive into the, into the benchmarking on full detail. And really what we're able to show is that uh, these, uh, these deep learning models that are trained on this large scale of data uh, perform uh, on par with humans. Um, in the sense that humans 
and these models uh, you know, sort of sampling from the same uh, space of reasonable segmentations. Uh, we've been hard at work uh, performing the same task for live cell imaging data. Um, the nice thing about uh, live cell imaging data is that we're actually able to label entire movies uh, rather than individual frames, and this lets us develop models uh, both for cell segmentation um, and also cell tracking. Um, here you can see the results of some of these models. Uh, same model being applied to four different uh, cell lines uh, uh, with, with uh, fluorescently labeled nuclei, uh, uh, raw 264.7 cells, HAP293 cells, uh, and IH323 cells, and then HeLa, um, HeLa S3 cells. And just visually speaking, you can see that the, uh, the hardest part of this cell tracking task, which is the division detection, um, we're able to get quite, uh, quite well. If I remember our, our most recent benchmarks, uh, so I want to say the F1 score is about, uh, about point, uh, point 0.9. Uh, another uh, critical, uh, 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 sorry, another critical uh, computational primitive is spot detection. Um, this is very important for uh, the, the uh, spatial uh, transcriptomic methods that rely on multiplex single molecule fish. Briefly speaking, the way these methods work is that you'll do uh, multiple rounds of single molecule fish on the same, uh, same sample, uh, and the uh, gene identity, identity is encoded uh, by which rounds uh, you know, a particular uh, gene will appear. And so to analyze these flavor of data, what one has to do is, is identify uh, spots across all the different rounds, uh, register them, and then de decode these detected spots uh, into gene identities. Um, what's been missing from this entire space is a, a good, uh, robust, uh, general purpose spot, uh, single molecule spot detector uh, that's just agnostic to details like uh, the, about um, you know, which microscope you're using, um, you know, uh, minor details about your point spread function, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so the, from the machine learning perspective, this actually isn't a hard problem to do. Um, and so other, uh, you know, we're not the first people to you know, write down deep learning methods uh, for, gener uh, for doing uh, a single molecule spot detection. Uh, the hard part is on the data. Uh, because it turns out in these data sets, uh, there are far too many spots for humans to ever uh, be able to annotate. Um, and you know, for you know, asking graduate students to actually annotate everything, um, they, would, they would quite literally f uh, flee from my lab. Um, and so you know, what's, uh, what's one to do? Um, and so one of my graduate students, uh, Emily, has figured out is a weekly supervised approach to spot detection. Uh, the way this works is uh, there, are, uh, there are classical spot detection algorithms uh, that, work quite, um, that work quite well, uh, but they require manual fine tuning. And there's a discrepancy, there are disagreements among them. And so what we do is we sort of take a representative collection of spot, uh, spot detection data fine-tune uh, each of these uh, classical algorithms to it, and then we perform generative modeling to find consensus among these classical algorithms, and then we train the deep learning models on those consensus predictions. Uh, it works uh, quite nicely as far as identifying spots, um, and uh, what we find, what we've uh, found is that when you take this uh, general purpose spot detector combined with a generative model for, uh, uh, for uh, decoding gene identities, uh, and our, our general models for, uh, for cell segmentation, uh, what we have is a complete pipeline for single molecule fish, uh, multiplex fish based uh, spatial transcriptomics uh, that's end to end. It doesn't require any uh, manual, uh, manual fine tuning, um, which is something that I, I, I just, the, the, this field is needed uh, for quite some time. Uh, even uh, the, the labs that have developed these techniques, uh, when you actually look at how they're doing their processing, um, there's still an inordinate, uh, a not trivial amount of uh, manual, uh, manual fine tuning. Uh, okay, uh, I have uh, a couple slides. Uh, well, this is like the last slide. If I can, if I can, if I can finish. Okay, I just want to give a little bit about like what comes next, right? And using the the cell segmentation as a, as an example, and you just look at the space of all the different segmentation methods that are out there. Um, the they actually don't differ that much as far from the deep learning perspective. Uh, they differ in how they represent uh, the idea of what's a cell to the deep learning model. Um, and so there are different ways, be it you know uh, interior. Uh, background and, uh, and boundaries. Uh, there are deep watershed methods, which are effectively what we use. Uh, there are vector embedding methods uh, like, uh, like cell pose. Uh, but this is how they differ. And you know, the, this is you're really fine tuning these representations. And for your problem of interest, uh, you end up picking a representation where it's going to perform, uh, perform, perform well. Uh, uh, it, Turns out that these, rep that these uh, representations do have limits. So for example, if we were to take what we did with Mesmer, um, works great for tissues, uh, apply it to say filamentous bacteria, um, it'll fail. Uh, but then there are other uh, sets of data where just the very notion of uniquely assigning um, a pixel to an individual cell is intrinsically gonna fail. Um, and this is something that we see in live cell imaging data all the time where cells like to crawl on top of each other, eat each other, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is actually uh, not just a, a representation failure, uh, but it's a failure in 
just the very way in which the training data um, and the labels are generated. Um, and so it's across the entire software stack. And so to be able to generate models that can deal with something like this, which I would uh, personally argue uh, is the deep end, uh, you need to be able to have labels that you can capture uh, overlapping objects. This requires that you rethink uh, the notion about how you're saving labels. Uh, and it also requires you to rethink um, how, uh, how you're framing the segmentation problem. And you know, we're sort of, this is uh, ongoing work, but we've you know, sort of refactored our labeling software to be able to do this. And we've recently begun exploring uh, these transformer-based segmentation methods uh, that do not rely on uh, sort of this representation engineering, but rather just directly take in these sets of images and predict uh, sets of, uh, of cell masks. Um, and the preliminary results are quite, are, are quite, are quite promising. Um, and so I'll just leave you with this as a uh, potential path for the future. Um, you know, we're really, you know, with the, without the need for doing this representation, really then the focus then just becomes on generating the data and the labels to get these models to do the sorts of things that you want them to do. Um, with that, I will end my talk. Huge thanks to my lab, uh, whose hard work made all these results reality. Um, and then also a uh, huge thanks to all of the different organizations who are willing to um, fund and support our work. All right, we have time for just one question. <coughs> Anybody? Is that the fastest you can talk? Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, I, I, I actually slowed this down. <laughs> I see one over here. Um, so I actually have two good questions. So yes. Thanks. So uh, how uh, does the spot detection model scales with data? And for uh, overlapping labels, how do you predict that? Like, do you predict many images, each, uh, each one for a single um, new cell? Or do you predict like SVG okay. masks? Uh, so, for, so for the spot detection uh, model, uh, if you're doing this uh, weekly supervised approach, uh, it actually scores like quite well as far as like the number of spots required to get a good model. Um, and I want to say it's on the order of like between 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 5th. Um, spots uh, lead to models that have uh, this sort of like really good general, uh, general performance. What really matters uh, more so is the diversity um, of imaging data, um, of, spot, of spot data. Um, and, but the actual number of, annota of annotations uh, required to get like this performance, like our benchmarking shows that it's actually uh, uh, the weekly supervised approach, you know, really does help. And we believe that the way in which it's helping um, is by removing noisy labels that you get with, uh, with, late, with uh, using either uh, classical algorithms, uh, a single individual classical algorithm, or from simulating, or the inaccuracies from simulating, um, from simulating data. Uh, for the models for, for the deep learning methods for uh, segmenting overlapping objects, uh, the way in which these work is that for an input image, uh, it just predicts a set um, of a set of masks, and each mask can acquire can you know technically occupy any pixel in image, and so this means that uh, a given pixel. Uh, isn't constrained to be uniquely assigned to a given cell. Um, it can go to any of the potential cells that the, that the model's looking for. Uh, the one downside is that there's an upper limit um, as far as like how many cells in a particular field of view that you can, um, that you can look for, uh, but that's more of a software engineering problem uh, than, a, uh, than an algorithm problem. And, once, and we're, uh, we're busy optimizing these uh, so that we can you know, get them to train quickly and on you know, reasonably sized data sets um, so that they, uh, you know, they can be more, uh, more useful and then rolled out into deployment. Thanks. Thank you. All right. So now we're going to welcome our next speaker. Uh, applause for David before we do that. <laughs> our next speaker is Ana Sanchez Fernandez, a PhD candidate at Johannes Kepler University, Linz in Austria, and a fellow in the Marie Curie European Project Advanced Machine Learning for Innovative Drug Discovery. Her research focuses on representation learning for molecules, making use of their chemical structures and corresponding microscopy imaging data. Her presentation is titled Contrastive Learning of Imaging of Image and Structure-Based Representations in Drug Discovery. Welcome. Yes, thank you so much for the introduction. As you just said, I'm Ana Sanchez, and I'm very happy to be here today presenting the work that we have lately been developing Okay, um, to present uh, the work that we have lately been developing at the Johannes Kepler University of Linz in Austria. 
um, with, together with Elisabeth Rumesofa and with Sepp Hochreiter and Gunther Klambauer as supervisors. So this work is about uh, representation learning for molecules, making use of, the, of information from the microscopy images as well as from the chemical structures uh, with contrastive learning. So as we all know, um, biological or cell images are very rich sources of information and this is one of the reasons that we are here today. Um, because they, they display the morphological changes that are taking place in the cell. Um, for example, caused by a certain disease or induced by uh, the treatment with a certain chemical compound. So then we can extract the, these morphological changes and transform them into lower dimensional feature vectors, which are also called uh, image-based profiles, which can later then be used for different tasks. So the automation of the processes that are necessary to obtain these images together with, with the wider accessibility to computational resources have made large co collections of images available. And this large amount of uh, cell imaging uh, make this one a very exciting time um, to use deep learning methods to try to extract these features. So um, in fact, um, feed for all neural networks and convolutional neural networks have already been successfully used for this task. Um, for example, they have been proved useful for bioactivity or for toxicity prediction. However, the deep learning methods that have already been used for this task um, are fully supervised and these methods come with some limitations. Um, the first one is that they are data hungry, so they need, for, they need um, a lot of label samples. For example, for computer vision tasks, we would need more than 10,000 samples, um, label samples. So even if obtaining these images is cost effective, as it can be the case for fluorescence microscopy, um, labeling them might not be. Also, uh, this method, these methods usually just perform well um, for the specific tasks that they have been trained for. So they have limited transferabilities. So if we want them to perform well um, for new data sets or for new tasks, we would have to retrain them or fine tune them. Um, also, they are often limited to the types of tasks of classification or regression. And finally, they are sensitive to distribution sheets. So if the distribution of the training data is very far from the distribution of the test data, they will most likely not perform well. So opposed to these traits, the characteristics that we would like our machine learning models to have is to be able without, uh, to, to, to be able to be trained without the need for so much human annotation. Also, we would like them to be adaptable to new data sets and transferable to new different tasks. We would like to be, we would like them to be applicable to a wide range of different types of tasks. And we would also like them to be robust. So that's why in the last year there is being a paradigm shift in the machine learning field toward, toward self-supervised learning methods, uh, which are called this way because they are trained on unlabeled data, but using supervised learning objectives. And these methods have the characteristics that I just uh, explained to you about. They, are, they produce transferable re representations that can be adapt adapted to different tasks. Um, they are broadly applicable and they are also uh, generalized way well to new domains. So there are many different ways in which we can, um, we can obtain this cell supervision and one of them is with contrastive learning. So in contrastive learning we have groups of samples uh, that are usually pairs that are closely related to each other and what we want to do is that by predicting these relationships uh, we want to end up with a multidimensional space or a, an embedding space in which the samples that are closely related to each other are together, are positioned together in this space. Um, so for example here, the, the positive pair or the pair of samples that are closely related to each other is the red one and after learning they would be uh, located more close together. So the, the objective loss that is usually um, employed for this task is called inference loss, in which we try to maximize the similarity between the positive pair by computing the dot product, um, at, while at the same time we try to minimize the similarity between all of the rest of the pairs. So one of the, one of the most prominent self-supervised contrastive learning methods that have been lately developed is for example, CLIP. 
which is a multimodal method as they make use of um, images and as well as their corresponding text description. Um, so they scrape the internet and they retrieve 400 uh, millions of text and image pairs and this is what they try to do. They try to maximize the similarity of the representation of an image and the, and the representation of this corresponding um, text. So then they try to use these representations for different tasks, even with classes that the model have never seen before. And they, they, they show an impressive performance in these different tasks. So this, the embeddings that comes out of this clip method have already been, have also been used for guided image generation, for example, with this DALI2 methods. Um, so you might already have seen these images around Twitter and so on. So in this method, uh, by inserting a certain text prompt, we can generate very realistic images using these embeddings. Um, this method is also considered a foundation model as it's supposed to be a very, um, very robust model that we can reuse and without having to uh, train it again. However, CLIP also presents one main limitation, which is that even if we have similar samples within one mini batch, uh, we wouldn't be extracting these co-occurrences as the main task that we are optimizing for is to match one specific image with its corresponding specific uh, text description. So for example, if we have two dogs in the same mini batch, we wouldn't be extracting any, any covariance or any co-occurrences uh, within the same mini batch. So that's why uh, the method CLUB was developed. Uh, in which they included continuous model hop field networks in order to extract these core occurrences. Um, and they also uh, observed that the info and silos that I just talked to you about present some saturation. Um, so as the similarity of the positive pair grows higher, um, um, the model is, uh, is more difficult for the model to keep learning. So that's why they introduced these info and silos, info loop loss in which they don't include the positive pair in the denominator, which avoid this saturation. And they found out that this method outperformed CLIP in zero-shot tasks. So if we compare this type of uh, data sets of uh, images and text description, uh, we can find an analogy on microscopy images, uh, in microscopy imaging data set of cells that have been treated with different chemical compounds. Um, so, for example, in the cell painting data set that you might know about, which consists in 900,000 five channels microscopy images um, of cells that have been treated with 30,000 different chemical compounds, um, we can make an analogy, and this is the data set that we used for our method. So, um, some more details about the data set in case you don't know about it. Uh, they have it's uh, composed of cells that have been stained with six different dyes that uh, bind to different cell components in order to extract uh, as much um, morphological information as possible, and they are displayed in five different uh, channels. So now regarding our method, it's called CLUM, which stands for Contrastively Worn Out Boost for Molecule Encoders. And this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to learn molecular representations um, of microscopy images and molecular structures using contrastive learning. So we use the cell painting data set and we, we make these pairs of microscopy image and the corresponding molecule. And then we try to maximize the similarity uh, between the representation of an image and the corresponding molecule that have been trained, uh, that have been applied to these cells. While we minimize the similarity between all of the rest of possible pairs. So then the goal of this method is that the representation or the profile of an image and the representation of the profile or a compound are close together in, the, in this embedding space. So regarding now the specific settings that we used, we um, applied the CLIP method and the, and the CLUB method. Um, in the CLIP method, we used uh, the direct output uh, representation of the encoders for the images as well as for the molecules and then we try to we compute the info and silos to maximize the similarities. Uh, while in the, group, um, in the group approach, we have this hope field retrieval layer in which we extract these co-occurrences, and then we use the info loop loss. 
So then this is the pre-training part um, in which uh, we have we used 700,000 structure and image pairs. And as a an structure encoder, we used a feed for all neural network together with um, more than fingerprints. For the, for the image encoder, we used ResNet 50 and we trained the model during 63 epochs with a batch size of 256 with an ADAM optimizer with warm-ups. So um, the, for this part, we used unlabeled data, so it was a self-supervised learning method, and then we wanted to test whether the representation that comes out of this part uh, are applicable and are usable for different tasks. Um, so the tasks that we selected to test our method are activity prediction, so we, we tried to do logistic regression uh, for this task. We also have a retrieval task in which, given a microscopy image, we tried to select the correct molecule that was applied to this cell. And finally, we have a zero shot phenotype classification in which we select one, uh, one reference uh, representation for each one of the molecules in a test set and then we try to predict uh, uh, for, uh, for the uh, holdout test that we try to predict the, if we try to, we compute the similarity and try to see if it's as close as possible to the representation of the, of the correct molecule. So for the bioactivity prediction task, uh, we, we used bioactivities retrieved from Kimball in a multitask setting. We have 209 tasks and we compare it to fully supervised methods which are, which are convolutional neural networks and feed for all neural networks that, was, that were trained with these cell profiler features. So as you can see, these are our results. Um, these are our clump results which are comparable to some of the fully supervised um, methods and it's worth remarking that for clump we didn't train the model specifically for this task. Uh, while the fully supervised learning methods were. Then uh, the next task is the uh, retrieval for biosostatic replacement. So we give the model a query image, we encode it through our ResNet 50, to, uh, with our pre-trained ResNet 50, and we compute the similarities within um, all the molecules in a database. And then our model predicts which one would be the, the molecule that was more, more likely applied to these cells. So here we are showing the top one, the top five and top 10 accuracies, which would be the percentage of samples that have been, the percentage of samples for which the correct molecule is located in the first position or within the top five position or within the top 10 positions. And if we compare it to a random baseline, we uh, outperform them. And also um, uh, if we put it in, uh, what the task that would, be uh, for a human would be to determine which molecule was applied out of 2,000 different molecules. So it would be a very difficult task for a human to, to solve or nearly impossible. So the, here are some examples. Here are five different microscopy images. And um, now I'm showing you the top five retrieved molecules with this retrieval task. And in, in the blue square, there is a, the correct a molecule and also here I'm showing you all the, the corresponding microscopy images for each one of the molecule and as you can see for some of them the, the images look fairly similar which would mean that they have a similar biological effect so uh, which as some of the molecules you can see they are quite different from each other which would mean that we could use this model for biosteric replacement tasks. So for finding molecules that are uh, structurally different but that have fairly the same bi biological activity. We have also created a web application that you could use if you feel like it, uh, in which you can insert an image and, we, and you can find the top five retrieved molecules um, and you can also do it the other way around. You can insert a molecule and you would find the top five images of how would the cells look like if they were treated with that compound. 
So now, finally, for the zero shot phenotype classification task, um, uh, this task is called zero shot because the model was not trained specifically for this, and it's seeing uh, new classes that it has never seen before. Um, so then, uh, what we did is that for a whole that they said we we assumed that its molecule uh, was causing a different phenotype. So we selected a reference a representation for each one of the molecules. And then we computed the similarity for all of the rest of the images in the test set. Um, and we also visualized our, our embeddings, or image embeddings with a Disney plot and colored, colored them by molecule. So as you can see, these are our representations or image representation from Club. From Club. Um, each one of these dots here represent one different image. That, and if they, are, if they have the same color, means that they have been treated with the same molecule. So as you can see, they are fairly well clustered. And for the zero shot phenotype classification, um, you can see that Clum outperformed uh, a fully supervised uh, learning method as uh, at this convolutional neural network. So here are some examples of molecules um, of these embeddings. And as conclusion, we can say that contrastive learning of microscopy images and chemical structures with Clum can produce transferable uh, profiles that can be used for different tasks. Uh, for example, for bioactivity prediction, for image to molecule retrieval, and vice versa, and also for phenotype classification. And finally, that including molecular structures and microscopy images can allow for biososteric replacement tasks. So I finally want to thank all my collaborators and uh, all the people in the Institute for Machine Learning that have already have been developing uh, many of these methods, like the convolutional neural networks for microscopy or the CLUB method, which is uh, what this method is based on, and also the AIDT project, which is the, which is the European project that I'm part of. Um, so thank you. That would be all from my side. Uh, here are the, you have the links for our paper, for our um, GitHub repo, and also for the web application. And also in the web application, you have access to uh, our, the weights of our pre-trained model that you can use if you, if you feel like it. And that would be it. Thank you. And if you have any questions. All right. I see a question in the back on the end over here. Thanks for the very intriguing uh, talk. I just wanted to ask about your compound-induced phenotype process. Could you elaborate on it? Was that a continuous induction? Uh, you had a zero-shot uh, phenotype classification. Yeah, so basically, we used the, the cell-painting data set. So we, the, the images that we have have been treated with these compounds. And I think we only have one one measure for it. It's one of the compounds, so we don't have a time over, an overtime measure. Thank you. In the red shirt over here. Hi, this is a really interesting task of trying to match the drugs to the phenotypes. And I think uh, many of us have some sense of how you encode uh, image information, but I personally don't have any understanding of how you encode molecular structure information. So what sort of encoding do you use to identify chemical compounds that have sort of similar functional groups and similar chemical structures? Yeah, so thank you for the question. So for the molecules, we use the Morgan fingerprints, which are basically a hashing method of the molecule. So um, based on the substructure of the molecules, we produce a hash with zeros and ones that then encode the molecule. And then this we, we feed to a feed for our neural network, and this is how we obtain our representation. We have time for one more in the center here. Hi. Um, this is an incredible use of clip, first of all, so really good job. Um, I think this is a question everyone are wondering, have you tried or do you plan on combining this clip embedding like model with a generative model in order to see what will be the um, 
microscopy image that will be created with different molecule um, structures. Yeah, so you mean like doing a DALI method with, exactly. the, yes. with this type of microscopy image and chemical structure? Yeah, that's a very good question and it's a very interesting um, thing to try out. However, this method also needs a lot of computation and we're still not been starting to work on it, but it's definitely an interesting, an interesting idea to try out. Thank you. Thank you. All right, one more, one more right here. The size of the of the embedding, yes. it's 512 uh, dimensional vector. Great. So, thank you, Anna. Thank you so much. Dr. Lundberg is an associate professor of bioengineering and pathology at Stanford University and director of the Cell Atlas of the Human Protein Atlas program. In the interface between bioimaging and proteomics and artificial intelligence, her research aims to define the spatiotemporal subcellular architecture of the human proteome and to understand how variations in protein expression patterns contribute to cellular function and disease. Uh, when we consider single cell images as the next omics, Dr. Lundberg has been a pioneer. Her influence has been felt everywhere, including inspiring many here at the Allen Institute for Cell Science during its early days through her cutting edge approaches as well as her dedication to open team-based science. Uh, her presentation is titled Mapping the Spatiotemporal Proteome Architecture of Human Cells. Welcome, Dr. Lundberg. Thank you very much for that super sweet introduction and it's great to be here and thanks for inviting me. I'm very excited to, that we all get to meet in person again. And let's see if this works. Yes, so you already heard basically what I'm gonna say in my introduction. So my lab is very interested in understanding how proteins build the multi-scale functional architecture uh, that build up our cells and how protein spatial relocation contribute to fine-tuning cellular function and how it contributes to disease. And we're using approaches in the intersection of microscopy, proteomics, and AI with a little bonus touch of citizen science. And I should also say that everything we do is very closely connected to the Human Protein Atlas. So we're, for example, using all the antibodies. We have 40,000 antibodies that are targeting the majority of all human proteins that we've generated and validated in-house. So. We're very happy about that resource, of course, and if you want to chat about antibody validation, happy to do that later. Um, and most of the data that we produce at some point ends up being disseminated through the Protein Atlas portal as well. So I hope that you're considering using the data in this resource because it's very rich and we actually have 20 million images in here. So it's a great resource if you want to have structured image data sets that have been annotated by pathologists or cell biologists for machine learning applications, and I'll, I'll get back to that. So in my talk today, I will start a little bit with the biology that is underlying the kind of fundamental questions that we want to address and then go into the machine learning image analysis tasks that we're doing. So basically, our aim when we started was to understand where are proteins located in our cells. Very simple question. For this, we use some reference markers to outline the cell, high resolution confocal microscopy, DOPI for the nucleus. We have a marker for microtubal, so filamentous structure and a membranous structure, the ER. So now we have some kind of idea of what a cell looks like. And on top of this, we use our in-house generated antibodies to localize all human proteins one by one. So this has been a large scale, very repetitive <laughs> task. Uh, this is CD44. You can see that it's on the plasma membrane of this cell. And if an image looked like this, we'll conclude that this protein is in actin filaments. And this protein would be in nuclear speckles. And here's a centrosomal protein, for example. So it's basically a very simple pattern recognition task. And this is something we've been doing for, well, since 2007. <laughs> Generated a massive data set to outline the location of all human proteins. So this paper, a subcellular map of the human protein, was published, well, five years back now. And at this point, we had localized 12,000 proteins. Now we're up to about 14,000, which is more or less what you have expressed in cultivated cell lines. And we localized these proteins to 35 different cellular structures. So at the point when this paper was published, half of these proteins, had, we had no information about where they were. And of course, knowing if a protein is, protein is in the nucleus or the mitochondria gives you good clues about its function. Uh, so, but again, this is a very rich 
uh, image data sets. So even today, our lab is highly relying on this data set to better understand biology, and we're not only generating new data. So it's, it's very rich in information, and I'll get back to that. But of course, there are some structures that we didn't capture here. Maybe you can think of some. For example, micronuclei, very cool structures that are being formed when the nuclear function isn't working correctly. So you can see them actually in our images. So here we can apply machine learning to identify micronuclei in images and assign, understand which proteins are actually expressed in micronuclei. So here in this image, you can see two small micronuclei here and here. And we can see that this protein uh, is actually only localized to one of them. So there's also heterogeneity here. So micronuclei have been thought to be transcriptionally silent, but we can at least show that it contains a lot of different machinery for different nuclear functions, most of the nuclear function. It even contains nucleolar proteins. So we, we see proteins that are involved in import, export, splicing, transcription, well, everything, DNA repair, you name it. We also see a lot of heterogeneity within different micronuclei within the same cell type. So this is one of the new exciting locations that we're mapping. Another one is primary cilia, because they, they are basically the antenna on cells. They're sensors on cells, but they don't always exist in cultivated cell lines. We might have to induce them. Um, but the proteome of primary, primary cilia has not been mapped very well, and we know that they're very interesting because they contribute to a lot of if you have dysfunction of the cilia, you get ciliopathies, very important class of diseases. So we think that there's a lot of basic biology to understand here. And also we know that there's heterogeneity in how proteins distribute along the primary cilia. Here, this protein is only at the, at the base of the cilia, cilia. And there's also heterogeneity in terms of which signaling proteins will be in the cilia in different cell types. Uh, but the cilia is also different from the, the compartments we mapped previously because it's basically sticking out of the cell. So here we actually need 3D data. You can kind of see these antennas here sticking out of the cell. So if we want to understand the heterogeneity here, we don't only want to image cilia, we want to understand the, he the heterogeneity in relation to where the cilia is positioned, what direction it's pointing to, and so on. So there's a lot of image analysis we have to do here as well. But this is work in progress, so if you want to know more about Micronuclei, talk to Casper, who's at this meeting, or if you want to know more about primary cilia, you can talk to Jan, who's also at this meeting. But something that we found in this initial mapping that we're still very intrigued by is the fact that half of all human proteins localize to multiple compartments. So this protein is in the nucleus and at the plasma membrane at the same time in these cells. So when you think of it, the Different compartments in the cell have different chemical environments. There will be different potential interact par interaction partners in those compartments. So it's likely that these proteins could perform different functions or could even be moonlighting in different parts of the cells. And the consequences of this, of this are pretty uh, fascinating, I think. It, it greatly increases the functionality of the proteome and the complexity of the cell from a system's perspective. So in my opinion, this because of this, we can never fully understand cell function if we also don't take the spatial location into account because of this potential pleiotropic effects that arise from multilocalizing proteins. But then it actually becomes even more complex. This is, at least here, all the cells are looking kind of identical, right, in terms of localization, but sometimes it looks like this. And this is actually a well-known moonlighting protein. It's enolase 1. We know it has completely different functions depending on if it's in the cytosol, nucleus, or plasma membrane. And in these genetically identical cells, we can see they look quite different. Sometimes the protein is in the nucleus, sometimes it's in the cytosol, sometimes both, and sometimes it's also on the plasma membrane. And in addition to this, we see that sometimes it's expressed highly, the cells are bright, and sometimes it's expressed lowly. So this kind of hints at a lot of dynam temporal dynamics going on here. And also it shows that just by modulating the expression level and location of this one protein, we get a great functional heterogeneity among these genetically identical cells. So another reason why I think, of course, <laughs> that spatial proteomics is very important. Uh, so with this in mind, we went back and, and again re-examined our cell atlas data set to look for proteins that showed signs of temporal heterogeneity. So proteins that are only expressed in a subset of the cells, proteins that seems to be expressed at a diff lower or higher level, or proteins that seem to translocate. For example, here, protein in the Golgi apparatus, and in these cells that just divided, we can see that it's in, in the endoplasmic reticulum. And here, even though we're a bit underpowered, 
so I think the real number is higher, we can see that 19% of all human proteins show signs of temporal dynamics. And here we, use with, we work with antibodies, so we have to fix permeabilize the cells. We can't, we're not doing time-lapse imaging like a lot of the other beautiful talks that we've seen today. But we were thinking about how we can do some kind of pseudo-temporal mapping to actually understand these variations. And here, sorry for this quite busy slide, here we decided to uh, use a Fuji cell model, a model that has red and green fluorescent indicator that basically uh, points out its position in the cell cycle. It's a bit noisy, but we can work with that. So we can, by measuring the red and the green fluorescence, we can make this pseudo-time estimation of the cell cycle position for every cell. And they cycle at a 24-hour rate. And then if we do either sort the cells and do single cell sequencing or map, stain them with antibodies, we can map RNA and protein expression onto the cell cycle pseudo-time trajectory. And if the protein is expressed or RNA is expressed in a cell cycle dependent manner, we will see this peak emerging. If not, we'll see high variability, but just a flat line, no trend when we pseudo order the cells. And they just to show that the assay work, these are two well-known cell cycle regulators, cyclin E1, BUB1B. We see just typical noisy, but still temporal profiles at both protein and RNA level. But a lot of the new proteins that we found to be cell cycle dependent showed profiles like this. I don't know if you can appreciate the difference here. The difference is that here we see a very clear uh, profile at the protein level. So it's accumulating and degrading, whereas the RNA level is completely stable. So here we hypothesize that these two proteins, DASP18 and DASP19, at that point there was no literature indicating that they would be involved in proliferation or, or cell cycling. Uh, but we would hypothesize that they're regulated at a translational or post-translational level. And now we actually have some evidence that it's the phosphorylation that causes this uh, accumulation. And this type of pattern was very typical. And in total, we found 300 new cell cycle proteins, which I think is quite remarkable given that this is a well-studied process and it's just a regular cell line, right? Uh, but I think the reason that we found these new cell cycle proteins is because we mapped it at the protein level. Most of them were still stable at the RNA level. And of course, out of the ones that varies at both RNA and protein level, we can see that the time, of, the time difference between the peak of expression at the RNA and protein level is 8.6 hours, so it often bridges phases. RNA will peak in G1, protein will peak in G2. Also something to consider when you're doing multiomics, single cell studies, right? That you're, you will have different temporal profiles. Um, and of course, a lot of interesting cell cycle dependent translocations and a lot of interesting proteins that could serve as new markers for cell proliferation potentially in the clinic. But to get back to our initial hypothesis, we thought that most of these variations that we saw in our image data set would map to the cell cycle. But that was actually wrong. Only one third of the hits mapped to the cell cycle. The rest we could not explain. We just got, still got this flat line and high variability at the RNA level. And interestingly, we can see that there's a great enrichment for metabolic enzymes here. So again, if we go back, I told you that 19% of all human proteins showed variability, signs of temporal heterogeneity. But if we look at enzymes, this number is 40%. And again, I want to show you some example. This is a typical example. Uh, very similar to enolase 1 that I showed you before, which is also an enzyme. So this is uh, HMG, sorry, get it, HMG CS1, exactly. It's an enzyme in, in the cholesterol biosynthesis pathway, and its canonical function is in the cytosol. But we also see in the nucleus, and we see it sometimes in both, and we see this, these differences in abundance as well. And here we have no literature, we don't have a pseudo time to map the data to, so what do we do here? So here we collaborated with the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub and Manu Leonetis group there and, and created these biallelic GFP tagged uh, cell lines just to confirm that this is indeed not antibody, you know, cross reactivity or something, indeed real temporal variations. So for this cell line, the first thing that we did is that we took a single cell and let that cell grow into a clone to see if that single cell could reproduce this wide variety of phenotypes that we're seeing here. And this is also done in a different cell line. And this is the image that we got. So of course we were very happy and excited. It's even more clear here. We have cytosolic locations, nuclear locations, both, and differences in abundance. And this was the case for most of the enzymes that we tagged. Uh, and we could also see, this is a story for a different time, that the temporal time scales for the variations, they vary a lot from short to minutes to like 72 hours or longer. So it's, it's very hard to design a good imaging assay to do this at scale. So we're still thinking about how to best do it. 
But at this point, we also got a bit concerned. As we've heard all, all, earlier today, it's all about context, right? These are cell lines. Is it relevant, really? So we turned to our image collection again and the images that we have of tissues in the protein atlas. And just to show you again the same enzyme, this is to the left, glandular cells in stomach. These are all supposedly identical cells, but you can see that the brown here is the protein of interest. Sometimes it's nuclear, sometimes it's cytosolic, sometimes it's both, and in some cells it's not expressed, and sometimes it's highly expressed. These are all senior cells of the pancreas. We do not see the nuclear location, but we do see expression only in the subset of the cell. So clearly this is not circadian rhythm regulated, and we do see heterogeneity in tissue as well. And that's actually the case for most of the metabolic enzymes that we've seen so far. So this is where I will leave you at this point, but just saying that there's a great need to study protein spatial heterogeneity in single cells in the context of surrounding cells. We're trying to wrap up a big, big study on this, and we have many questions left to answer, but we've answered some of them. Um, for example, of course, what's the cause and consequence of these spatial temporal variations? So here we can still only hypothesize, but we believe that the temp it, it's some kind of temporal partitioning to, av to avoid crosstalk between different signaling pathways in the cell, for example, to avoid that metabolites are being consumed by the wrong pathway. Or it could be that the spatial temporal enzyme heterogeneity establishes functional states of the cells and even introduces some kind of variability or resilience among a population of cells, which is also very interesting to think about. The level of cellular regulation here, I didn't show you the data, but as far as we can tell, only amino acid metabolism, the heterogeneity there is regulated at a transcript level. The rest of the classes seem to be mainly regulated at a post-translational level. And that makes sense because amino acid metabolism is heavily feedback regulated. And of course, then we have a lot of questions. How do intrinsic, extrinsic factors influence metabolic states? And how do metabolic proliferative states interconnect and so on? And of course, to answer questions like this, we need highly multiplexed imaging. And because otherwise we can never understand that context. So we're working a lot with it. I don't have any data to show you today because we're, we're, we're generating a lot of data, but you, hear a lot, uh, you will hear a lot more about multiplexed imaging, I think, in the next talk. So it's very interesting technologies, I think, and very important technologies when we do want to study many markers and dynamic cell states in C2. But to get to the real topic of this talk, how do we classify and quantify spatial distribution patterns in cells? Because ultimately that's what we want to do. And while it's a lot easier in cell lines than it is in the tissue context, uh, it can still be quite challenging. So just to remind you about the main challenges, we have, first of all, the great class imbalance. Many proteins will be in the cytosol and nucleus. Few proteins will be on the tip of the microtubule, for example. We have morphological differences. This is the same active filament protein in three different cell lines. We work with 60 different cell lines. So there's great, we, we, need, very ro we need a robust generalizable model. And then we have the single cell variation. 19% of the proteins show single cell variations. So we need models that can actually classify every single cell in an image and not just the entire image. And then we have the multi-localizing proteins. So we, we, and we have, as I said, 35 different patterns we've annotated, but then we have a lot of combinations between them as well. So it, it becomes an in increasingly harder problem. And to do this over the years, we worked with ver various number of crowdsourced efforts. And the first one was inspired by projects like Foldit, where people gamified a scientific task and got the general public to help. And we thought that we would do something similar, but instead of building a game ourselves, we would just tap into an existing computer game with an existing player base, because we're not game developers, of course. So we teamed up with the producers of EVE Online, CCP Games, and a small Swiss startup, MMOS, that has been, really been pioneering the field of citizen science. And we produced the minigame called Project Discovery that was launched within the virtual universe of EVE Online. And I'm now going to show you a movie that was broadcasted in the in-game news channel when this game was launched, so they get a sense for it. Sudden drifter pullback to the five known hive systems are believed to be connected to the Capsuleer reports that gate restrictions in those systems have been removed, clearing the path for Capsuleers committed to pushing back the drifter menace. The conflict has certainly taken its toll on the Amar military, and talks of the withdrawal being a reaction to Sisters of Eve, and Capsuleer actions only adds insult to injury for the Amar. Meanwhile, Sisters of Eve has launched a crowdsourced analysis of collected drifter data entitled Project Discovery and rallied under the banner of Citizen Science Begins With You, 
They hope to unlock the new Drifter tech so that they may be made public and shared with all. This is Lena Amber, reporting for The Scope. Yes, so as you can see, we could have never done that ourselves. Uh, best graphic I'll ever have in a presentation, probably. So th there are these creatures, they're invading, they're called the drifters. So this is how they connected the scientific question to, to the game narrative. They're invading, and then the friendly association in the game called Sisters of Eve have collected pieces from the drifters. That's the microscope images. And they're telling people, if you help Professor Lundberg in game to... <laughs> She, she even has freckles. <laughs> uh, if you help Professor Lundberg in-game to classify these pieces, uh, maybe you can both help science in real life, but also unlock the secrets of the drifters and clone their tech. That has still not happened, but it, it, it's a nice plot. And we, we did have a long discussion. I don't know if you noticed. In the movie, they called it images of DNA, which is not really true. And I, I pointed out like it's images of protein, but they were saying that people who just think that it's food. And, and they were probably right, so the game developer, developers overrode my <laughs> wish on that, but I think they did the right thing. Hopefully we taught some people that proteins are important molecules um, during the project. The game in itself, simple game, pattern recognition. This is, you know, recognize this pattern, get a scientific explanation, non-scientific explanation, click all the, the patterns that you're seeing, and of course you get feedback on what you did, what the community did, and if you're right or wrong, and there's like ranking, everything a game should have their swag, there's ranking, you can start up being a novice analyst and if you play long and well, you end up with this badge and you're professor of analysis, which is kind of cool. <laughs> um, so the game was very successful in terms of participation. So within one year, we had over 300,000 gamers helping out and this like beat the, I, I think we with tenfold or something beat the previous citizen science project in terms of participation because we tapped into an existing game. But of course, we don't know yet. We were heavily criticized at this point. It's like, do you really think that gamers can do real science? And we thought so, but of course, we have to prove that. Uh, and they actually provided 32 million image classifications and spent 70 working years on the mini game alone. So it's kind of a remarkable uh, platform to crowdsource in, I have to say. And then we spent a lot of time to really evaluate the quality of the data. I'm not going to go into how we did that. I'm just going to skip to the end. So basically, it's a multi-label problem. So here we have precision recall. Um, Precision x-axis, recall y-axis, every gray dot is a gamer. The average gamer is not great, but keep in mind, keep in mind at this point, the best published model at this point was a model that could, machine learning model that could classify 10 patterns in one cell line, no combination of patterns. And we're asking the gamers to classify, I think in this case it was 30 patterns in 17 different cell lines and combinations of these 30 patterns, so it is a complex problem. So, uh, but when we aggregate the data, the, the gamers get better. They do not perform as well as blindly tested experts, though. Some of the gamers do, and we should have, should have hired them, probably. Um, <laughs> and uh, we also developed a kind of shallow uh, network to, we call Lockat, to try, at least trained on the same data set, to try to, to compare the gamers to the state-of-the-art deep learning at that, or state-of-the-art machine learning at that time. And just to say, they're, they're very close to each other. The main difference, I would say, is that the machine learning suffers from the class imbalance, whereas the gamers do not. And the gamers actually perform very, very well on rare cl classes. It's almost as if it was a treasure hunt to find the rare example. So I think this is something very interesting if you want to do citizen science and really exploit, is exploit that fact. So I think that that is something we can learn for the next project. For example, they were able to find this rare rod and ring-like pattern that uh, sometimes exists in some cells. And before this project, there were three known proteins in this structure, but after this project, I think we now know eight proteins. We still haven't figured out the function of this structure, but we, we're not working on it, but other labs are, so hopefully it helped. And it also helped the, to take the cell atlas from 23 to 30 locations. So overall, very fun project, and we demonstrated a path forward to have massively multiplayer online citizen science can feed into machine learning. Uh, models for scalable improved data classification. And I'm personally quite convinced that we'll see more of this also in science, um, kind of the ta tapping into human brains through games and, and devices, but also in, in medicine and health applications as well. But at this point, it was great fun, of course. This was a lovely project, but ideally, we don't want to have to pass images through a game before we get the annotations. So, of course, we've been thinking about deep learning and 
how we can really exploit machine learning to do this better. And since we're running an open database, we're true believers in open science. We've been hosting a series of Kaggle challenges also to get people aware of that you can work with this Im image data set as a benchmark data set. So over the years, we've hosted the first, the competition at top here was basically beat the gamers, which they did. And then we had a competition more recently where we asked people to classify the patterns of single cells in images, and I'll get back to that. And then very recently we had a competition together with HubMap where we asked, asked Kaglers to segment functional tissue units in, in, in uh, immunohistochemical images. But I want to talk a bit more about this second competition here. So it was an interesting competition to plan and execute because we thought we would make it make it hard, <laughs> make it a bit challenging because we have many good models that can handle provide classifications for a full image. And we want to provide classification. We want a model that can classify patterns in single cells, right? And of course, you can crop those cells and just make it a data set with single cells. But we, first of all, don't want to have to ground truth label everything. And also, we wanted to see if we could maybe exploit, inspire to find solutions that could exploit existing models at the image level. So that's why we designed this the way we did. So basically, it's a weekly supervised um, multi-label classification task. So we assembled a train set that was slightly more balanced than the reality, but a lot of participants chose to use the entire uh, Protein Atlas data set as well. And of course, we have labels at the image level here. And then we assembled a hidden test set. So the participants could never see this test set where we had labeled 40,000 cells manually. So here we chose images where we know that we have a lot of variability between the different cells. And then here we actually generated the single cell ground truth data for 40,000 cells. So basically people had to optimize only versus the public leaderboard. So we had to be very sure that this was a well-designed competition and find out how to go from weak image level labels to precise single cell labels. And basically we wanted to inspire kind of, we could foresee two types of approaches. The top one being that people would actually segment and then build some kind of classifier or do some kind of parallel segmentation and activation map uh, approach. And in the end, we wanted people to submit segmentation masks and classification labels. And I should also say um, the evaluation metric was the mean average precision at an IOU threshold at 0 0.6. So we didn't want to penalize the segmentation too hard here. Um, and this is the winning model. And it's actually the same person that won this competition, that won the first competition, but with a completely different solution. And I should also say that this was a hard competition. Out of the top 10 ranking teams, we had 21 Kaggle Grandmasters participating. And a lot, a lot of the teams also had at least one person with domain knowledge. So it, it was a hard problem, but also a fun hard problem. Uh, but I think the key to success here was to really make sure that the model pays attention to every single cell in the image. Be because we saw that in the first competition that the models would usually just focus on one or two cells in the image and, and find the most discriminative features and base the classification on that. So here, for example, Bingo, the winner, developed this fair cell activation network to, to ensure that you pay attention to every cell. And I just want to show this. We've been talking a bit about uh, you know, features and what parts of images actually uh, influences the decisions. So we were quite happy when we used GradCam to map the winning model. You could see that it's really paying attention to the right regions of these cells, even though it's mixed patterns. So when it's classifying mitochondria, it's looking at the correct regions of the cell. And when it's classifying nucleus, it's looking in the nucleus, but also for overlapping patterns. It's looking here for the nuclear body classification. and. and on the rest of the nuclei for the nuclear classification. So this even gave us some hope about maybe some point in the future we'll be able to also segment and unmix, unmix these patterns and actually quantify how much of the protein is in the nuclear body and how much of the protein is in the nucleus, for example. But of course, these models can also use, be used as feature extractors, basically. So this is the model from the first competition, the image level model. So when we use that model to uh, well, the penultimate layer to extract features, and then we reduce the dimensions and plot it here in a UMAP. This is all images in the cell atlas of the protein atlas. So this is 13,000 proteins in a variety of different cell lines. Of course, the model was trained to distinguish between all of these different organelles, and we can see that it does so. But there's a few things here that made us very, very happy at this point. So um, let's think. First, you can see that there's, this is actually the cytosolic cloud, and this is the nuclear cloud. And if you think of it, a nuclear puncta and a cytosolic puncta, they, they look very similar, right? But the difference is where they are in the cell. So again, it's the context. 
So it, apparently, cytosolic puncta will be here, nuclear puncta will be here. So this model does not only recognize the pattern, but it puts it, puts it in the context of the cell. So basically, it's embedding the pattern and the distribution of the protein in, in the entire cell uh, area. Uh, another interesting thing is that the multilocalizing protein, like D here, D, it's a protein that is in the nucleus, cytoplasm, and plasma membrane. So they also seem to be managed well, and they end up right between the pure, pure clusters. So here we were thinking like, wow, maybe we're at the point that we can actually, for real, start to talk about integrating image and uh, other types of omics data. And I'll get back to that. Uh, I just want to say, do, do, we've done the same thing with the single cell model. Of course, the, the UMAP becomes massive because we have a lot of single cells. So here I'm just showing you a, a few. It, it, it looks even better, uh, first of all. But here I'm just showing you this one, for example. We can see that some organelles are more similar. Other organelles, like vesicles and cytosolic pancta, we see great heterogeneity there. So we think that it's, it's really exciting to be able to work with these models to try to figure out the heterogeneity among different patterns, maybe be able to identify phase-separated structures and, and so on in the cells. And if you want to learn more about this, you can also talk to Trang, who's here at the meeting uh, as well, first author of this paper that was just published two weeks ago. And in the final part of my talk, I want to focus a bit on how we can model the multi-scale architecture of cells using this kind of image information. And when I say multi-scale model. So in my world, we're mainly talking about proteins here, but of course there are other molecules, but for now we're focusing on proteins. And we're measuring the protein distribution up here at the organelle cell level. We're limited by diffraction, so we don't have, we can't really see individual proteins or anything like that, but most of the cellular actions happens at the kind of protein-protein interaction uh, level, right? So we were thinking, how can we understand cell function if we're only working with data up here? Maybe if we integrate our data with, for example, protein-protein interaction data measured in bulk, but still protein-protein interaction data, we can build a multi-scale representation of the cell. So for this work, we teamed up with Professor Trey Eidecker at UCSD and decided to, to pursue this. So we found a data set of 700 proteins where we had matching protein-protein interaction data and image data in hex cells. No biological question in particular driving this, so it was a technology, <laughs> technology project with the data set that we had. So basically we used two different machine learning models, our model and a node to vec model to embed the data. We could concatenate it, so basically we have vectors that describe the spatial distribution of the protein, the global distribution from images and the local distribution from the protein-protein interaction data. And then we can use those vectors and measure pairwise distances and also calibrate it to physical distances in nanometer, which is kind of rarely seen in protein protection field. And with these distances, we can build this kind of typical cell hierarchy that is, is kind of signature of Trey Eidecker's uh, work. So just to get into uh, some of the details here, of course, we can first check that the kind of distances, pairwise distances within each data set is en enriched for similar distances in the other data set. So that's a sanity check that worked out. And for the calibration, we actually thought of very fancy ways to do this. And then we realized that what if we just look at the number of protein components versus size in literature? It's a pretty nice uh, correlation between <laughs> this is the actual diameter and this is the number of distinct proteins. So basically, we just said, OK, let's just calibrate against this. And we, we made this little uh, supervised machine learning model that predicts, basically, the distance between two of these vectors. And in this plot, you can see where we use different complexes to validate this, that it actually performs pretty well. It's not perfect, but at least it gives us some idea of the size of the complex that we're predicting. And for the building the cellular hierarchy, we start to identify the most tight, the most similar pairs, really tight interactions, and then we gradually relax the, the, the criteria and, and the stringency, and we, we find larger and larger complexes as we go up. So basically, this is the resulting map that we end up with. We call it music. Uh, I know you cannot read the text. This is the cell, this is the cytoplasm, this is the nucleus, nuclear lumen, nucleolus, and then it kind of goes down. And at the bottom here, you have the U1, SN, RNP complex. You have small complexes, organelles at the top. So you can think of it as the gene ontology CC, cell component part. But instead of being man-made, this is data-driven. And all of the purple nodes here are nodes that we cannot find in gene ontology or in literature. So for this paper, most of the time we're spent on validating these new systems. And so we did. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but we could 
suggest new systems, we could validate their function, we could also assign function to previously unknown proteins. So we think that this type of modeling is, is great because it captures the pleiotropic effects of multi-localizing proteins and gives some kind of spatial dimension and distance dimension to protein-protein interactions. We're quite excited about extending this to an entire cell and start to build dynamics into this as well. But if in my opinion, this mu the music model is great, but we lose, still lose a lot of the information that we have in the images, right? About shape and things like that, <laughs> morphology, phenotypes of the cells. So ideally, um, we, we have millions of images that show the distribution of different proteins and the heterogeneity of, of these proteins. Ideally, we would just want to group them all. And one way of doing that would be to try to map it all to some kind of reference shape space. And I'm actually just going to leave you with that thought because I know that Susan will provide a brilliant <laughs> presentation on how they did it. So this is actually a collaboration with Susan and Matthias here at the Allen Institute. And we're very inspired by this work. And we hope to be able to map the entire proteome to a shape space and start to attribute, for example. We know that cell cycle proteins will be enriched in round cells. Maybe we can find proteins that are involved in migration in elongated cells and so on. So we, this is an interesting domain for data integration. But of course, ultimately, we would not only want to map things onto a shape space. We would want to just make a super multiplexed image or a, a digital cell model that we can use to predict. If I perturb this protein, what would happen to the spatial location of the other proteins, for example? And here, we've been thinking a lot about what's the advantage and disadvantage of the data set that we have. There's many disadvantages. We don't have time lapse data. We don't have super nice 3D data. But we do have all proteins, and we do have a lot of images that have been acquired in a very systematic way. So what can we do with things like that? So we've been inspired by, of course, the generative image uh, <laughs> field. For example, this is StyleGAN, where you can generate different faces, and you can tune them, like add glasses, change the hair, things like that. We were thinking maybe we can do something similar and generate uh, a cell image and, and tune it, add a Golgi apparatus and so on. And then, of course, this field is moving so quickly with Dolly and other text, uh, text to image synthesis methods. We can even think about extending this to you know, inputting amino acid sequence, out output an image. And here, also, it's nice that these new models are working with styles. This is a style called Art Station, both of these images. So we're thinking about generating images, protein atlas style, of course. So this is also ongoing work, but as you can see, we can generate at least photorealistic synthetic images of cells. So these are real images. These are fake or synthetic images. We can tune it to generate images of different cell lines and so on. And this is very much ongoing work, so uh, we're having fun. <laughs> Surely we won't be able to reach the entire way. It will fail somewhere, but I'm pretty sure that we'll be able to succeed in some parts of given the, th the three reference markers that we have as an input. And then, of course, we can add more data as conditions to this. Again, protein-protein interactions informs on local distribution. We have, of course, many other interesting databases that also informs on protein structure and relates to the cell. So this is made by Wei Ouyang, uh, starting his own lab soon. Uh, he's also here at the meeting. So we're dreaming about uh, a digital cell. And if you want to talk more about that, you can talk to Ishan, who's here at the meeting, and also Wei. They're both sitting right here. And before I end, I also want to shout out to a work that Wei has also pioneered, and it's the making of a bioimage model zoo. And this has been a collaboration with many different partners, key people being Anna Krasuk and Florian Jug. And this, is, this bioimage model zoo is basically meant to be a model zoo where we can share machine learning models for microscopy images. So you can share pre-trained models, you can connect it to data sets. You should, at some point, even be able to run inference in the browser and try out different models and so on. It's a work in progress. It's a grassroots effort. Uh, so please contribute to it if you feel like you're, you, you want to do so. There's a preprint available. And also talk to Wei if you want to hear more about it. And with that, I'm coming to the end of my talk. And uh, I'd like to end with a little outlook and vision. So of course, we're mapping proteomes of dynamic subcellular structures like cilia and micronuclei. And we're still interested in using highly multiplexed imaging to understand these very dynamic cell states, such as metabolic cell states and, and proliferative cell states. 
and we're working with generative cell model to go cell modeling to go towards this integrated spatial temporal proteome model of a cell. Maybe we'll get there in, in five years or something that someone said. And we'll continue to promote open science. I'm a true believer in that. So everything we'll do, we do will be open, openly available and shared with all of you. And it's great to be here. And I want to thank my group. This photo is from Sweden. And now many of them are coming with me as I move to Stanford. So I really appreciate that. It's a great group to work with. And also thank collaborators and particularly the people here at Allen today. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lundberg. I hope it's not too cheesy to say that was music to my ears. <laughs> um, we have time for a few questions. Uh, so please raise your hands. We've got one all the way in the back. Starting off, we'll have mic runners run up to you and, and hand you the microphone um, so that everyone can hear the excellent questions. So put your hand back in the air so they can find you. Yeah, there we are. Thank you very much for the great talk. Uh, I have two questions about your uh, temporal partitioning of metabolic reactions to avoid crosstalk. Is your lab defining and measuring crosstalk through a project or rely on prior information in the literature? Yeah, that's a very good question. So we're, we're not measuring. That was our hypothesis, that this is temporal partitioning, because we're mainly seeing temporal partitioning in the large organelles. Mm -hmm. So we're thinking that maybe the cell exploits that dimension when it cannot do the precise um, spatial parti partitioning. But we still have to verify that hypothesis. And then uh, are you using an automated system? Because it's kind of a daunting task to separate to these crosstalks. Yes, so we're at least for the imaging pipeline it's fully automated. We can do about let's say 500 immunostainings a week from sample preparation to image analysis. That's about our, our throughput. But uh, the, the live cell imaging that we want to do we still have to think about it to do well. But we definitely need to automate it before we can, can go there. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I see another question in the back. The hand raised. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, great talk. Uh, I'm curious with the, the multiplexed imaging that you're moving into, uh, what kinds of representations of those data are you feeding into your models that sort of properly maintain the, the sort of layer-layer relationships? Yes, that's a very, very good question. And so far, I would say that you'll hear more about this in the next talk as well. Most of the applications of highly multiplex imaging so far has been on using markers for different cell types. So basically, it's a very simple task. You segment the cells and you identify the cell type type and then you, you look at how they're arranged together. We, and also the next speaker, has been looking more at, at having many intracellular markers and actually identifying the, the phenotype of the cell. And there we're still struggling because it's, it's a 2D section. The cells look very different. We're thinking about shape space quite a lot. So we're working hard to get a very accurate segmentation. And that's where we are right now. But I think this field is also moving forward very quickly and we don't really know how to do it but I'm pretty sure we need multi-scale models that would be my my kind of gut, gut <laughs> sense there because we really want to look at fine subcellular details but also want to look at, at where this cell is and the state in the context of not just the surrounding cells but also if, if you think about like oxygen and other things they can like diffuse oxygen can diffuse for long way in tissues right so you need to also catch those long range interactions if you will but uh, yeah so, Sorry, not really answering your question, but I think that's where we are. <laughs> Thank you. We have time for one more question. I see it right here on the edge. Thank you so much. I also have a question about the highly variable proteins that you were kind of speculating about. Um, this is one of those cases where maybe you're the wrong speaker to ask this about, but I really think that there's so much more data in time resolved images, you know, and I just curious if you think that the only way to get to that is by imaging these things live and watching them come up and down, or if you think you have a way of getting out the same information without time-lapse data? Yeah, that's a very good question. So I think there's, uh, of course, time-lapse data would be amazing, but it, what, what can we do without that? So shape, shape is one space that we could think about. It's a continuum, at least, and, and if we can map this to, to the shape space, maybe we can get some, it, maybe we won't get the linear time, but at least we get some sense of time. So I, I have some hope on the, on the shape space there. Besides that, we're also quite interested in doing live cell imaging with endpoint rich measurements, right? So for example, phase contrast, you know, label free imaging, 
to study the cell and then do some kind of rich readout, spatial proteomics, spatial transcriptomics, and then try to infer as much of the dynamics as possible from that by building label-free models like we've seen earlier today. So I think we'll see quite a lot of developments in that, those kind of integrations as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lundberg, so much. Let's give her one more round of applause. Thank you. And like for all of our speakers, um, you can come find them in our kind of more social time periods after the talks if you have other questions. Um, but it's my distinct pleasure to move on and introduce Dr. Pelkmans, our next speaker. Um, so Dr. Pelkmans is the Ernst Hadorn, Hadorn? Hadorn. Hadorn Endowed Chair at the Department of Molecular Life Sciences at the University of Zurich. In 2015, he was elected member of the European Molecular Biology Organization and is an inventor on several patents in image-based systems biology and is co-founder of 3V Biosciences and Apricot Therapeutics. Uh, his talk today is titled Multimodal Perception Links Cellular State to Decision-Making in Single Cells. Thank you so much, Dr. Pelkmans, for being here. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I don't know if my mic is working. Yeah, it's working. Great. All right, so um, let's get going. Um, so this is Zurich. Uh, we like to ski up there, and then we like to swim there, and we sort of have drinks and parties up there. Uh, so you should all come to Zurich. It's, it's a great city. Um, now, obviously, I think, I think a lot of the talks you heard about today are about you know, technology, extracting data out of images, what do they represent, what do they mean, how can we use those data. What I'm going to talk about is, is using those technologies as well, but really with the question, how will cells right, actually interpret this information? Right? I mean, we and our computers do that, but in the end, it's molecules in cells that sense, that capture information, need to transfer it, and decisions must be made by cells. And of course, in the end, in biology, it's all about how the cells do it, right? Uh, and and we use these technologies to try to understand better how biological systems do that. So I go back a little bit and go to work that is now really old. Um, but this is when you know, I just started my lab and we started to apply computer vision, feature extraction, um, to you know, basically apply this in high throughput single cell imaging. And you know, we started to do this. Back in those days, we had cell-based assays. We imaged lots of single cells. Um, we used computer vision and machine learning to extract features. And we did here a pretty simple approach. We basically asked, can we sort of learn a model using simple statistics, multilinear regression, right, that tries to learn a certain cell fate of an individual cell, let's say being infected by a virus. Back, that was in that study, the fate we were studying. And can we sort of predict that or learn a model that can describe that as a function of multiple properties of cells, being the shape of cells, morphology, cell size, apoptotic state, uh, cell cycle stage, et cetera. And then we would take those regression coefficients and apply it to a completely unseen set of cells, right? So here you see a model where we learned the probability of a cell to become infected by a certain virus, SV40, not a very exciting virus from that point of view. It's not COVID or, or something like that, but it is, it is a virus that infects human cells. And you can see, right, that we can predict a certain pattern where cells get infected and other cells not. And we then compare that to the actual measured infection pattern. And as you can see, I mean, if you look at this long enough, you'll see some differences. But we actually got very accurate, very precise in being able to predict which single cells will get infected by the virus. Now, back then, right, this is, what is it, 13, 14 years ago, um, we really did not ha expect that, right? We really thought that the variability or the heterogeneity in, in virus infection would be pretty much random, right? These are genetically identical cells grown in culture, and you would have expected that, well, if 10% of your cells get infected, those 10% would be random, right? But it is not the case, certainly not for this virus. It can be predicted by the cellular state, by properties that of the cellular state. For instance, their size, their shape, or certain properties they have, which of course reflects, now, now we know this better, certain pathways that may be active in some cells and not in other cells that make these cells more susceptible uh, to virus infection. Okay, so thinking about this a little bit, right, um, we, we, we often think about, you know, when we, when we think about biological systems, we of course think bottom up, right, we have some micro scale things that generate some mesoscale thing and then you get a macro scale. Uh, property, right, thinking about proteins and organelles and single cells, for instance. But what I showed you before 
tells us that the context, right, going down the scales, right, so from a macro scale to a meso scale or from a meso scale to a micro scale, is also very relevant for understanding or thinking about how, for instance, heterogeneity and in gene expression arises or cellular activities arises. You need that context. And of course, this applies across multiple spatial scales. It can be the multicellular context, it can be the subcellular context. All of that is super important in our opinion to quantify. And this is a bit of a theoretical uh, slide here, but I think it is, or, or conceptual, but I think this is what makes actually cellular systems robust to lower scale fluctuations, yet responsive to higher scale changes. Right, if you have many sort of micro scale components that generate something at the meso scales, you have many proteins that make an organelle, then having a fluctuation in one or two proteins will not make your organelle, with perhaps a few exceptions, but will not make your organelle function uh, wrongly or differently. While if you change something at a macro scale, let's say the context of an individual cell, or the subcellular environment of your protein, you may actually change a lot of the effects. And I think biological systems are very much uh, characterized by that property, right? Being robust at the same time, but also being responsive and adaptive to, to environmental changes. Okay, so obviously, right, if we uh, think then about, okay, how can we look at that, right? How can we actually cross those scales? We need, well, scale crossing technologies. And I think Emma pointed that out very nicely as well. We need to, of course, cross multiple spatial scales. We may eventually have to cross temporal scales. And of course, we need to also cross scales in terms of, of genomes and physics, right? Multimodal, multiplex types of data sets. I see that the slides are not beautifully laid out anymore. This was a keynote uh, uh, file, and I think it has been transformed into PowerPoint, which is really bad. But anyway, uh, <laughs> just to say that. Anyway, um, going on. So, of course, in my lab, we are also trying to develop such technology. So I just give you a little bit of a movie of a paper we published in 2018, where we developed this technology called 4i, which stands for Iterative Indirect Immunofluorescence Imaging. And basically, you know, you can now have large populations of cells, but then for each of those cells, and this is just a zoom in of a few of those cells, we can get highly multiplexed immunostainings, and then one can use those multi-channel images now to, you know, do some computational approaches. For instance, here we learn single pixel profiles using machine learning to then classify single pixels into pixel classes, which we term MCUs here, and then the final sort of uh, uh, output of that is we predict those class, or we, sorry, we overlay those classes on individual cells, and then you can see your single cells now subcellularly organized using the multiplexed information from all those uh, stains. Okay, and so uh, this technology was taken up by a PhD student in my lab, Bernhard Kramer, who said, well, can I actually use this to ask a pretty fundamental question in biology? And that is how do individual cells process large amounts of information uh, in a contextual manner? And to point out sort of the key problem in the field or the, 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 the key sort of question that there is, we of course all know from lots of work over many years how cells process information, right? Signaling, cell signaling, signal processing. And we know that these pathways are active and become activated by exposing cells to growth factor. And if we add more growth factor, we typically get more activation of these pathways. But if you take a single signaling node in such a network, and you look at sort of across single cells, the levels of phosphorylated MAC, for instance, as you increase the amount of growth factor, you'll see that indeed very nicely, the population shifts, it moves, it increases. But if you take a point here, due to these overlapping distributions, based on a certain specific level of phosphorylated MAC, it's hard to say, that single cell is exposed to this amount of growth factor and that single cell is exposed to another amount of growth factor, given these highly overlapping distributions. So this has, over quite a few years, been sort of a, a dogma in the field in suggesting that this reflects uncertainty. And on the basis of that, many people have postulated that cells are not very reliable information processing devices, if we want to call it like that. Um, however, given you know, what I just told you, thinking about context and making it, you know, pointing out the important thing that we need to in interpret whatever we read out in single cells within the context of the cellular state or the microenvironment, things like that. Maybe this doesn't reflect uncertainty, right? Maybe it actually reflects a contextual response to the multi-scale cellular state. And if we would know that, if we would quantify that within these same types of data sets, 
we may all of a sudden appreciate that this variation is not uncertainty, but is actually additional information, if you wish, right, that informs us on the state a cell is in. That was basically the underlying sort of thought that, that Bernie had, and that's what he set out to look at. And maybe just to give a very visual interpretation or, or, or feeling of that this, this idea may not be wrong, I like to show sort of this sort of image. So when you do multiplexing of a set of markers in single cells, and I chose here three markers that are reflect, reflecting properties of the cellular state, two organelles and a mechanical state marker, and I show you here three markers of signaling responses. And you look at cells before stimulation with EGF. These have been starved, so typically these stains should be completely off. This is what you see, right? So you see your heterogeneities in cellular states. You can see that very nicely. There's no signaling active. Now we add EGF to cells, and now, of course, you get these signaling uh, nodes becoming activated, so you see them. But now you see that there's this heterogeneity. But now you may actually realize that, wait a minute, this heterogeneity may very much reflect or be determined by this heterogeneity. And why do I say be determined? Because this type of heterogeneity was there before adding growth factor, right? And this is just five minutes. So within five minutes, you cannot change the cellular state. So if this is highly correlated with each other, you can postulate that very likely this heterogeneity is determined by pre-existing heterogeneity in the cellular state. So that's what basically Bernie set out to look at. He used 4i. He then looked at multiplexed in the same cells 10 signaling response markers to EGF and also 20 cellular state markers to cover different properties of cells, typical markers that we are very familiar with. Then he took those sort of cellular state markers and extracted in total 650 features from multiple spatial scales. And then he used those features to project or to basically create what we call a cellular state landscape. And this is just a 2D projection using UMAP, uh, but this sort of shows you how these single cells typically distribute in such a map. And I want to point out, and this is very important before I move on, when you look at cells not exposed to EGF or up to 100 nanograms per ml of EGF, they mix very nicely within this landscape. So the cellular state landscape is there pre-existing before adding any EGF, and it stays the same during this pulse of five minutes of EGF. Okay, now once you have that, you can of course look at individual features that we extracted just to show you how this is shaped by different properties of the cellular state. DAPI is of course a strong one because it really reflects G1 and G2 of the cell cycle. But then you have other properties like organelle abundances but also certain textures that contribute to the overall shape of the cellular state landscape. Good, now once you have the cellular state landscape, which is of course built only on cellular state markers, right, that do not respond to EGF in these five minutes, we now overlaid the typical response markers of signaling nodes. And, well, nicely what you can see, these markers actually show specific patterns on the cellular state landscape. So if this heterogeneity or this variation in signaling responses would be random, you wouldn't have expected any specific pattern but it's actually very nicely shaped. So you can do the same trick as what I showed you before. You can now take your signaling response markers, build a multilinear regression model. You can do more advanced modeling here, by the way. Uh, it doesn't really improve the prediction accuracy, so we typically like to stick to the simplest one. So we learn a model that learns, you know, my levels of phosphoric as a function of the, the, the size of a cell, its abundance of endosomes in the cell, other types of cellular properties. Then we apply it to another data set and we ask how, how well can we predict levels of phosphorylated ERK in single cells uh, compared to what we would measure in these single cells. And as you can already see here, this is actually very accurate. And when you then also overlay these signaling response markers on the predicted ones on these landscapes, you also see that these models are very accurately predicting signaling responses in single cells. You can also do this uh, comparison at the single cell level in, on images, right? These are measured levels of phosphoric now in segmented cells, quantified levels. Here are the predicted levels, basically indistinguishable from each other. So, conclusion, the heterogeneity of signaling responses between individual cells, right, uh, does not reflect uncertainty in our opinion, right, uh, but adaptations to the physical chemical state uh, of a cell. So that means that signaling responses are contextual to cellular state. 
by itself, this is not a surprise, I think, in biology. Cell biologists would have, would have told you that in any case, but it is, I think, very nice that we can now quantify this and actually see this and, and, and realize that it is therefore a very predictable uh, a heterogeneous response. Important point, developmental biologists like or, or find this very important. If we ask variation that is induced by settler state for these signaling nodes, and we compare that amount to variation induced by changes in EGF concentration, then if we you know, change between, let's say, uh, 0 to 6.25 nanogram or 10 to 25 nanogram, so it's quite a change, right? So for, for biological context, this is already quite a, diff quite a change in EGF concentration. The variation induced by, vari by cellular state is larger. So in other words, the variation between single cells and how they respond to EGF, right? is more strongly influenced by the state they're in than by the concentration of EGF they are sensing. Only when you do very large differences in concentration, you start to have variations that are equal or perhaps even slightly larger than by what cellular state induces. You also see that in this plot here. So generally, right, if you see differences in responses to growth factor, that is more determined by the state the cell is in than by the concentration of EGF they are sensing, which I think it's quite an important uh, observation. Okay, I will not show you this results, but what we could then see is that taking this into account, right, taking now into account that this variation is induced by cellular state, we can actually realize that signaling nodes collectively can almost perfectly decode five different concentrations of EGF. So that uncertainty that I showed about previously is not uncertainty, it's context, context right? And if we therefore take this into account when asking can cells decode concentrations of EGF, they can actually do that to a very high level. Okay, now, uh, moving on. If cells have signaling networks to measure the concentrations of EGF, maybe they also, and perhaps even primarily, have these signaling networks in place to measure the state they're in, right? Because that is information that is a part of this response. So let me go through this very quickly. We can think of that in the following ways. Let's say you have three states, and you have two responses. And all these states activate both of these responses. Well, then basically we would say we don't, either individually or together, A and B do not distinguish between states. And response A and B therefore contain what we would call totally redundant information about states. Right? We can also think of a partially redundant setup where response A responds to state one and two, and B only to two and three. In that sense, as a multimodal response, A and B can distinguish between all three states. Because if A is only active, it must be state one. If B is only active, it must be state three. And if A and B are active, it must be state two. Right? So this, in this setup, you see we, we say they have partially non-redundant information about states. And so we ask, do we actually see this in our data? Right? Is this something that would actually hold up in cells? So to look at that, we we already got a big hint from these regression coefficients that we use to learn these models to predict signaling activities in cells. Because these, these regression coefficients, they show that different properties of the cellular state are important to predict signaling nodes, right? It already tells you that phosphoerc will not have fully redundant information that as compared to phosphor-RSK because there are different cellular state markers that are important to predict them. So can we sort of look at that using a more, more formal method? And so I just show you this, how, how we did this here for phospho-ERC versus, versus phospho-MTOR, two key signaling nodes, right? So when we look at those levels of phospho -ERC and phospho-MTOR, and at the single cell level, you see that they nicely correlate, right? I hope you can see that. But if we overlay on these same single cells the abundance of SEC13, a marker of uh, the secretory pathway, or HSP60, a marker of, uh, of uh, mitochondria, I hope you can see already with your eye that here the color from red to blue varies mainly along the y-axis. While here the color from red to blue varies mainly along the x-axis. I hope you can see that, right? This looks like a Dutch flag and this like a French flag if you, <laughs> if you wanna compare it like that. So that's what that means is that even though these guys correlate with each other, it seems that phosphoric has non-redundant information about the abundance of this organelle well, in this case, phosphor mTOR has it about this organelle. So in a partial analysis, you can actually quantify this and that you can see nicely, here phosphor scales with SEC13, partial to mTOR, 
while mTOR doesn't do that partial to ERC. Right, and here it's, it's the inverse. Just to show you this as an example, this is now real data, that this is clearly seems to be the case, right, that phosphoric and phosphor mTOR, even though they correlate, they also have non-redundant information about certain cellular state properties. You can quantify that using um, tools from information theory, which basically shows very similar things. And of course, you can look at these, no, these non-redundant types of information, and these actually reveal very interesting biology, which I have to skip over because of time, but certainly interesting to, to dive into. Now, what this now means is that we can now ask the question, if these signaling nodes have this, right, this non-redundant information, then maybe collectively they actually can cover a large fraction of the cellular state landscape. And that's sort of quantified here. So how we do that is we ask a single cell, what are its direct neighbors in cellular state space? And then we ask, okay, what are the direct neighbors of a single cell in signaling space? And we increase the dimensionality of the signaling space by adding more of the signaling markers that we have in the data set, right? And so when we ask that for, let's say, for using just one signaling node, phosphoerc, it can map a little bit of the, sig of the cellular state space, but not a lot. If we add mTOR, or sorry, we look only at mTOR, it has these regions mapped by itself, but not really a lot as well. But together, they start to synergize. And if we take all signaling nodes, we actually now almost perfectly map the cellular state space. So collectively, as a multimodal percept, they actually, due to this non partially non-redundant information, they can very nicely map the position a cell has in the in cellular state space. Okay? So this is all nice and good, right? I'm also at the end of the time I have for my talk, so I have to go through this very quickly. Sorry, I'm probably a bit slow, but... Um, uh, of course, the, the big question is, do cells use this to make cellular decisions, right? Because this is now all statistics and analysis. We just can show that cells could do it, but are they actually doing it, right? So, we use a, a system here that is classical one in the field, which is basically re-entering the cell cycle after growth factor starvation and adding back EGF, for instance. And that is very nice marker, phosphorylated retinoblastoma protein. If your cells have that, they will re-enter the cell cycle. So you see that as we add more amounts of EGF to cells, you see that more cells re-enter the cell cycle, but it's kind of heterogeneous. And it sort of is, some cells, this is a cellular state space map again, some cells will always be uh, proliferative, many are then not, but then when we add uh, EGF, you see that these come up, and these here, and then with 100 nanogram, you see that more come up. So can we predict this accurately? Well, if we use the cellular state, information, right? So where the cells are sitting in the cellular state space, we can predict this very accurately. So that's nice. But of course, cells need to measure the cellular state by using signaling nodes, right? So, the, so then, okay, do they then map this by using information of signaling nodes? So if we take only information of phosphoric, it doesn't work very well, as you can see. If we use only phosphoAKT, it doesn't work very well. But again, if we add, the, use the multimodal percept, Actually, we can really show that this now very nicely tells cells, okay, these will go, re will re-enter the cell cycle, and it very nicely ma ma matches what we have measured. And here you see sort of the quantification of that. You can then do perturbations. I'll go to this very quickly. I'm sorry for that. Uh, it's, it's recently published, so you can go to that. But what I think is very nice to point out is that when you know your cell position in state space, and you can predict, use that to predict that it will, this cell will end up being phosphor-RB positive and this cell will be, end up being phosphor-RB phosphor negative. And we now use perturbations. These are typical drugs that inhibit typical kinases like MEK inhibitors or AKT inhibitors. And we can push cells in signaling space, move them around. We don't alter the state space, right? We control for that. You would then lose your predictability because if we push a cell that is this state that should be here, that should be phosphor RB negative, to now become phosphor RB positive, or the other way around, then those predictions shouldn't work. And indeed, that's what you see. So when we start inhibiting signaling nodes, we start, and particular combinations, we start to be very poorly able to predict anymore the decision cells would make. If we use the signaling space, though, so if we know that this green cells was now altered to sit here, then we can still predict accurately this decision, as it, as it should if this is used to make decisions. That's also what you can see. 
So with that, I will skip over this. You can then look at individual classes that give some very interesting dynamics or di differences between cellular state classes, et cetera. Um, basically come to the summary. So what I wanted to point out is that including multiple cellular state markers when measuring signaling responses, right, shows that signaling heterogeneity contains additional information. Uh, the concept of contextual information processing multimodal perception uh, we believe also applies to information processing by molecular networks inside single cells. And why do I say that? Because these concepts come from neuroscience, right, where it's very well established, of course, neural networks in our brain. So I think we can extend that to molecular networks in cells. Um, uh, and I think also point out is that this framework reveals predictive rules that link the physical chemical state of individual cells to decision making and how this affects also responses to drugs, which is something we are now very much interested in. And with that, I will finish. This was a very recent picture of the lab on a lab retreat in Crete. Uh, funding, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Pelkmans. Um, you, your talk was wonderful, stimulated, I'm sure, many questions, but unfortunately, we don't have time to take them right now. So please find him afterwards to ask your questions. But let's give him another round of applause. Our final speaker of this session for the time being is Dr. Susan Rafelski. Um, Dr. Rafelski is the Deputy Director, here you are, here at the Allen Institute whoa, there we go, for Cell Science. Prior to joining the Allen Institute in 2016, uh, Dr. Rafelski was an assistant professor in the Department of Developmental and Cell Biology, the Department of Biomedical Engineering, and the Center for Complex Biological Systems at UC Irvine. As deputy director, Dr. Rafelski oversees scientific programs which aim to integrate cell organization, behavior, and identity in human-induced pluripotent stem cells to understand how cells organize themselves and change. Take it away, Dr. Rafelski. Thanks, Gideon. And I was going to start by saying who I was, but I guess I don't have to do that. Um, so I wanted to say that it's just so lovely to see all of you here. And I've been having a fabulous day, and I hope all of you have too. I want to tell you about um, our data analysis framework for integrated intercellular organization and its variation and how we use it in human iPS cells. So first, I want to start by a big thank you to the team um, over the years, because what I'm going to show you today is truly um, due to extensive contributions by everyone who's been at the Institute from its very beginning. So our scientific mission at the largest scale is that we want to understand how cells organize themselves and change. And we believe that the key to understanding, cell uh, to understanding cells is to understand the interplay between how cells are organized, how they behave, and their molecular identity, and how those interplay in time. And, and I think you saw this earlier, so from Asaf's talk all the way to here, we believe that if we understand this, we should be able to look at a cell, know what it is doing, but also what it did and what it will do. Am I too loud? Or too that we need lots and lots of images to do this because, of course, if you want to know what a cell's organization is or its behavior, you have to be able to look at it. But then how do we go from there? Okay. There we go. <laughs> cells have to coordinate all of their intercellular processes over four orders of magnitude in space and time um, in order to generate the cell-level behaviors that you see. And we focus in on uh, the intermediate level of intercellular structures and organelles so that we can still maintain a global view of the cell and try to make what we see a bit more humanly interpretable than if we were dealing with the thousands and thousands and thousands of proteins that Emma deals with all the time. Um, and so instead, we can think about, uh, think about how to create methods to humanly interpret and think through the organization of, say, 30 to 50 structures. We also, uh, as I said, want to take a holistic approach and consider all parts of the cell. And we want to really invest in normal. So uh, we want to look at cells in 3D doing their thing in time 
And sometimes those strategic decisions to do that uh, have made us, for example, choose human stem cells um, instead of cell tissue culture cells so that we could invest in normal or really focus in on 3D and time, which makes some of what we need to do a little bit harder than if we were looking at fixed cells in 2D, which means that we've had to generate a lot of tooling to do this, and that's really paying off now. We know that we won't understand the cell fully without integrating this type of knowledge with other data types, such as expression signatures, protein states, and comatin organization. And we know that as we look at our 3D images of ourselves, that we're really faced with a grand challenge, one that is conceptually more difficult than simple data types such as sequences or gene expression data. And that is that we have to deal with uh, creating and understanding and measuring uh, ways to compare shapes and positions of intercellular structures in 3D and in time. Um, and we have to do so in a comprehensible and generalizable manner so that we all as a community can do this together. Basically, if we want to take cell organization and integrate it with these sorts of data types, then we need a framework for quantifying cell organization. We have a second part to our mission, which I have to lead up here, so <laughs> to develop and democratize tools so that we can work together um, to create new biology as a community. And we can achieve both parts of our mission and address this grand challenge by creating accessible new methods and tools that empower our science and also that of the community. So, Today I would like to tell you about the uh, analysis framework we've developed for integrated intercellular organization. A preliminary version of this is on BioArchive, um, and some of this is not yet published and in final stages of review. So if you define cell organization as how all of a cell's components are arranged within it, in our case, again, we're focusing on the components at the level of structures and organelles so we can work towards testable and interpretable rules of organization. If you want to be able to categorize and define organization and do so in a quantitative and precise manner, you have to start to measure these different aspects of organization, such as how many of a structure you have in the cell, what the shapes are, where they're located, how they interact, and how they change in time. And importantly, you can't just focus on the mean or the average of each of these aspects of organization, but you have to think about the variations. As you saw, you know, there's a huge amount of variation and sometimes it's very understandable, interpretable. And that is because a phenotype may not just be a change in the mean, but may instead be a change in that variation. So we did this formally for a subset of these aspects of organization, which I will tell you about to show you that integrated intracellular organization in human iPS cells is defined by distinct separable aspects representing the mean and variation of cellular structures. So we began by uh, generating our WTC11 HIPSC single cell image data set of over 200,000 individual cells in 3D at high resolution spanning 25 cellular structures. To do that, we had to overcome a bunch of challenges over the years. Uh, how to visualize structures in normal cells, which we did via endogenous tagging and CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing. Generating reproducible, scalable 3D live cell imaging via optimized pipelines and automated workflows. Conquering the challenge of segmenting accurately in 3D cells that are tightly packed in colonies with uh, image segmentation approaches as well also for all of our structures that we image. And then generating our data set. So here you can see a representative cell um, with the structure labeled for each of these 25 structures. These are human-induced pluripotent stem cells, which are naturally immortal and cure typically normal, and they grow in these epithelial-like colonies. Each of these clonal lines carries one GFP to label one and represent one cellular structure for each of these, which we did via um, inserting at the endogenous locus using CRISPR-Cas9 editing to make this as normal cells as possible. We did extensive quality control of each of these cell lines in the Allen cell collection uh, so that we could actually study normal cells. Then we also added some dyes so that we could get for every single um, cell also the cell boundary and the DNA or nucleus boundary. So with this data set in hand, we wanted to figure out how to address and approach all of the vast variation that we see. And even just our stem cells are very similar looking stem cells. And so we created two conceptual coordinate systems. One in which we map the shape of an individual cell with respect to the variation in the entire population via our three-dimensional cell and nuclear shape space. And the other where we now map the locations of intercellular structures within an individual cell via what we call the pillar, the parameterized intercellular location representation. So I'm gonna tell you about these two uh, conceptual frameworks first. 
So if you start with a cell segmentation and a nuclear segmentation, we first align these to the long axis of the cell in XY. We don't align the cells in Z because these are epithelial cells. They have an apical basal polarity. And then for those of you who were at the workshop yesterday, when Alex introduced you to um, spherical harmonic expansion, we use spherical harmonics to decompose cell and nuclear shape and use 289 coefficients for each of these to describe the shape. And we can use those then in a generative manner and reconstruct in 3D the shape of the cell based on those spherical harmonic coefficients. We then took those coefficients and we performed our principal component analysis. And we're considering here the first eight PCs or primary components, principal components, um, which are all orthogonal and here ranked by importance so that we could um, start thinking about uh, the variation, the sources of variation in these cell shapes. We can use these PCs and look through the eight-dimensional PC space and go anywhere in that eight-dimensional space here. For example, we go to, like, to the origin, and we can do an inverse PCA transform to get back spherical harmonic coefficients and get to the approximate uh, shape that is in that part of the shape space. Here I'm just showing you the 3D as well as three 2D views, since it's sometimes hard to see everything in 3D. This is a top view and this is a side view um, along the long axis of the cell. So this is the um, uh, cell and nuclear shape space for cells and interface for HIPSC data set, where we're looking at the shape along every single sort of bin region of this eight dimensional space, varying um, one dimension or shape mode at a time, which you can see here map very well to humanly interpretable sort of changes in shape. For example, shape mode two represents the volume, which represents the variation that cells experience as they go through the cell cycle. Shape mode one, represents local packing density within our epithelial-like colonies. A lot of these other shapes represent other ways that cell shape could change, whether they're tilted in Z or whether they're more bean-shaped or pear-shaped. And these are due to the fact that the cells are constrained by each other and pushing on each other constantly um, while they're by their neighbors while they're in the epithelial colonies. So with an idea of how cell shape varies in a way of mapping formally each cell to some location in that shape space, we now went inside the cell and we uh, thought about how to map the locations of structures within the cell. And here we took advantage of the spherical harmonics and actually interpolated the coefficients to go from the center of the nucleus to the boundary of the nucleus and then the boundary of the cell so that we could create these concentric shells of location along which we could figure out where structures were located. We can represent this in a matrix format where now we just take the sort of angular in 3D information of these concentric shells along the x-axis and the distance from the nuclear centroid on the y-axis. And so here's an example, for example, of nucleoli that are near the center of the nucleus or mitochondria that are in the cytoplasm, what these pillars look like. We are considering segmentation, so the presence or absence of a structure, but you could also consider doing that for the fluorescence intensities or mapping proteins. We can aggregate these. So in our shape space, we considered aggregating a set of cells that were close to the center of that shape space. We call it the eight-dimensional sphere in, um, in that eight dimensions. And if we take all the Golgi cells here, for example, and oh, there is some auto timing going on, and then average these, um, this is our average pillar. We can take that mean shape at that center and we can create the same mapping. And then we can create what we call morphed cells, either individuals or based on these average pillars. And this is basically a likelihood map in 3D of where the structure of the cell is. Um, the structure, that particular structure is in cells um, averaged around that particular part of shape space. So this is the average morphed cell for the Golgi. And here are average morphed cells for all 25 structures. The top is the top view, this is the side view, and that's all the 25 structures here. And what we can do now is we can computationally integrate them. So here you see a visualization of 17 of those structures brought together into one cell. So that is the average location of these 17 or 25 structures um, in the mean cell shape for cells and interface um, in human iPS cells, which is great. So now we have the individual cell structure and its average location. But because we did this computational integration, we can start thinking about pairs of structures. And so for each pair of structures, we can now get a measure of the average location similarity in their location by just doing a correlation of those two aggregated pillars and getting a correlation, uh, Pearson correlation value. We can do that for all structures versus all structures. 
And then we, in this case, also sorted them by hierarchical clustering and could see that um, naturally, in a data-driven way, the compartmentalization of the cell falls out as structure location similarity progresses from the inside of the cell outward. And with this sort of heat map in hand, we can now compare you know, structure similarities, so this sort of aspect of pairwise location organization in different conditions. So we've got the mean, but we really care about measuring and taking into account variation as well. And so we wanted to develop metrics in order to do that. So for an individual cellular structure, we're going to call this the location stereotypy. Amongst um, you know, many different cells, how stereotyped is the location of that structure? High stereotypy would mean that it is very often in the same location. Low stereotypy would mean it's more variable. But we can consider doing that also for pairs of structures, which we're going to call the location concordance. Same question, how variable is the similarity in the locations of those structures? So what we did is we took every single cell. Here, this is for the eight-dimensional sphere cells, so 35,000 cells, against every single other cell, taking the pillars and calculating the um, Pearson correlation, and then just you know, sorting them by their um, structure so they line up. And from this map, this matrix, we can generate the average correlation matrix, where we, for example, average um, the, the Pearson correlation values just for um, histones here. And then the diagonal of this matrix is the location stereotypy. That is the uh, similarity for every single cell versus every single other cell where that structure is um, tagged and how much variation there is on average. So those structures that have the highest location stereotypy are the boundary of the nucleus and the boundary of the cell because we define those. But those structures that have the next highest stereotypy are structures such as the nucleolus, while the structures that have lowest stereotypy are structures like the peroxisomes and endosomes. The off diagonal is all the structures versus one paired other structure. And that's the location concordance, which is analogous to the stereotypy, but takes pairs of structures into account now so that we can get measures of variation in the location of two, set, two structures at a time. Again, with this type of quantification, we can now look at how this type of organization changes. Here I'm showing the individual correlation matrices through shape mode one. And you can see the diagonals and the off-diagonal patterns are very robust. And here I'm showing you guys the um, average spatial interactions, so the average pairwise locations. And in this visualization, you're looking at um, the uh, two ends of the shape space so that you can compare in each case what the pattern is. And you can see that overall, the um, organization and the variation are very robust across the shape space. So with that, We've, I've introduced these sort of aspects of integrated intercellular organization that we can now measure and use and do statistical analysis on. And so we can now quantify differences between populations and create and analyze different heat maps and showed you that this is um, very robust across the shape space and interface cells. But what I haven't shown you is how to measure differences in the average location of an individual structure. You know, right here, I'll show you what that is. But if we now want to compare that into another condition, how do we do that? And so uh, we developed this by comparing cells at the edges of colonies with the rest of our cells in our collection, all still at interface. Because these cells lack cell-cell junctions at the periphery of the colony and are known to be different from cells that are not at the edge of the uh, colony. In order to look at these cells, we also align them differently. I'm trying to stay in the light, but also point. <laughs> um, and so we align them so that the positive x direction is always the outside of the colony as you look at the images that are coming up. So first, we can look at the average shape of all of our cells and the average shape of our edge cells, which you can see are more wedge-shaped wedge shaped in z, which we sort of expect from the images I showed you. But this immediately brings up the challenge, how do we compare cellular organization, or in this case, the average location of an individual structure in two cells that have such a different shape? How do we understand whether there is actually a location change or just a change because the cells change shape? And the solution is that we can take advantage of our very large data set of these other interface cells, and we create shape match data sets. So in the eight-dimensional shape space, we can consider our baseline data set to be the gray and the black, and our edge cells to be the red. And so we can identify the nearest neighbor to every edge cell that is a non-edge cell but has a similar shape, and in that way create these shape match data sets. If we take the shape matched non-edge cells with the edge cells and look at their average 
uh, shape, you can see it's almost identical to the edge cells. And if we look at the distributions along each of the shape modes, you can see that, the, um, that all cells in gray versus the edge cells in red are different from each other. But then when we use the shape matched edge cells, the black, they look very similar. So now we can just compare these. I'm running out of time. <laughs> now we can just compare these. And we can say here, for example, is the average map of where mitochondria are localized. Um, in non-edge cells or edge cells where the non-edge cells have the same shape and we can see that the mitochondria are polarized. But can we quantify that? The answer is yes. We can take those pillars, we do a PCA on them for computational reasons, and we then do a linear discriminant analysis to identify the axis of greatest difference in this multidimensional mapped intracellular space, which allows us now to create an axis that is really the location phenotype axis of difference. And what that looks like for mitochondria here, you can see this black line is actually the non-edge cell, and this is you know, where the average edge cell would be. You can see that the phenotype is one of polarization towards the edge of the colonies. And now we can quantify this for individual cells, look at them, sort them, and do anything else we'd like to do with them. Here, this is for six other structures that are um, major organelles or cytoskeleton. And here are the quantifications of the distributions. And basically, you can see that there's a general polarization of a lot of the major organelles and cytoskeletal structures to the outside edge of the colonies. And we can quantify those with this pillar LDA approach. So the thing that was actually really interesting is that for these edge cells, we saw that the single structure's average location is polarized and definitely changed. But when we then measured the pairwise interactions or their variation, there was no change. So basically, in these edge cells, there is a change in the average location, but not a change in any of the other wiring or variation that um, you know, goes along with this polarization. It's just a movement of those structures and not how they interact. When we looked at early mitosis, where we would expect to see a lot of dramatic organization, we did see that. We saw changes in average location, in pairwise interactions, and in variation to more or less of an extent and with different timing depending on the structures. And what that allowed us to do, in addition to confirming that our approaches work in developing statistical frameworks for those, is to then also think about how these different aspects of organization may interact with each other. So for example, in our particular applications, there was never an instance where we would have a change in pairwise locations or variations, even in an individual structure, without a change in the average location of that structure. Now that may be a general truth that may be related to how we do the analysis, or it may be something that as we and others apply this framework, we learn, you know, can be you know, an exception, and it's something to look into. We could also start understanding how, for example, the means and the variations of these different aspects of organization either change together or not, depending on the structure. Oops, did I have something else to say there? OK, so what we've got is an analysis framework um, that has a conceptual component, which is these two coordinate systems of mapping the cell shape and then mapping the locations inside cells of similar shapes so we can quantify them and compare them. And uh, this part is generalizable and extensible. That's a conceptual approach that we hope that you guys are inspired to think about. The experimental and algorithmic implementations of this framework are modular, and the choices depend on your specific application. So for example, protein distributions in 2D images, which Emma mentioned, might uh, require some different decisions, whether we use maybe you know, Fourier expansion instead of spherical harmonic expansion, or how we deal with intensities and changes in intensities if we are dealing with proteins. More complex cell shapes in 3D, such as neurons, may not be amenable to spherical harmonic expansion, and we may require different types of alignment depending on the particular biological question that we're looking at. So I've told you about a particular approach to addressing these aspects of organization in a formal manner. But now we actually are moving toward really doing the same for these other two important aspects, the shape of the structures and their dynamics and really trying to develop an analogous analysis framework and then, of course, bring them together for being able to analyze the mean and the variation of shape trajectories through time. And we're doing this starting with the nucleus, our most tractable structure for 3D analysis, and we'll continue to do that for other structures. And we uh, really consider this, this question of cellular morphogenesis. How do cells and cellular structures grow and change in the cell? And then, of course, change in response to changing of cell state. And we really look forward to sharing the updates of the development of that analysis framework and its applications um, to differentiation um, with you uh, at a future time. So with that, I would like to um, thank all of you. I'd like to thank our founder, Paul Allen, for his vision, encouragement, and support, and take any questions. Can you advance the slide? Yeah, sure you.
Thank you mu so much, Dr. Rafelski. I'm going to steal this in advance us one more so oh, I'm everyone sorry. can see. Oh, extra slides. No, that's, yeah, you don't want to go that's through that. That's not what we want. We'll go back to this great photo. Hopefully you all recognize this awesome photo on your badge. Came from Dr. Rafelski's talk. Um, we have time for one quick question. So if someone would like to ask Dr. Rafelski a question, we encourage you to do so now. No questions. I was that clear. Yeah, you, you did an amazing oh, job. There's one. One in the back, okay. In the back row. Thanks for the great talk. Uh, you mentioned you were uh, having a rank order according to orthogonality importance. Orthogonality importance of what? No, the principal components are orthogonal in nature. So they are modes of variation. And they are ordered by the amount of variation that is explained by that particular shape mode. So the first shape mode. PC or shape mode has, um, it explains the most variation in the data set. I see. Thank you. All right, thank you once again, Dr. Rafelski. Good afternoon, welcome back. My name is Theo Kneinenberg. I work at the Allen Institute for Cell Science. Uh, and together with Juan Casedo, uh, we will moderate this panel discussion. So let me very briefly explain before we get started. We have three questions and we have five panel members. We will state the question provide a little bit of context, uh, and then uh, one or two of the panel members have prepared a response, so we will give them the word first, and uh, then we leave it to the other, other panel members to react and to discuss. Uh, we will limit uh, the, the time for each question to 10 minutes. Um, so if you're ready, uh, let's go. Juan, uh, can you please start with the first question? Yeah. Welcome everybody to the panel and thank you so much to the speakers joining us in this fantastic panel and great after your great talks. So for the first question, uh, I'm going to give a little bit of context. Uh, single cell sequencing has transformed uh, biology during the last few years and imaging has always been single cell resolution as well. Uh, it's thought to provide a different perspective as some of the speakers uh, today have uh, discussed as well. Uh, but uh, some of those, uh, um, you know, new perspectives that single cell imaging can bring have not been fully explored, perhaps because there are, uh, you know, certain limitations that we're hitting or uh, certain needs in technology, chemistry, optics, and so on. Uh, so the, the first question for the panel, and this uh, goes for uh, uh, Emma, what are the largest current challenges and opportunities for imaging in studying single cell biology? Yes, so that's a very good and broad question. <laughs> 10 minutes is a short time, but I, I think single cell sequencing has really, of course, revolutionized cell biology, and it's done a great job when it comes to being able to identify cell types, mainly, and identify making manifolds that represents trajectories over development, for example, which is rather long time scales to a lot of the, compared to a lot of things that we heard today. So I think that this community, the imaging community, could really strengthen that field by doing more advanced analysis on shape, for example, and cells in context of the surrounding, but also to add other parameters like proteins or organelles and to understand these shorter timescales <laughs> in relation to the longer timescales because single cell sequencing is, is not addressing that at all. So I think a lot of the, like, the dynamics, phosphorylations, different proteins, how organelles reshape, it's very important for for shaping that immediate response to any kind of perturbation, like the five-minute response that Lucas talked about. That's normally not what we're seeing in, in, in manifolds and single-cell seq data. So, so I think that one of the opportunities is to really bridge it that way. And then, and then I think it's just also to, I mean, we, we have a lot of, in this community, a lot of experience in analyzing cell shapes and cells in context. And I think we could maybe synergize better than we're doing today, at least. Uh, but of course, and I, I'm also quite fascinated by the whole idea of doing live cell imaging and rich endpoint readout, seeing how much we can infer and predict. So I also think predictive modeling over all dimensions, both scale and time. And today we've heard about multiscale models in space, but we haven't really talked that much about multiscale models in time. So I think there it's something where we will also be harder with the kind of single cell sequencing methods because they're 
you're disrupting the cells, right? So I think that's also something we can bridge with, with imaging. So that would be my, my immediate thoughts. Great, and uh, any uh, immediate limitations as well that you think we are kind of facing or challenges that we need to overcome in order to get the most out of those uh, you know, opportunities as well? Limitations on, on the imaging side or? On the imaging side in you know, any of the related yeah. aspects. Yeah, I, I, think, I, I think that a lot of the data integration is still parallel data acquisition and some kind of analysis, sometimes even comparative analysis, right? We've heard some talks today on co-embedding of different data types, but I think we can be better on actually synthesizing uh, you know, joint representations of different data types and even model cells and synthesized cells that we heard there. So I think that's definitely going to be a challenge, but it's going to be fun and we have great tools for that as well. Great. Definitely. Like uh, multi-omics and combining data is a part of these, you know, challenges as well. Any of the other panelists would like to add uh, any thoughts regarding opportunities or uh, challenges? in uh, single cell image analysis i mean i, mean, oh. I think <coughs> i think what is one of the big questions really which layer of uh, biology uh, contains the most relevant information for what you want to study right and i think the transcriptome is of course a relevant source of information but for many things it's it won't give you enough information and so you know I imagine all the amazing imagery we have seen today right and then imagine this would be all multiplex let's say emma's data would be perfectly multiplex in the same cells it's a bit of a dream but maybe at some point we get there with all the antibody stains now imagine the ways by which you can take one cell uh, take cell with the exact same transcriptome abundance but have be different in all these other properties and i think there's many ways that you can have that right so you can have um, cells that be the same in the transcriptome, but very different in all these other properties. Now, it's those, other, it's those properties at the protein level, protein activity level, organelle, subcellular distribution, that define the activity of the cell and the cell making a decision or how it responds to drugs. So you, it's, to me, pretty obvious that transcriptomics will not get you there. Right? Um, it's just that we need to still push the technology further, and of course, Sequencing is this amazing, has this amazing ability to, to generate huge amounts of data in a relatively short period of time. That's what we're still sort of lacking in imaging. But once we get there, I think we, we want to have everything spatially resolved. It's my sort of feeling. <laughs> and I'll add temporally, too. <laughs> well, of course, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. But that yeah. comes with a challenge also of 3D imaging, right? You, you, when it comes to larger tissue contexts or even organism context, that's definitely going to be a challenge as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd say uh, one area where I think there's uh, a gold mine of opportunity is the intersection of perturbations um, and single cell imaging. And, uh, you know, single cells, or sorry, the single cell nature of biology has sort of been viewed as like a, 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 a problem to be solved. But in the perturbation field, you know, you can sort of view a single cell as being a single experiment. And you can design these experiments to really expand your search of perturbation space and really probe like the partsless complexity of living systems in a way that's that's challenging to do with with a more with more bulk experiments. Uh, one of the nice things about imaging too is that the uh, the marginal cost um, of a data set of, of a uh, per data per cell uh, currently is substantially lower than what it is with sequencing. And so if you're thinking about say doing a a poor man's perturb seek, you know. Right now, I think you're you're much better off trying to do something like that with imaging um, than um, than you know using you know single cell genomics. Uh, so I think there's a uh, on top on top of that there's a phenotype space that really you know as far as like uh, dynamic cellular behaviors, uh, you know cell morphology and whatnot that really right now uh, is best explored with imaging too. Um, and so I say like at that intersection of perturbations um, and imaging, I feel like there's a there's a lot of opportunity there. Great, excellent. And maybe um, one f uh, final question uh, for Pedro before we move on to the next question is, uh, how do you envision you know, like the spatial context of uh, single cells? We know that spatial transcriptomics is moving towards the spatial analysis as well. Uh, and uh, you know, how imaging could also inform that type of analysis? Yeah, that's a great question. So Definitely the environment in which cells organize themselves, for example, for tumors, if you, this is a very heterogeneous space, and we do know that the spatial structure 
governs the mode of evolution and the way that cells uh, divide in the tumor and the way that, you know, that these trees develop. So not only is it uh, clear to me that we need to analyze the sequencing data in the context of the, um, of the tissue in which the tumor arises, but also we need to use the, um, already the, um, the structure of the tumor in order to make better inferences about each single cell. So, you know, you can think of spatial data as essentially adding extra information that you can use to regularize your models, right? Um, you know, cells are not uh, scattered around in space well mixed. The fact that you know that, um, there is, um, that there is a spatial structure enables you to say, well, if this cell belongs to this clone here, then, sp then cells around it probably belong to the same clone. So that type of locality assumption is definitely very useful, I think, for, um, for sequencing analysis. All right, great. Thank you so much to all the, our panelists. Theo, let's move on to the second question. Yes. <clears throat> the second question is how to anchor cell biological image data such that we can perform comparative studies across data sets. Now, what we see in genomics um, with sequencing data is that the sequencing data can be anchored to a reference genome, right? We can have gene expression readouts across tissues, even, you know, between species. Um, other way to look at this, perhaps from the sort of the imaging standpoint, when we look at uh, deep learning based face recognition and morphing, they're using these anchor points, right? They're using the eyes and the, and the, and the nose and the ears. Um, perhaps as part of your answer, you also want to take into account that we are not yet there in terms of standardization of data and metadata in imaging. Um, so Susan, if you would like to go first, um, how, what are the important aspects of anchoring cell biological image data such that we can perform comparative studies across data sets? Well, I think that we saw today that a lot of people consider the nucleus and the cell boundary <laughs> as useful, um, and then sometimes adding particular structures in, and if there were more commonality in what those structures are, there's at least a way to think about bringing cell, different types of cells together. Now, every cell has its own key structures, its own reference its own coordinate system that it might care about, apical, basal, epithelial cells may be different than neurons. And so the context of the system and application may matter, unfortunately. But um, I was going to share one lesson I learned that also relates to standardization, actually two lessons I've learned by um, participating in the Integrating Imaging and Omics Working Group at the 40 Nucleome, where they're spending a lot of time creating these very different data types and data sets, including image-based data sets at different scales, both the walking of the chromatin as well as you know, globally where you are in the nucleus. And we've been having conversations about how to bring these data sets together. And the two, the, the two takeaways that, that I think are useful in thinking about how to now standardize this in a really easy way, so not all the complex stuff we've been talking about. One is have your nucleus in your image. Do something to your assay, whatever it may be, so that at least, and this is not just because we're talking 4DN, this is, this is broadly, cell boundaries, depending on the cells, may be difficult to get and to segment and to have in 3D, but the nucleus is going to be solved very, very soon, um, if not already. Um, and people, when they do their data acquisition in the image space, should at least have some way of having the nucleus. That's, that's, that's the first thing we're going to tie to champion, actually, in the 40 nucleome, because actually there are people who collect data sets without that. And then the second one is that if you want to bring together data sets with sources of variation and you want to depend on those sources of variation to do, say, a joint embedding or something, the primary source of variation that people have in a lot of their data sets is the cell cycle. And so if you're going to do bulk analyses, at least try to segregate by cell cycle so you can get to some other, any other next sort of dimension of variation as you bring your data sets together. So those are the two that I wanted to share. Very, very, very easy obvious ones, but not everyone's doing them. Thank you. Those poor prokaryotes? No? The, uh... <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I worked in bacterial cell biology for my PhD, so... <laughs> uh, Lucas, can we perhaps invite you to also uh, respond? Sure. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I obviously agree, and also, um, I mean, it, it, it will for sure be the case that looking at different cell types, you will see that the Golgi or the endosome system will be highly different between these different cell types. Um, but on the other hand, the good news is we have good markers for the organelles, and I think those can be reference points. So you will have to map your cell type, first of all, and then you will maybe have even to map the heterogeneity of your cell type. But if you have done that on bona fide markers of organelles and cellular structures, I think those could be great anchor points to then compare the rest against. Um, 
What I also believe is a little bit going one level higher. So let's say it's some, some meta level where, where you're looking at, um, uh, you know, also, also what's, what Susan presented very nicely, where we are looking not only at the abundance of organelles, but to actually look at how they're spatially organized together. So as a whole map, right? I think that by itself can be a great anchor point because I think one issue we have often had in imaging is that if you take a cell, and these are cells of the same cell type, but they have just a different shape or a different organization or rotation or whatever, right? Uh, if you, you know, many of the sort of also the, also the, the, the deep learning based algorithms, they have issues with that, right? But if you can get methods that make, that become insensitive to just simple rotational differences, right? Which these kind of interaction maps I think are, Right? I think those are great reference points because these cells are similar, we would think as biologists, they're just di slightly differently rotated, right? Or, you know, pretty arbitrary things. But these are important to sort of become independent of um, because then you have good reference points, I would say. Great. Would be my of course. I just wanted to add to that. If you're thinking even larger scale, I know <laughs> there's, there's efforts that are trying to, to make the vasculature system a kind of reference mark, reference uh, system so that you can map tissue images to the vascular system in the body. And it, it's kind of the same thing, right? You use a structure that is some, in some way preserved in a cell or a body. So I kind of like that, the ideas of using subcellular structures because it's kind of scalable to the, the organism at, at some point and it aligns well with other ongoing efforts. Yeah. with other medical imaging modalities and, and that as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, David or Pedro, do you want to uh, add to this discussion? And Pedro, perhaps from your perspective, uh, again, uh, the, the, the tissue level perspective, because we are saying, hey, how can we anchor a single cell? But the notion of a single cell by itself uh, often is not very sensible in, in many uh, biological contexts. Uh, I mean, I would kind of approach it from a, almost like a sociological perspective, right, where you want people to collect additional data to make it groundable uh, in all these other efforts. Uh, I think ultimately, you know, the likeliest solution is going to be one of these label-free imaging modalities. Uh, I think the challenge there is really going to be is going to be how to make those modalities and the translation into interpretable uh, outputs general, right? Uh, you know. Uh, Allen Institute's like, you know, pioneered this as, a, as an approach, but practically speaking, if one wanted to implement one of these methods uh, pre uh, in, their, in their own lab, then it's a question of, okay, you know, what's, what's the right imaging modality? Is it going to be phase? Is it going to be like some holographic imaging? Is it going to be some LED array imaging a la, you know, Laura Waller? Then there's collecting your own training data set for your cells of interest. There's getting the staining to be right and da, 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 da. Uh, if it was like some module that you could just add on to your microscope plus $1,000, um, and you could just, you know, have it be auto collected and you got something for free out of it where it's like, hey, I'm going to produce the flavor of data where for all the fancy segmentation stuff you wanted to do, uh, you get that for free. Uh, I think there it would make it a lot easier for people to, you know, have buy in for, you know, making their experiments, you know, a delta more, uh, you know, epsilon more challenging if they're going to get something out of it. Uh, but doing that, you know, I probably just like ticked off like five years of like technical R&D development. Uh, it's not. <laughs> uh, it's not easy to make uh, to make a particularly that flavor of model um, general, um, but that's kind of what I could see as a potential solution. Um, barring that, it's like, well, if there are models that are available that operate on you know structural data like nuclei um, and cell membranes, then people are going to be incentivized to to throw those into their experiments. Yeah, I mean, I, I can simply add that, you know, the issue of aligning images uh, in, in terms of um, tissue level uh, figures, you know, this is obviously a very difficult computational problem. So if I go, can go back again to tumors and you have, you know, in order to understand the spatial structure of a tumor, you need to, ha to look at the whole 3D structure. And if we just take a slide, this is a very incomplete view of what it a is, is actually happening. So there is a big question about, you know, how, how many slides do you take and um, how, do we, how do you align the slides and, um, you know, how, how can you relate what you see in between, between the slides? So there, there are very deep computational problems, I think, um, in this uh, field as well. Yeah, what you are also referring to in a way is the, you know, the 2D, 3D aspect, right? Yep. Uh, most imaging so far has been done in, in 2D or perhaps a few Z slices. Mm -hmm. And one would think, you know, you should look at 3D, which is what we are trying to do at this institute, but it is very hard to do it. Um, 
And, um, you know, we will have to see how successful we are going to be as a community in being able to do this uh, in, in various difficult issues. To what extent is it possible to leverage the existing two-dimensional data sets, uh, of which we have seen many uh, being presented today, in or order to come up with uh, a, an anchoring system of the cell in 3D? Anybody, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, there's like a collection of like computer vision methods where it's like, you know, presents, you know, static image and then it does uh, depth prediction, right? And so you can imagine variants of that for, uh, for biological imaging data. Uh, for methods like that, you're always going to need to validate, um, as Yuri uh, highlighted uh, quite well during his talk, you're always going to want to validate because, you know, these methods can hallucinate things um, that are real and could potentially hallucinate depths that might quote unquote make sense. Uh, but not actually uh, actually be accurate, but it's it's not it's not outside the realm of re it's not outside the realm of possibility given like what can be done uh, today. So yeah, I, I, I would I would add that the uh, just like you know you always have to ask yourself okay is is imaging like the right thing for my for my question? Uh, if even if you are imaging, like do you really need uh, 3D? And for a lot of the more modern uh, image, uh, imaging modalities, particularly the, particularly the spatial omics, uh, the cost per slice is like very expensive, right? And so if you just say like, oh my God, I absolutely need to have you know 30 slices uh, per uh, per you know per tissue block that I'm that I'm trying to image, well, it went from like you know like a three thousand dollar experiment to a ninety thousand dollar experiment, and now no longer feasible uh, with the route with the you know sort of pots of money that are usually allocated for one of these uh, acquisitions. So I would. Uh, given the scale of data that can be collected, um, I would say, and some of that dictated by price, I'd say, like, you know, an important question is how much do you really need uh, the 3D? And what biological conclusions uh, can you, uh, is, will, uh, will 2D data be sufficient? Great. David, thank you so much, as well as the other panel members for answering this question. Juan, third one for you. Thank you. So, uh, the context for the third question is. Uh, Image-based uh, cellular analysis requires a lot of computational um, uh, methods and power in order to get quantitative data. Uh, machine learning and computer vision have been very useful to make sense of all that high-dimensional data, and uh, we still need to make progress in some of those. Uh, and some of those are relevant for image analysis, some of those are, are not. So the question, uh, for uh, Pedro and David uh, to begin with is uh, what are recent computational or machine learning advancements that you think can have an impact in the way we analyze microscopy images and we are probably not using quite yet? Yeah, so I do think that, um, so I cannot speak so much about microscopy images. I can speak mostly about, you know, this tissue level, spatial transcriptomics type of thing, seek fish. Um, what I do think is that you don't really have to wait now for uh, new advancements in machine learning, um, in machine learning community to be able to analyze these images, um, you know, in a more deep way, in a meaningful way. Spatial statistics has some, is something that has been around for a, a long time now, and there has been, um, you know, developments for 50 years on, on this field. You know, you can use very simple tools like Markov random fields, which associate uh, you know, if you have a grid of cells and you want to model uh, in some way gene expression between uh, neighboring cells, you can use a simple Markov random field and there are classical methods that en enable you to find, you know, I don't know, clusters of cells with the same gene expression given the spatial structure. There are, however, um, some advancements in machine learning community regarding Gaussian processes, uh, which is again something in the, in the spatial statistics community and what we want to do there is instead of, you know, using the Markov random field um, type of model in which you, you want to assign each cell in this image or each point in this grid to a specific class or a cluster, you want to find some, um, with Gaussian process, you would usually want to find some smooth uh, transitions of gene expression across space. You know, some genes may have some spatial pattern of gene expression, some uh, maybe not. And what you have seen in the, in the Gaussian process uh, community is now very efficient ways to infer these, uh, these patterns because the main problem is that you, if you now have a grid of 1,000 by 1,000 and you want to relate the gene expression of a cell somewhere in this grid with gene expression of some cell wherever else in this grid, you basically have a 1,000 by 1,000 
a covariance matrix, which you need to invert in order to be able to, um, uh, to make inferences. Now, inverting a matrix is cubic, and inverting a 1,000 by 1,000 matrix is a, obviously becomes a, a hugely uh, difficult problem. But the advancement that I want to mention is that you know, sparse GPs using um, selecting informative points, which will allow you to make these uh, inver matrix inversions retaining the most um, information. This is something that I, I think has enabled um, very interesting developments in the, in the community. And in fact, there is a, a paper called uh, Non-Negative uh, non Spatial Factorization by um, Barbara Engelhardt's uh, lab at... Um, Chief Gladstone now. Oh, yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, by Towns uh, et al in which they actually do this. So they use Gaussian processes to model gene expression which varies in space versus gene expression which does not vary in space. And they use this, uh, this sparse GP type of thing. Something else that I will add is back to the classical type of method uh, that you can use to analyze this new type of data are, for example, tensor factorizations. So if, if you uh, listen to my talk, there, I was looking at cells at, um, as a matrix factorization problem in which you have a matrix of cells by genes, and you want to find a low rank approximation to this matrix. But now in an image, you have cells by cells by genes. This, is, this becomes a cube of uh, information. And you know, factorizing this and finding patterns, local patterns of gene expression or local uh, spatial signatures is, um, is something you can use using tensors. And I think actually, Emma has a, a paper that uh, uses tensor factorization to find spatial patterns of, um, of RNA localization uh, um, from SIG, uh, SIGFISH, I think. So, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Great, thank you. <laughs> David, would you like to add something? Uh, I mean, I'd say like I probably would just uh, repeat a lot of what was just said, except in slightly different language. Uh, I, I do like this idea of, of taking your raw imaging data and creating a spatial temporal graph. Uh, that's, the, that's the task in which most of the existing machine learning methods uh, uh, are, I would, uh, that operate on cellular imaging data uh, go into, and you know things from you know cell segmentation and determining cell types, and you know quantifying like the omic signature and these multiplex fish data sets. I'd say like you know the field's probably 75, uh, 70 to 75 percent of the way there as far as having you know good solutions that will work well like out of the box on most on most data sets. Um, after that, then it's okay making sense of like the spatial um, spatial slash temporal graph. Uh, for the tissue imaging data sets, it's, uh, to me, it's, you know, the, I'd say the big challenge is creating a, a hierarchical decomposition, um, you know, starting at the level of cells, you know, finding functional tissue units and how those are uh, sort of uh, organized, uh, organized in space. And then for the live cell imaging data, you know, having, you know, a set of reliable methods where you can, in an in a unsupervised or self-supervised way, sort of uncover, you know, stereotypical uh, cellular behaviors. Um, and I think, you know, uh, a lot of this isn't going to be done in a completely unsupervised way, but thinking about modes of weak supervision where you okay, maybe not necessarily need a, a ton of labels, um, but having enough labels to say, hey, you know, you know, these are the types of behaviors that we're interested in, look out for, you know, cells dying or eating each other or da 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 da. Um, or, you know, say, looking for, you know, uh, stereotypical, you know, functional tissue units, you know, glomeruli, alveoli, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I could see some, I could see some, uh, some, uh, some utility of generating uh, additional uh, additional training data to sort of codify like the existing um, bi existing body of biological knowledge in the form of a prior, um, but then also you know thinking about ways of of extending the method so that for things that you know we may not necessarily like know a priori this is what happens uh, you don't miss those two because the models only look for the things that you uh, that you that you tell them, um, but broadly speaking like you know everything that was said is what's likely to happen. Uh, data structure is going to be in that in this spatial graph, and then what methods operate on that graph um, are going to be what the what the future holds. Great. Any of the of the other panelists would like to add something regarding computational methods? Sure, I can. So we're of course as I hinted in my talk quite excited about the text to image generation, not that I think we'll be able to input amino acid sequence and get a you know full image of a cell, but but it kind of opens an avenue towards the genotype to phenotype translation, right? And a lot of also post-translational modifications can be encoded on the sequence, right? So I think methods for co-embedding this type of data and, and for 
basically, can we generate images and at some point inspect where on the sequence was this particular localization informed? And I, I think that's exciting to see where those methods can take us. Surely not all the way, but I still think it's exciting. The other part, I think, is still also the use of generative models to make predictions and guide us on how to make the best data sets. Because so far, it's a lot of like brute force data generation, and we could be much smarter there. So I'm pretty sure that we'll be able, if we can start to simulate more experiments and, and do label-free prediction, and then choose what to experimentally verify and choose what data set to generate, I think it will help a lot. So that would be my two areas of most excitement. That's great. Anything else? Theo? I mean, I think just to add, I mean, I think uh, if we want to learn or train those models really in a good way, we need really high quality data, right? I mean, we, and we need multimodal data, so we need high resolution protein stains, multiplexed, right? But also then transcript readouts of those same cells. I, there are a few labs doing this already today, but it's still very few people who really do this, right? Combine, have those types of measurements really in the same data set. Um, but if we, I, I think that will come. And then those types of models could be really perhaps trained. And then you could go indeed, as, as Emma is saying, perhaps, right, at some point, from sequence to cell. <laughs> <laughs> we can dream. <laughs> Good place to stop. We will dream for sure. This is, this is really great. Um, um, with this, the panel discussion comes to a close. Please give a big round of applause <laughs> to the panelists. Hi, my name is Sebastian, or Sebi, as uh, Gideon said, and I'm working for Zeiss, and I will not talk about microscopes, but rather a little bit of software stuff we do, and I hope it will be fun for you. Um, how do I come to the... The green button is forward. I try, I try. Ah, okay, here it is. So I work in Munich for our software department. I, my main responsibilities are our AI software solutions and also our data format. And um, so in case you don't know it, also we build microscopes, of course, but at Zeiss we also do a lot of like AI nowadays. And mainly we use AI for like ease of use in our microscopes. For instance, we have AI-based recognition of sample carriers, we have object classification to identify, you know, cells or sometimes also machinery parts, as you can see here. Obviously, our biggest field is segmentation. I mean, this topic is really clear um, to everybody here, so I don't have to explain it. So we do semantic and instant segmentation. And we use also AI for, like, denoising and image reconstruction. And while we develop those tools internally first, we decided to make a couple of them open source, and this is what I will talk about today mainly. So as you see here, our machine learning stack is mainly what all of you use. So there's no big secret behind it. And um, what we learned along our way, especially when we looked at segmentation, is that in the end, and I want to emphasize especially here the last sentence here, that what we learned from observing many, many users on our cloud platform is that in eight out of 10 cases, or maybe even nine, in the end, it comes down to better data beat better models. So in many, many cases, uh, we recognize that instead of always like trying to come up with a new model for every individual application, it's essential to provide labeling tools that make labeling easy, time efficient, because people then will do it, and thereby improving their model with more data and making them more robust, instead of everybody is creating its own model, own parameter set, own architecture. And this is kind of our guidance principle. It's maybe not the sophisticated approach, but the one that works for most users. Label more data. So, and uh, on top of that, obviously, like for a company like ours, doing machine learning, it's a pretty tricky field to operate in. So for instance, academia has totally different requirements than industry. So in academia, nobody wants to be locked in. Everything needs to be open. Industry, at least from our perspective, sometimes they don't care. As long as it works, it's fine. And one-button solutions is what they want. Even my opinion is it doesn't exist. Nevertheless, if we use all those open source tools um, outlined here, at some point as a company, you have to align it with your business model. So you have to still earn some money with it at some point. And last but not least, um, cloud computing is a very interesting topic. Everybody seems to like it. But if you then ask specific persons, there are always reasons why it doesn't work. 
data are too big, it's not allowed, la 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 la. Or some pharma companies say, we like it, but no, it's not an option. So, and then in the end, uh, for a company like ours, it's always like build or buy when it comes to machine learning. Like, should we do everything on our own, or should we just buy something from somebody else? In the end, it's a mixture, I would say. So, and yeah, what did we do? Uh, so basically, we created an ecosystem of software tools with respect to machine learning. And what I want to focus on is it's all centered around what we call the trained model. So our concept is basically you can train on our cloud platform here, up here. You can train in your Jupyter notebook if you want, if you're a data scientist. You can train in our software, and if you are a company and have no time but a lot of money, we also do the training for you, including the labeling. In the end, it all comes down to this train model is a standard format which we decided to make open source. So if you train something in your Jupyter notebook or in our software, in the end, it can be used in your code, but also in our platform. For instance, here you see in using it in Zen and Vision 4D, software platforms you might or might not know. Um, what we also did, um, this was uh, last Christmas for Usually at Christmas in our team, we do a fun hackathon, and there we said, let's try to implement our model format also in Napari. And here you can see the result. Um, by the way, this is a grain size analysis from some metal um, example from an electron microscope. But basically what it shows, like if you have an open model format, then basically you can use it all over the place. Commercial software as well as open source software. And this is what we mean by open ecosystem. So you can use it in both. Since we all use the same stack, and this is a standard format that works easily. Feel free to install it. Uh, so it's called Napari CZANN segment. It's on the plugin page of Napari. You can try it out if you want. Um, what we also learned over time in a company, and this is probably also true for a community, it's very beneficial to align on a general machine learning stack to basically be efficient, because otherwise everybody will develop the same tools over and over. And our stack is mainly based on Python. And um, as I said, some of the tools are um, open source tools. We still have some internal Python packages. Not everything can be open source from a company perspective, mainly for IP issues. But we try to make as much as we can open source. And what did we publish already? Um, this one here, sees it model. So that is a Python package you can use your trained segmentation model, including some metadata, to use it in your own code, but also in our software platform. So it's not a new format. It's basically Onyx Insight plus some metadata. We use it internally. You can use it as well, if you like it. Same is true for our library to read and write CZI images. So this one can be used to read and write multidimensional data sets especially, obviously, dedicated to our file format. So read it and write it as you like. It's based on C++ and has a Python wrapper, and everybody can use it. Again, why do we have it? We use it internally in our pipelines as well. So not everybody has to reinvent it at size, and you can use it if you want. Last but not least, a tiny tool, but I think a quite useful one. Um, we had to fight with issues in our company that every team was always reinventing tiling, especially for deep learning, over and over again. So I uh, decided we have to find a way to stop it. And basically, what we did create was an internal Python package to unify tiling for machine learning, and then basically roll it out to the rest of the company. And this is not specific for our image file format, because just works on any array. So again, I think it makes sense to make it open source and public because I think tiling is a never ending like reason for little side effects in your images where you can spend days to talk about. So feel free to use it. And what we also did, we created the cloud-based training platform for deep learning models. And here it comes back to this um, better data beat better models. So our concept, what we use is called partial annotations. So basically, you never have to annotate a whole image, but only like certain amount of objects, very precisely, and then basically quickly draw the background around it. Because then the network can really learn around the edges what is object and what not. This is called appear, so www.appear.com. It's a cloud-based platform for fully automated training of deep learning models. And here you see it basically in action from end to end. 
So that is the platform. So you label your cell nucleus here in an, I think it's a phase contrast image from a cell discoverer, as I described. So very simple, as you have seen it in other tools, I would say. You label the background very briefly, and this is it. Obviously, you repeat it for a couple of more images. If you are done, you press the training button. There is no coding needed, no parameters to be tuned. It takes a while. At the end, you can download the model, use it in your own Python code, or here, use the Napari plugin I just mentioned for fun to segment that image and then do whatever you like. So that really means this works all over the place, not only in our software. So here I played a bit around with tiling parameters, but here you can see the result and works quite well. Um, yeah, so, and as I said, training process is fully automated, but for the experts among you, you get all the parameters you are interested in. But you can also just download the model and go ahead. And in our software, obviously, we use the model as well. Here, as an example, one of our so-called bio apps, in this case here, label-free nucleus segmentation, fully automated, trained on a peer, and then later on, you use it in, in our software to create some heat maps and do your image analysis. And that was already my last slide. Um, all the info can be found on those various pages on our GitHub repository. Best thing probably is we talk after uh, after the lunch break, or oh, not lunch break, but break. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. It's a great honor to have the, the final talk of the day. So thank you to the organizers for, for inviting me. Um, and it's a great pleasure to tell you about some work that we've, we've done recently. Um, so the goal of this work really was to start thinking about the temporal dimension in terms of uh, cell biology. So this is a paper we've just published. Um, and the goal of it really is to take time-lapse image data of cells and try and predict a future state but not only do it um, in a sort of predictive manner, but actually in an explainable manner as well. So hopefully we can learn something about the underlying biology. So just to introduce the system that we've been looking at here, uh, it's called cell competition. So cell competition is a great model system for both development and disease. It's a mixed population of cells in this case, um, where we have a so-called winner cell type and a loser cell type. There's a a mutation in this loser cell type that means it's less fit than the winner cell type. And we differentially, uh, differentially label these so that we can tell them apart. And then we take uh, long time-lapse movies whereby we can see what happens to each cell effectively in this tissue. So the loser cells perfectly viable on their own, but in the context of this other cell type, they uh, are selectively eliminated from that tissue. And you can see in the images here, whoops, uh, the images here, oh dear. <laughs> there we go. Um, you can see that the cells actually are eliminated from this tissue. Some of them proliferate, and um, some of them die. So the question was, given this information, are we able to uh, use a, a machine learning approach to take a sequence of images and predict some future state of that cell, be it the fate, uh, uh, in this case, apoptosis or, or proliferation? And can we use um, that same methodology to actually learn something about the, the biology? So um, we've had a microscope running for about five years continuously to collect data for this experiment. And there's obviously lots of variations on this, um, which means we've got a huge amount of time-lapse imaging data. And so during that period of time, we've been able to develop some of the tools that get us to the point where we have single cell trajectories that we can actually analyze. And so this just shows um, some of the data uh, here in Napari. Uh, we can then go ahead and segment all of those cells. And then we've spent quite a lot of time on the, the cell tracking uh, problem. So we need to be able to reliably track every single cell in, the, um, in these uh, movies and be able to extract single cell trajectories with great fidelity. And of course, in the spirit of open science, we've tried to provide all these visualization tools and tracking tools back to the community. And, and CZI's uh, support has been very helpful in that respect. So, just to reiterate the problem, given these sequences of images, uh, like the ones shown here, can we predict what's going to happen to a cell? So, in this case, we have two different fates. We have cell proliferation, we have cell death. 
And what we really want is a machine learning model that can learn this functional mapping between this input and this output. We're also asking the question, is there enough information just in the image data to make this prediction? So the way that we approached this was in two steps. So uh, first of all, we used an unsupervised approach to try and learn um, the underlying distribution of the, the data. So we have millions and millions of images at this point, which we can use to train uh, a very nice model. And the, the advantage of this is, well, one, it's a probabilistic model, but also it gives us a very compact representation of our image data. It captures the salient features of the images. And then we can feed that into uh, a network here called a TCN. And the nice thing about this TCN network is that it sort of respects the arrow of time. So it, there are causal links here that mean that uh, there's each step of the model, or each time step of the model is only dependent on the previous time steps of it. So we're explicitly incorporating uh, time in this model. Now we had to do a few other things here. So one of the reasons, uh, one of the problems is that we only have two states. So we have a cell divides or a cell dies. Now we don't want a machine learning model to, to uh, take a shortcut. We don't want it to learn how to predict cell division. And then by exclusion, it's able to predict cell death. So in fact, what we do is then generate trajectories uh, in this latent representation, which have co no causal link with the fate. And so the idea here is that the model actually has to learn what the determinants of the cell fate are. It can't just learn one or the other. And so it's able to actually very accurately predict uh, the future state of the cell based on these time series representations. We can go in and we can look at how the, um, the predictions evolve over time. We can use saliency methods to then look at back at the original image features that perhaps uh, are strong contributors to that prediction. And you can see things like the nuclear morphology and the location of local uh, dividing cells are important in this prediction. But also, as Asaf really nicely showed this morning, we can also delve into the model in a bit more detail and ask, okay, what are the features that are important in this representation in terms of making the predictions? So we can see that the model learns, for example, that cell type and the local cellular density are really important uh, factors in this process. And we can go ahead and manipulate those and look and see exactly what the relationships are. Now, there was a movie here that showed very nicely that they're not totally disentangled. And in fact, some of these properties are very strongly correlated, which is what we'd expect from the data. We also find that looking from the temporal context, um, context that actually some of these properties are extremely important in determining what that future state of the, the cell is. And so on an ensemble of models, the local cellular density is the major determinant of cell fate here, which is what we'd expect given a, a cell um, competition uh, experiment like this. So um, because this is very quick, I can't go into all the details, but um, some of the things that we've learned are that framing cell biology questions as ML problems is actually somewhat of an art, and it requires some care. Um, we can use these uh, neural networks to make uh, predictive models of cell fate with reasonably good accuracy, but also with explainable features. And one of the nice things about this is once they're trained, we can actually use this for sort of zero-shot um, screening applications as well, because in principle, we've learned a model of cellular behavior that we can look for deviations from. And my student, Chris, has gone on to actually do quite a lot more work to look at what the decision boundaries look like in these systems. So which features are consistent with certain outcomes and various other things. So please come and talk to me about that afterwards. So finally, I'd just like to thank the people that did this work. So Chris and Julia and my collaborators and actually the, the talented sort of software engineering teams as well that have helped us build some of the tools that you've seen today. So thank you for your time, and uh, I'll take questions afterwards, I guess. Alan, and with, Alan, and with that, uh, thank you so much. We come to the end uh, of the presentations for today. Uh, I think we have seen fantastic science uh, here uh, during the, the first uh, Cytodata Symposium in person in three years. Um, I think it is amazing that everyone in this room is spending their, their working hours, their professional life investigating, trying to understand these cells. For us at the, at the Allen Institute, this is made possible by our founder, the late Paul G. Allen we wish to thank for his support and for his vision. 
We're also very thankful to the Saito Data Society for accepting our proposal and for uh, giving us some guidance in, in hosting this uh, 2022 event. Many cheers to the great uh, presenters and their excellent presentations. Also to you, the audience, for your great uh, questions. You really made this into a very interactive and inspirational uh, symposium. Uh, and then a very big thank you to the Symposium Planning Committee and the entire Institute for Cell Science for organizing this event. Um, Wilhelmina, um, Caitlin, uh, Sage, Kelly, Megan, Nick, Gideon, all the people that you see in the room that are helping out as well as many people behind the scenes. This was really a great effort and beautiful energy. So please uh, give a big round of applause to yourselves for being here and to the organizers.